Good morning. One can see there is anticipation in the room for us to start. So I think, let us start. You are very welcome, uh, colleagues, to the National Research Foundation. Uh, my name is Aldi Strubel. I'm the Executive Director for Strategic Partnerships at the NRF and also the Secretary for South Africa's National Member Organization um, as affiliated to IASA. I also uh, bid you welcome on behalf of Dr. Malapit Kubela, the CEO of the NRF. You're joining us in an interesting time, apart from the fact that it's a very busy week with uh, South Africa Science Forum, and I'm sure Mr. Dutoy will speak to that, our first inaugural SA France Science Days, some events of the African Academy of Sciences, and Professor Nelson Torto, the AAS's Executive Director, who will join us later, and some SADC initiatives. Uh, this has become an annual science week, if you will, in South Africa. You're also joining us during the 20-year anniversary of the National Research Foundation, and it has spoken of its steadfastness and support of science and development in the country. But of course, our highlight for today is this conference that we're co-hosting with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, the Department of Science and Innovation of South Africa, and SASAC, the Southern African Systems Analysis Center. You would have seen on the program, and based on your in, uh, invitations, uh, it is called Systems Analysis and Africa, Transformative Uses of Systems Analysis to Address Regional Challenges. To foster dialogue between the research and policy community focused on addressing societal challenges, we're very pleased to co-host this conference today. It forms part of a series of conferences, regionally based, that IASA is leading and has initiated in 2018 to explore the role of systems analysis in addressing regional and societal challenges, but also, and I think very importantly, to provide input into the strategic and research direction of the future of EASA. South Africa's framework of engagement with EASA since its ascension to membership in 2007 has been very rich and rewarding from both a national and a regional perspective. And uh, although we will introduce Dr. Ganson Pillay momentarily um, as the current vice chair of the board of EASA, but also in his role as Deputy CEO at the National Research Foundation. His support and drive towards the engagement with IASA is gratefully acknowledged. You will know that in 2012, the Southern African Young Scientist Summer Program was established, and that was hosted by the University of the Free State. And its former dean, Professor Andre Ruet, is here from the University of the Free State, and at that time, I was very fortunate to be involved, but also uh, Dr. Priscilla Mensa, who was at that time at Free State and currently now at the NRF. That transcended into the establishment of SESEC, the Southern African Center for Systems Analysis, in 2015, which was co-hosted by four universities. One was the University of the Western Cape, and I acknowledge the presence here of Dr. Tandim Gwebe, who at that time was there, Professor Swans Franz Swanepoel, who was at that time the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, and of course the current Director of SISAC at UWC, Professor Priscilla Baker, who also holds a DSI <coughs> NRF uh, Research Chair in analytical systems and processes for priority and emerging contaminants. The second host was uh, the University of Edwards Rand and Professor Mary Scholes this year was the key driver for that. She was for a long time and the immediate past chair of the Science Advisory Committee of IASA and holds a chair, a SACI chair in global chains and systems analysis. And she's also on the SANMO committee. The fourth organization was the uh, University of Stellenbosch, represented here by Corina de Tue, who's a program manager at the African Doctoral Academy. And the fourth partner was the University of Limpopo, with able leadership by Professor Jessica Singh, who's the DVC for research. Colleagues, during this time, many students, PhD level, many supervisors, uh, many high level uh, short courses, etc were engaged both with the SAYSSP and certainly with SASAC. And we're speaking of numbers of in the hundreds. And that has been probably one of the major thrusts of this framework of engagement of South Africa 
within the RSR context. There's been a number of policy dialogues, for instance, including with key department directors general uh, two years ago. There's an honors program in global change and systems change in Southern Africa that the University of the Witwatersrand has spearheaded. And a number of the PhD students has also been supported by the British Council in collaboration with others and principally by the NRF. A major output thus far is a seminal book published in 2018 by Springer called Systems Analysis Approaches for global, uh, Complex Global Challenges. And we're very fortunate that this was edited by Dr. Priscilla Mensa, who's currently at the NRF, uh, Dr. David Caterere, Dr. Seppo Hajigonta, who's also at the National Research Foundation, and of course, Professor Andre Ruet, who's the former Dean of the SAYSSP. We also acknowledge the large number of both of those programs alumni who will participate and certainly acknowledge also the contribution through a number of posters that will be, uh, display that will be displayed uh, during later today. We also contextualize this uh, colleagues and this was the basis of South Africa's continued engagement with EASA in terms of the Africa context, the potential that it brings with a number of networks on the continent and more information on that later. Thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, we will start with a first mini panel of uh, eminent leaders, not only for the co-hosting for today, but because of the role and to celebrate the partnership that we have. I will introduce all of them at once and each one of them will come to the fore um, to make their opening remarks. Um, Dr. Ganson Pillay is the Deputy CEO at the National Research Foundation. Uh, he also serves as the current Vice Chair of the Board of the EASA Council. Uh, Dr. Albert van Jarsveld is the Di Director General and CEO of EASA. Um, many people think he doesn't need any introduction. I would <laughs> agree with that, but he's a former CEO of the NRF, he's a former Vice Chancellor, former Dean and really an eminent scholar uh, in his field, but certainly now leading this prominent organization. Professor Priscilla Baker, who has been introduced, the current director of SASAC and a holder of a chair at the University of the Western Cape. And of course, Mr. Dan de Tui, who's the deputy director general for international cooperation and resources at the Department of Science and Innovation, responsible for all the strategic, uh, diplomatic and macro level science engagement of this country literally with the world. It's our honor to acknowledge the opening panelists and we will ask Mr. Dan de Tui to please step forward as the first opening remarks. Thank you, colleague. And you can applaud. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aldo. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to start with an apology, which is something I, I hate to do, and that is to say that I'll be extremely rude that as soon as I finish speaking, I, I would have to leave, because as Aldo has indicated, this is an exceptionally busy week for science in South Africa. Not only do we have the Science Forum South Africa starting tomorrow, but across the city today, there are any number of events. By last count, 12 different side events involving inter different international partners and stakeholders in this different system of national system of innovation. So you may well ask yourself, why did I bother? Why did I inconvenience you to come to say a few words and, 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 and then run away? But, it, but it's not about me. But there are, there are three key messages I, I would like to emphasize as a representative of the, of the South African government. Um, and first of all, it is to bring you the, the good wishes and the, the best wishes for this event from my minister, uh, Dr. Blayton Zimande, and my director general, Dr. Phil Majwaha. Now, bringing the good wishes of one's superiors, especially if you have experience as a, as a long public servant, is something you can easily do because you can sometimes take a bit of liberty with the truth. But, but this is a true message because we did brief our minister and our DG on the week's programs and highlighted the significance of the EASA side event. And they did ask me to, to bring you the good wishes. And secondly, it's just to bolt on, on Aldo's uh, very eloquent overview of the relations between uh, EASA and South Africa to affirm from a government point of view, our 
uh, deep appreciation for what is now a long-standing partnership over many years, very ably conducted and steered by the National Research Foundation and indeed the support of the broader uh, South African science community. But we really view our partnership with EASA, which has made a qualitative impact on both human capital development, on enhancing the, the output of South African research, but also our, our way and how we approach the research enterprise, uh, thinking on, on, on that in a real quality manner. And we deeply appreciate it to that. Uh, Several of my ministers over the years have had the opportunity to, to visit the ASA headquarters in Austria, and I'm sure Dr. van Jarsveld uh, will not be long before Minister Nzamandi will be there too. But then just, just lastly, it is also to, to emphasize that the focus of the event here today is, is strategically aligned what is also the new policy orientation of the Department of Science and Innovation. Uh, specifically, our South African colleagues will know that earlier this year we adopted a new white paper on science, technology and innovation, which gives a strategic direction for, for science in the country. And whether it's the philosophy of systems analysis, whether it's the pan-African, the regional approach, or indeed the core mission of putting science at the service of society in support of achieve, achieving the sustainable development goals, what you will be discussing here today. Uh, that is really the, the vision we like to see, and as a government, we will seek to promote for science in South Africa. So for those few words, I, I beg you really your, your forgiveness for, for, for making this short, brief appearance. But if there's anything you take from what I've said, it is our appreciation and support from the Department of Science and Innovation. And working with the National Research Foundation, we remain committed to this very important partnership. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished colleagues, good morning and welcome to everyone. I think Aldo, you've done very well in sketching the history and welcoming everyone. But today is an important day, not just for the National Research Foundation, but for systems analysis. Um, South Africa and Egypt are the only African countries from the continent that are represented at EASA. And one of the requests we've constantly made to EASA is to increase its visibility. This is part of the journey as EASA prepares for its 50th anniversary celebrations. Seeing that you're on the African continent, there's a very famous, famous African proverb that says, if you're going to go fast, you walk alone. If you're going to go far, you walk together. So the EASA NRF relationship or partnership is wanting to go far in systems analysis. And I think it takes, uh, being a microbiologist by training, I always use this analogy that there's a relationship called synergism in which two microbes are able to produce something which neither could produce alone. So microbe one can produce product A, microbe two can produce product B, but together, working together, they can produce C, and neither of them can produce it alone. So in many ways, the advances that we make in systems analysis in this country is as a result of partnerships, not just with EASA and Austria, but all, with all the NMO countries around the world. We are delighted that many representatives from other countries are here today. We are also delighted that students are here, and I'd like you to also look at the poster session. Um, the organizing committee has worked hard to put together a program uh, to ensure that you get the best out of this. But I'd like to plant the seed as EASA develops its, develops its new strategy. And what I would like to, us to reflect on is that the next time we have a conference here, and I'm hoping this will become an annual event, Albert, it won't be systems analysis and Africa, it will be systems analysis in Africa, whereby we would have made enough uh, strides to be able to report on the work that we do in this country. It's an interesting time. Uh, there are various developments in this country. Don mentioned the white paper on science, technology, and innovation. We now belong to a new ministry called the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology. But there's an interesting conversation at the moment with the minister regarding research chairs. And one is on the political economy of migration in the SADC region, which we find it, that lends itself very well with our EASA counterparts, as well as with other NMO counterparts. So it's something we'll pursue. But the other uh, component that I'd like you to reflect on is that we cannot continue as a continent just to be represented by two countries. And therefore, we have to creatively and innovatively think about how can Africa 
be more representative at structures like EASA, whereby we are able to share what we are benefiting from with the rest of our citizens on the continent. And to that, uh, I've spoken to my colleagues and we will be looking at that. We have an initiative called the Science Grandi Council Initiative, in which there are over 15 countries that we deal with. We also will be launching soon the OR Tambo Research Chairs on this continent. Uh, there's a number of other initiatives that's bringing countries on the continent together. And we feel that the work on systems analysis that's being done can also be introduced to the continent. Finally, I want to conclude by saying that one of the unique features of EASA, which we want to grasp, is the ability to convert research into policy and practice. And I think therein lies a void in many countries whereby the great research is done, but the translation is not there. And I hope that as we reflect on the various areas of research, we also think about translation of our fundamental research for public good and societal benefit. With those words, I'd like to wish us a very good conference, that we have a meaningful one, and as Dan said, it's a busy week. I have also got to get to a meeting, so I will wait for the opening session and I'll leave after that. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great time. Thank you, Ganson, Aldo, and Don, for introducing this wonderful occasion. And uh, a hearty welcome from my side to all of you. Thank you for taking some of your precious time at this very busy time of the year. Hopefully you need a, a day or so just to break away from the marking and all the other activities that are very pressing um, at this time of year. So we really appreciate the fact that you were prepared to spend a bit of time with us talking about systems analysis. So from my side, welcome. It's wonderful to be back in Pretoria. It's well, wonderful to be back in the country for a little while. Um, and I just want to give you, I've had a long list of issues I would like to share with you here, but I've crossed them off as people have touched on them already, so I'll try and deal with it with what's left. But um, we at the, at the um, at IASA have uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about our relationships with our large number of uh, membership countries around the world. And uh, this regional conference is really an approach that we've put in place. We had our first regional conference in Rio de Janeiro a few months ago uh, to, try to have every year a few regional conferences to make sure that we touch base with the researchers that are interested in, uh, are working in, and applying systems analysis in their disciplines, but also together with their colleagues across disciplinary fields. Uh, this regional initiative, we hope, is, will be something that will allow us to stay in closer contact with the research communities uh, across different parts of the world. And Africa, of course, is a clear focus for us uh, to make sure that we grow and strengthen our relationships with the African continent into the future. Um, and we will be exploring some, uh, um, some issues around the development of the new strategic plan for EASA. The new decadal plan kicks in from 2021 onwards, so we're using this as a run-up to get some inputs from the regions about what you think are the important things that EASA should be thinking about, uh, and hopefully trying to incorporate some of those ideas into our own strategic planning. We also, at the same time, winding up towards the 50th anniversary of EASA, which will be in 2022. So uh, we hope that you'll all join us in some kind of celebratory activity in 2022 to celebrate the 50 years of EASA at a global level. Um, I want to just also welcome, first of all, some of the representatives that come from beyond the borders uh, of South Africa. I knew, do know that we have a representative from our Egyptian NMO here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, ma'am. It's nice to have you here with us. And I also know that we have uh, the African Ministerial Council on Water, uh, the Executive Secretary, Dr. Kanishis Kanangire, has joined us. Uh, thank you, Kanishis. Nice to have you here. And also representatives from the private sector, um, research orientated Marie de Villiers from SAS. Marie, nice to have you here with us as well. So I hope we can start a very fruitful conversation uh, around systems analysis. I look forward to the deliberations. And uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time, and hopefully we'll have an enjoyable day talking about something that's close to all of our hearts. Thank you very much.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Priscilla Baker, and you've heard all of the other um, labels that have been attached. I have the honor and privilege to address you as the current director of um, SASAC. I would just like to lo load some slides, because I think nobody has shown you pictures of SASAC. And I think before we move ahead in this day, it's quite important that we need to see some of the people. So if I may just... Thank you. And so the first slide speaks to the first objective um, that was built into the idea when SASAC was conceptualized in South Africa, and that is to give it an identity. Um, and to have an identity, you have to have a home. And the home for SASAC was designed in the proposal originally to be UWC under the kind leadership of Professor Swanepoel and Dr. Tandy Mbobi at the time. And they did an excellent job in terms of establishing what systems analysis is and what SASAC was going to be, together with a consortium, of course, that they were working with. And when I, when I took over the program for the one year in terms of the running, I was a little bit worried, you know, when a director is appointed for a program and it called, all goes pear-shaped, then you're the one that's going to have to answer. If a director is appointed and it all goes well, you get to stand up here and say, yes, it's perfect and it's wonderful. And indeed, it is my great pleasure then to acknowledge all of the founders and the participants, not only in the proposal, but in the development of this program. As a director, it was easy for me to come in and work with scientists of this high caliber, leaders in our country at the forefront of developing new concepts, not just for the advancement of science and technology, but for building capacity. People with a true interest in the topic that they were about to address or develop, something that was completely new. Every group of students came and said, what is systems analysis? You know, who works in this area? And Karina can bail me out during our first uh, orientation workshops at the beginning. That was the main question that was debated and fluffed out and reinterpreted and redesigned in each individual student's project. Because with each, within each discipline, systems analysis had to have meaning. The thing with the PhD that makes it valuable is if it doesn't have meaning at the beginning, you're just doing what someone else is telling you, even the new knowledge that you're developing is going to be meaningful for someone else's interest. But when the students buy into the concepts and the understanding of what it is that they're about to develop, they have value and they become valuable to systems analysis, not just in South Africa, but within a global context. And I think for me, if I look back, if I reflect with all these beautiful people on the slides here, then that is what we have achieved through this program. Not just making, you know, being important as being part of this national and global network of scientists in this new area, but developing real people with a real understanding of how to apply systems analysis in its broadest context to various disciplines of research in South Africa. It took on, of course, uh, you know, um, we had to have a home, we had to have people to identify working with students, and it takes, gives me great pleasure to also introduce these new faces, because when Tandy left, uh, Karina was there, you know, Mary was there, uh, Cornelis was there, but they were at their institutions, and the students would write us and say, how do we do this? Can you book a flight? Can you fix this? Can and these were the people on the ground who had to deal with it. Yes, and I've chosen specifically funny pictures of them, because that's how they related to the students. That's how, through their own personality, through their uniqueness, through their commitment on the ground, they are the people who made systems analysis real for the new students near and far. So the success of the program over the years has seen three cohorts of students being taken into the program and fully supported in terms of all of the capacity uh, development, capacity strengthening initiatives, which included, and I'm not going to mention all of it, but just to give you an idea, some writing support, skills, how to write proposals, how to write papers, how to report on 
aspects of their research that was, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, somewhat out of their depth when they started. And more than just the soft skills of writing and communicating science, exploring policy around the issues that they were dealing with, and again, integrating it into realities that they had to deal with in social systems, in environmental systems, within policy frameworks that they were being, you know, that they were addressing and revising. In 2018, of course, was also the interesting year when all three cohorts overlapped. And even though initially the strengthening and capacity building programs was envisaged to be uh, of most value in the first year, we saw that it continued throughout the three years. And in the third year, culminated with three cohorts at different levels, with requiring different levels of attention and intervention in an exciting year of almost chaos, but mostly great fun, I think, as we continue to strengthen citizen analysis. And then, of course, also the British Council came on board because, again, they saw that the model was good, the people that were being developed had the benefits that they wanted to invest in as well, and uh, they came on board both with funding and with presence in the discussions and the workshops around systems analysis. The postdocs worked very closely with Mary to work on output from the program so that it's not just people capacity but also published capacity that emanated. And uh, the speakers before me mentioned the book that we've published on systems analysis, the module on systems analysis developed at WITS, and so I believe that there will be more output also from the work of the postdocs. And so when we sign up these bursary holders and when we give them the benefit of all this excellent management of your progress, we also lay down for them the rules. So we developed a code of conduct for systems analysis students. We uh, explain to them very clearly upfront what they expect as a bursary holder and what they can expect from us. And together within this framework of understanding each other, even though at the beginning they may not have understood systems analysis, they were able to succeed. And today I'm very pleased to be part of this team and I would like to acknowledge all the partners and also the, um, you know, the oversight of these programs globally uh, for this opportunity to have hosted this program at UWC. I think UWC is very privileged and we're very proud to have been part of this program in the various aspects of its development. And so I thank you. To all the speakers, thank you very much, and Priscilla, indeed, for the overview. This was one part, of course, of the whole engagement of South Africa and the region with EASA and the notion of systems analysis, but it has been a core part in uh, building on the previous investment, but also setting our investment up for the future. And thank you, indeed, for the, to the preceding speakers for putting some context of what our engagement will be today. Well, before I introduce the two keynote speakers, uh, there's two sets of acknowledgements that I think at this stage is uh, very important. Number one, the team that has put this together, which was an excellent collaboration between uh, EASA partners and the NRF specifically, and uh, indeed Dr. Sepo Hajigonta and Dr. Priscilla Mensa, true leaders at the NRF with respect to the investment in systems analysis, Puleng Chitlo, Penelope Chauke, Kathy Potgieter, and I cannot but recognize Matsuake Rakoale, who worked very closely with us in the initial granting process uh, with uh, the two programs. From the YASA side, uh, Tom Danazer and uh, Ian Stewart, thank you indeed. And uh, substantively, the scientific committee who has reviewed the papers, who has crafted the program, and he put this together, Professor Brian Feth, who we know well, he's a senior research scientist at IHASA, <clears throat> but also one of the original supervisors and continue to be of uh, the student cohort, uh, Dr. Barbara Villard, a research scholar at IHASA. Professor Ursula Schaller, very importantly UKZN, and chairperson of South Africa's uh, NMO committee to EASA. Professor Swan Franz Swanepoel that has been mentioned, uh, SA NMO member, and of course Professor Mary Scholes who have been mentioned, also uh, SM, SA NMO member. There's uh, other colleagues that serves on South Africa's national member organization, 
uh, it's Dr. Brilliant Petcher from the Water Research Commission, uh, Professor Colleen Fogel from Wits University, and Dr. Happy Sitole, who is the director of the Center for High Performance Computing in South Africa. Colleagues, thank you indeed for the preceding session. And uh, again, uh, the gratefully acknowledged to put this together. As introduction to the next session, there are two keynote addresses. One will be by Dr. Albert van Jarsveld to set a macro scene and the strategic engagement of what this notion of systems analysis mean, how we can engage globally, but specifically on the continent. That is followed by Professor Ursula Schaller from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, who provide uh, also a macro overview but uh, perhaps bring that uh, scholarly engagement from a systems analysis and global change perspective. And as we have indicated, she is the chairperson of South Africa's national member organization. Albert, you first, thank you very much. Thank you, you're learning. You're learning. Thank you, everybody. Um, I don't know whether we have a pointer here, do we? I'm not sure that I saw one. I have to use a mouse? Okay. Okay, more out of the meantime. Okay. Ah, it does, the mouse does. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll see you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, I'll do. Thanks for the introduction. And I'll try and take you through uh, what we do at IASA quite quickly uh, to give you a sense of what's going on. But I think, first of all, is to understand that as a systems analysis institution at IASA, we focus on multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, focusing on global problems, which are common to all of us, on the global commons and, commons and how we deal with those, but also, of course, the universal challenges, those things that we share, uh, that we have to tackle collectively and that we can learn from one another. Just about the name, uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Uh, Priscilla, if you were having difficulty explaining it to the students, just to give you a sense of history here. Uh, when the name IASA was formulated in the 1970s, uh, it started off as the East-West Institute, which uh, was a little bit uh, politically contentious in those days because, of course, it was members from the East Bloc and the Western Bloc uh, that, that comprised the membership of IASA to start off with. Um, they came up with the known notion of an interna international institute uh, for systems analysis. Uh, and those were the days when uh, this kind of thinking was really a hot topic and new in the landscape. And then somebody decided that they have to add the applied systems analysis. And the fundamental reason for adding the applied systems analysis was to make 100% sure that nobody had any clue what they were doing. Okay, so now if you are having difficulty explaining to the students what this is all about, I can understand that. Uh, but I think that's a name that's now carried forward into, and it's become more and more relevant and more and more topical. And I think the fact that we've managed to define the applied systems analysis in the context of having policy impact is really what we're trying to strive, as far, strive for as far as systems analysis is concerned. EASA currently has 22 members distributed around the world. Uh, we would like to grow this, of course, in a sensible manner and in a strategic manner into the future. And those of you that vis visit us and spend a bit of time with us will encounter these kinds of skills distributed across the Institute uh, where people put together the, these skills in different configurations and different um, projects to make sure that we can try and tackle the global and universal problems we spoke about earlier. Staff at IASA, uh, natural scientists, some of them are engineers, com programmers, computer scientists, and of course also social scientists from the humanities and the social sciences as well. And together these groupings of people bring to bear their skills on the area of systems analysis um, so that we can get the best of understanding of what the real issues are in the world but also at the same time making sure that we bring quantitative approaches to solving problems and providing evidence to the best of our ability. The current IASA programs look like this. There are nine programs at IASA. Uh, some of you would have engaged with some of these programs. These programs will probably be slightly amended in the new strategic plan and will probably be slightly uh, reconfigured. But the essence of the work that's carried on uh, at IASA the essence of the skills base that's present there and is available to people 
will be made, uh, will remain and will be strengthened in some areas moving into the future. And so the idea is that we bring together these skills to uh, tackle uh, systems approaches in support of the notion of sustainability at IASA. IASA has been blessed in the sense that we've managed to attract some of the highest performing people from around the world. Currently, in this year, we have at, le at least 11 people I think it's 11, yeah, um, that um, perform at the highest level in terms of their citation impacts over the last decade, so in their respective disciplines. And the IASA has had the ability to attract people from around the world. We have representatives amongst our staff of 62 countries. We have 350 staff members uh, that represent 62 countries. And they really, we have the ability and the capability to attract uh, some of the best young people into the system. And of course our Young Scientist Summer Program is a, an attempt to do that for the next generation of scientists to make sure that the pipeline of young people that join us at the institution are of high impact. As an institution, we have been awarded the Nobel Prize at, on six occasions uh, with multiple uh, representatives from IASA. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand that as an institution with between 150 and 350 staff members over the last 20 years or so, uh, the impact in terms of this particular area has been significant for the institution. We deal with complex problems, issues that are difficult to solve in the context of a single discipline. This is just an illustration of one of those complex problems that you're all familiar with and fully aware of, the sustainable development goals of the UN and this we consider to be a gift to humanity. Um, I think it's one of the most important decisions, Agenda 2030, taken by the UN over a long period of time, uh, since the Declaration of Human Rights, I think, much, much earlier. Um, but whether we make this a success or not is up to us, and whether we turn this opportunity into reality is going to be in our hands. We at IASA feel strongly about this initiative, but I think what I'm trying to illustrate here is the complexity of this problem that's facing us. Even if you take one single sustainable development goal, such as zero hunger, it's impossible to even con contemplate resolving that matter without having healthy natural systems in place that support that objective, without having robust human and social systems in place that facilitate us achieving that outcome and without having conducive technology and infrastructure systems in place in terms of making sure that we achieve zero hunger. And you can do the same exercise for every one of the SDGs. So what we have here is a real complex problem that touches on multiple disciplines, multiple areas of work. And we at IASA feel essentially that the worst thing we can do, and I nearly sank into the ground the other day when I heard somebody from the ministry in Austria say that they have a professor in every one of the SDGs. The last thing that we should be doing is tackling the SDGs one by one. That is going to result in unexpected outcomes. It's going to result in uh, secondary consequences in other sectors that we hadn't contemplated and thought about. If you don't deal with them collectively, we are going to get it this horribly wrong. So I'm just raising the flag that this is important. It's one of those areas of work where you really need to be collaborating and working together. So if you ask me what is the essence of IASA, I guess this is about it, this one slide. Um, I won't show you any models today, so relax. Um, but I think this is just gives you a sense of the available models that we do have. The message model, which is the energy model that runs at IASA. We have our water model. Just above that, we have our gains model, which is our air pollution air quality monitoring model. Uh, we have transport, macroeconomic models, population models. Um, we have uh, the GlobeBio model, which looks at land use issues and the trade-offs between different kinds of land use. And the strength of EASA is not only that we have these models that can function in those broad sectors and provide good policy advice for people to optimize their investments and actually result in sensible outcomes, but the, the fact that we can make these models talk to each other. In other words, there's a relationship between them. So when we think about energy, we can think about population, we can think about the water consequences, we can think about the economic consequences, etc., and pull all of them together. And this is what we're trying to do at TIASA, clearly in, in the context of the new strategy, is to make sure that we improve the integration between the different models that we have available at the institution, 
but at the same time we also want to make sure that each and every one of our models becomes scalable. In other words, that we can deal with it from a global level to a regional level and hopefully a national and even subnational level. In other words, that, that notion of scalability together with integration is what we're trying to achieve in the new strategy and I think that will put us on a course to strengthen the, the impact of systems analysis. Oops, what's happened there? End of slideshow, I didn't want to go there. Oops, let me jump up. I'm just trying to find, sorry, I'll just find my place again. Uh, do, 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 do. Where are we? Yeah. This is the slowest mouse in the world. All right. <laughs> All right. This is just to illustrate one of the consequences of doing integrated planning. If we were looking at energy security on the left-hand side by itself, it would cost about under 0.2% of the global GDP to provide energy security around the world. It's a reasonably small cost to pay, but on the other hand, if we wanted to look at air pollution, which is the consequences of generating some of that energy and other activities, that would cost close to 0.5% of the global GDP. On the other hand, if we wanted to deal with climate change, which is the secondary consequences of all these activities, close to or more than 0.8% of the GDP. Each one of those costs, if you add them together, is 40% higher than looking for an integrated solution, which is the far right end bar that you have there. By achieving or pursuing integrated solutions, we not only achieve greater efficiency, we harness some of the synergies that may come from these different sectors, but at the same time, we also consider the trade-offs. And as a consequence of that, we can provide more cost-effective solutions across different sectors by integrating the analysis. And this is what we're really trying to achieve uh, at EASA. This is just some history about EASA's collaborative work, the fact that we were working with governments in Europe. This is the old acid rain problem from the 1970s that all of you can remember. And there were three important policy decisions that were taken collectively across Europe, and they listed at the bottom, that resulted in the reduction of SO2 concentrations in the air uh, across Europe and put us on the light blue curve, vis -vis the dark blue one, which would have been the reality today if we'd done nothing in that period of time. This is just to demonstrate the value of not only working across disciplines, but working across regions and that regional collaboration sometimes re results in much better progress rather than having a narrow nationalistic view of trying to solve these kinds of problems. We at EASA were concerned about the SDGs, as we mentioned earlier. We're also concerned about their complexity, 17 sustainable development goals and 130-something targets, if I remember correctly. Um, but we do think it's possible through a, one of our projects we're running called The World in 2050 to simplify the SDG framework. And essentially what we suggest is that it's possible to achieve the vast majority of the targets as well as the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals by simply delivering on six major transformations that have come out of a collective analysis at TIASA together with some of our partners listed at the bottom. And these are really important dimensions. You'll see them. I'm not going to read through all of them. You can read them a lot quicker than I can. But I think it gives you a, a sense of the six major things that we have to achieve. If we can achieve those across the world, the SDGs will be virtually in our back pocket without us having to pursue the multitude targets and the complexities of the SDGs as they're formulated at the moment. We work a lot on vulnerable populations. Climate change is a major issue. And this is just to emphasize that in the short term, there will be significant consequences of climate change in terms of increasing the vulnerabilities of certain populations due to increased drought across the world. That's the short-term consequence. The long-term consequence is, of course, that this is going to affect the development of young people in those countries and in those regions affected by these droughts. This means that you're going to have a larger and larger proportion of the global population where people are not capable of fulfilling their full human potential. And that puts a, a strain on the envi environment development, but also puts a strain on the economic development of those countries. And it's something that we have to think about. Climate change is not just about dealing with hot temperatures, water shortages, food shortages. It's about the long-term development consequences it has for particular vulnerable populations around the world. Closer to home, South Africa, some of the ASA work indicated quite clearly 
I think, a very important finding to illustrate that uh, the notion of shale gas may be a bit of fool's gold uh, in the sense that it seems that shale gas is only going to be viable as a contributor to the energy mix in South Africa at very low extraction costs, which is much lower than the current costs are. And the consequence of that is that um, essentially we will be chasing our tails in terms of the contribution it's making, either in terms of the contribution to the total energy mix, but secondly also the consequences for carbon emissions into the future. And this paper clearly illustrates that what we should be doing is moving away from shale gas as a source of energy into the future because it's not going to be economically viable. And if it were economically viable, uh, the carbon consequences would be severe and overwhelming. So we need to think about that very carefully. How much energy do we need? This is an analysis on the left-hand side of business as usual, a middle road and then a climate-friendly solution on the right-hand side across three countries, Brazil, uh, India and South Africa, to illustrate well, how much energy do we really need for full access for decent living or decent life for the majority of people. The current thinking is that if you increase the energy access to people uh, across the country, that you're driving the energy demands to levels that are unsustainable and uh, will therefore not be able to pursue it into the future. What this illustrates is that in order to achieve decent living standards through full access to energy, we can actually decline the energy, to need, energy needs into the future. The real problem with energy need across a country is not to provide access to everybody in the system at a fundamental level for a decent quality of life. The real problem is the energy need to sustain affluence in those countries at the end of the day. And we need to understand this and we need to understand what this means. That the total energy demand is not dependent on full access across different systems. It's the affluence and it's the overuse and, and unstrategic use of energy that's the real problem in countries. And we have to think about what the balance is in terms of what we're trying to achieve in terms of socio-economic equity versus just pure economic short-term gains. Also, we've been involved in some interesting nexus work uh, in the Zambezi Valley looking at water energy and uh, water energy land use issues uh, in an integrated fashion, just to illustrate to you that our analysis indicates that it is possible, compared to business as usual scenario right at the bottom of the graph, to find more resilient futures in terms of water, land, and energy usage across the Zambezi Basin, based on different assumptions, which gives you the three different outcomes that you see at the top. But you'll see the most important message is that taking a nexus approach, integrating these disciplines with one another and thinking about the trade-offs and the synergies that emerge allows us to come up with much more sustainable solutions for the future than we currently have. And of course, which future path we take will be dependent on the policy decisions and the trade-offs we prepare to make. And so we can make those political decisions you know, for our benefit, but at least the pathway will be in the right direction. This is a interesting project called FABLE, and I know South Africa is on the verge of joining this initiative uh, at a global level. Uh, it focuses on food, agriculture, biodiversity, and land, and energy collectively. It's a bottoms-up initiative based on the principles of co-design, where we have nation states that analyze their own scenarios in terms of food, agriculture, biodiversity, land, and energy, and feed that into a global system so that we can analyze at a global level what the consequences of the local decisions are. And then there's a feedback loop that comes back and says, well, collectively we're overshooting the mark by X percent or Y percent. We're not achieving food security. We are destroying the biodiversity base or whatever the outcome may be. And we can then restart the negotiation process to make sure that we try and achieve the global targets of the SDGs in these particular areas. But it gives you a sense that there is a, a, a really interesting movement happening globally for engagement with local communities, 
for getting the information and the input from local communities, synergizing for everybody's access and for everybody's information what the collective picture looks like, and how we can use that collective picture to come back and, re and reassess the national initiative so that we can achieve a global outcome uh, that is in the interest of the SDGs at the end of the day. Citizen science, becoming more and more important to DIASA. Getting people involved in providing information. This is a simple map on uh, land use and cropland uh, activities around the world. The top map was the original one that was based on uh, remote sensing data. Or, and then the bottom one was the inputs that we received from global citizens about ground truthing that information, telling, giving us information to say this is really what's happening, these are the crops, and that resulted in the middle map, which is a much improved map, if you like, of glo glo global croplands, and it gives you a sense of the power of using citizens to make inputs into uh, our scientific process. Again, it's part of democratizing science, it's part, a big part of what we're trying to achieve at IASA, because it does circumvent some of the issues around trust of the scientific process uh, around the globe if citizens become involved at a fundamental level. This is some of the modeling work that IASA was involved with, with the Mexican government initially, where they used the CATSA model to develop, uh, analyze the financial implications of natural disasters and catastrophes that happen quite frequently in the Mexican environment. And of course, these have to be funded from the national fiscus from Mexico, which puts a huge financial drain on their planning moving into the future. So what this model did is came up with an instrument uh, to say that there is an opportunity for us not to carry the risk at the national level, but to actually put that risk in the global marketplace and to take out insurance, if you like, from a national perspective uh, to uh, prevent or to cover the consequences of these natural disasters. This model is now being used or being explored by 25 finance ministries around the world to make sure that we spread the risk of natural disasters uh, in a more sensible manner than trying to carry it at a national level. We also use agent-based models from the bottom up to get a sense of how particular systems work. Um, this is spatially explicit uh, in a way that is really useful because it allows you to bring together the different forces and what the consequences are. This is a particular model with 100,000 agents uh, involved that involves households, businesses, and assesses the consequences of local flood risk for the local economy uh, in a particular environment. So, on that basis, um, I wanted to summarize that we currently at IASA have two members in Africa. Janssen has hinted towards a, a conversation to broaden uh, that into the future, um, but we do have been very active in Africa as an, as an institute. More than 29 projects since 2017 across the countries that are listed there. Um, the new strategy for IASA is most likely will focus on the more of a regional focus. and. Uh, very importantly, there's a movement called the Africa Uninet, uh, which has been driven by the Aust Austrian Agency for International Cooperation to create long-term relationships between research institutes and universities in Austria and Africa. And I think we can use that for our mutual benefit uh, if we plug into that initiative, which will be launched towards the end of the year. So whatever your persuasion, whatever your view of life, I think we at IASA feel that we can do better in terms of providing outcomes and research results that speak directly to critical interventions that are required and can provide better policy solutions at the end of the day. And we propose that systems analysis is one of the tools that can strengthen the impact of science on society and can strengthen the impact of science on sensible and useful policy making into the future. And thank you so much for listening. Appreciate it. Oh, but thank you very much indeed. Colleagues, we want to invite Professor Schaller to uh, make the next presentation. If there's time, we can engage and provide perhaps a short summary of the context of the openings, but especially focused on these two keynotes. Thank you very much, Albert. Ursula.
Good morning, everybody. Um, my uh, task for today, uh, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me, is to give an, a regional overview of systems analysis um, uh, here at this conference. And that is actually something that we've been talking about for a while within the NMO committee. Um, and as I embarked on this task, I realized how much of systems analysis is actually going on in the region. So in order to provide a comprehensive overview, uh, we would probably need a few months research to actually capture each and everything. But I give you a brief overview of, um, of prominent structures uh, and things that we have going on uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, further out, and uh, Dr. Van Jaarsveld also has given an excellent introduction uh, to this and providing us uh, with an overview. Uh, so systems analysis, as we just heard, is an excellent tool to combine things, to look into the future, to make several scenarios, to make scenarios, to include everything and everyone that needs to be included to tackle a particular problem. Um, what is really a bit difficult to define is what is the region, right? So if we here now in South Africa, is the region uh, sub-Saharan? Is it SEDEC? Is it the continent? Or, or is it actually the globe? And why is it so difficult? Because things are interconnected all the time. So only focusing on the region will uh, give us only part of, the, of our challenges and part of our solutions. <clears throat> and the reason is, of course, that we live in a world of globalization. And uh, just to il illustrate, there are many examples one could pull up, but for instance, here a global network of the potato trade, uh, where we see that Africa is involved to some extent. Here, a um, uh, network of land trade, which looks much more interesting to us. So in this uh, figure, we see that the orange and red uh, dots um, tell us about net land exports. So basically, other countries might own land. Uh, in, a different, um, in a different country to produce crops, for instance, that are exported back, exported back to the ownership country. Uh, and if you, uh, the green and gray colors are the net importers. So we see we can't actually, in many activities that we do, we cannot isolate our region. Here we have a waste uh, trade network with um, sources on the left-hand side and receivers on the right-hand side. Again, we cannot just uh, take apart those networks and, um, and concentrate only on one piece if we want the entire overview. Um, so to stay in the region, what kind of broad systems analysis initiatives do we have going on? We heard a little bit already about SASEC and SOISSP, but there are also other initiatives. Uh, in the region and especially in South Africa, for instance, we have a systems, climate systems analysis group in the, at the University of Cape Town. We have uh, health systems and policy research at WITS University and UWESC. We have our uh, systems analysis uh, center, the South African Center for Systems Analysis that we've uh, heard about already. And that, as we also heard, came out of the SIYSSP that emulated <coughs> Excuse me. The three months uh, research effort that is currently EASIS YSSP. And the SESEC, as we've heard, is a three year PhD program. Uh, we've got a chair in the research chair in systems analysis, Professor Marys Holes. Um, and uh, as we heard from Dr. Struble er earlier on, uh, South Africa is also initiating uh, a lot more research chairs across the region of different, um, of different uh, themes. Uh, but besides all these centers and that organized effort, there's a lot of systems analysis going on. And here's just one example of transformation in cities and using a systems analysis approach for that. That was somebody's thesis at DUT uh, in Durban. So there is really a lot going on that we might not necessarily call systems analysis or it's not captured in any of the organized structures that we have. Now, uh, coming back shortly to the SAYSSP, which started in uh, 2012 uh, and uh, included uh, many people from South Africa, also from the African region, but also from the other NMO countries. And this is the book that Dr. Schrubel already mentioned that came out of this, um, out of this effort, uh, which documents several case studies. So if you want to know which specific 
type of systems analysis studies uh, were going on in the region. That's in this book. And then when we introduced the uh, SASEC um, uh, center and the student cohort with that, these are the main themes that have been, um, that have been tackled from the cohort starting between 2016 and 2018. Uh, and because we, we expanded it to a full PhD program, that also had the effect that the studies were more concentrated in the region. So now we don't uh, include studies here as we had in the SAYSSP from, I don't know, China or India uh, or wherever um, we had, but it actually concentrated a lot on the regions. And if you actually read through the main, uh, the big words uh, in this map, you can see that SDGs again, that we uh, feed quite nicely into the SDGs. Although you can also see that some of the SDGs we uh, neglect, okay? And uh, some of those that we do neglect and probably should be a bit more effort in is economic development, is governance, and so on. But others we, uh, we cover quite well. All right. So to, to, we heard a little bit about in the previous talk already about the challenges that we have and the solutions. So we often know where do we want to go to, but we don't always know how to get there, right? And uh, if we know how to get there, we don't always know how to convince the right people to actually help us get there. And so uh, these pictures, just to point out, uh, just to say that pointing out challenges is quite easy, okay? Uh, coming to the solutions is a little more difficult, and, and that is mainly because we stumble uh, over our social systems. So it's the, the government structures or systems we have, it's the, the social um, systems we have in general. So it's not only, it's of course politicians, it's other people in power, it's also scientists. How do we actually negotiate all of this human system to uh, implement the solutions that we as scientists can think of. And to come back to system analysis, so the basic things we really do is to generate new systems, right? Uh, for instance, for situations where traditional systems might not be applicable or not be very useful, and we optimize uh, existing systems or the new systems that we generate. So these are sort of two main pillars of systems analysis. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, generating new systems, new systems. And especially in the region, um, we don't really have to go uh, the traditional way uh, that other countries already went. If there are some systems that are actually more applicable or more efficient or just better suited for the region in general, and they um, can talk to various themes, for instance, banking or health systems, communication, information, and so on. So quite simply, we don't need to, in the banking system, we don't need to build banks and infrastructure to bring people to banks um, and have roads and have transport and have all of this. Now we have mobile banking, right? And the great thing is you don't even need to take a day off work to do your banking. And it's catching on, so it's obviously it's very useful, a very useful system, and perhaps more useful than the traditional system. Uh, if you go to healthcare, this is a map of um, how well people can access healthcare. And you guess the red is there's not a very good access to healthcare, and the purple is there's a very good access to healthcare, and the various shades in between. Um, and why is that? Because one would need again, certain infrastructure. One needs doctors and hospitals and roads and transport and so on to get people to doctors, to get doctors to people. But we can also sidestep some, at least some of this, where one doesn't necessarily need physical contact with a physician and can use our communication systems to help people uh, a bit better. Uh, another one, another system, of this is the agricultural system, for instance. There are, <clears throat> there are for instance, lovely apps out already for farmers uh, that can help you what to plant in your soil, in your climate, 
when to apply fertilizer, how the weather plays with this, or to identify crop diseases and get information on how to deal with them. Uh, and this can all go via, <coughs> via mobile network and, uh, and information that is stored somewhere that is accessible to people. Um, in the marine world, uh, we have in South Africa a very nice system called Abalobi. So this is for small-scale fishes, and that's again a communication network uh, that deals with uh, permits, catches, uh, the market, sales, stories, and so on. Again, a very nice system, although it's perhaps very regional, uh, that helps uh, in that way and that enhances also the, the, um, the efficiency uh, for people engaging in this particular economic sector. Staying in the marine world um, and talking about man initiatives, so this is a map of certain impacts in the ocean that reflect back to fisheries, and I want to point out only two regions. One is the western, um, sorry, the eastern Atlantic along the West African coast, the Benguela current, and the other one is on the other side of Africa, the Western Indian Ocean region uh, that affects uh, the East Africa countries. And uh, for instance, the orange at the Benguela current there, South Africa, Namibia, and Angola, uh, will probably be quite impacted by climate change. So for instance, there's a climate adaptation program going on at the moment. Uh, these are the most rich, the, not the most rich, the richest fishing grounds for um, for our three countries, South Africa, Namibia, and Angola. Or for instance, if you move to the other side of the continent, here are um, the blue growth initiatives happening. So how to help people that are dependent on the Western Indian Ocean region in terms of fisheries <coughs> on the resources and how might we deal with them in the future. So in terms of uh, present and future solutions, there are always these dichotomies that we have to deal with, right? So there are always um, extremes that we have uh, that are either or, and we're not quite sure how to combine them. Here, yeah, just list a few. Should we stay local or must we, should we go international? Basic and applied research, public good versus commerce, and so on. So what would really be the best road to take? And the systems analysis approach, of course, help us to combine all of these things. And we've heard in the previous talks um, a bit about initiatives already, but just for the continent to point out there are initiatives. People do think about the future uh, and a few, genera few human generations ahead and how to tackle things, that we need sustainability, we need certain things. Okay? As, as I said before, we're quite clear on what we need, but we're not so clear on how to get there. And so um, what's keeping us? from getting there. And some of the, I want to explore briefly three things. One is resources, one is governance, and one is scientific know-how or scientific knowledge. So do we have all of this uh, or we don't? And how does this play into, into the region and increasing development, uh, sustainable development in the region? And for instance, we do know that there is a, um, a good correlation between governance and GDP. Okay? So countries with good governance uh, have, a giant, have a higher GDP and graphs like this one can find uh, many that uh, GDP is, has a very nice correlation with governance or the other way around, I should say. But with the, okay, if we then go from resource to, um, to scientific knowledge, so of course we need uh, scientific knowledge in order to, to get us on our path to, the de to development. And we see here, these are uh, said countries listed here. Malawi has the highest um, investment in research and development as, as percentage of its GDP, <clears throat> which is about 1%. Uh, and then if you look at the lowest one, there's two orders of magnitude less. So we've got a huge range in the region of how much money there is available to spend <coughs> on research and development. And that's why partnerships are so important and that's why we can't just focus on the region, but we need to focus a little bit out. And here one interesting fact I found, and I didn't know that South Africa 
uh, in some years back in a five-year period filed nearly 100% uh, of static patents. So that's quite incredible. Okay? So that one, you can of course deduct two things from that. One is, yes, yeah, South Africa, we are really good, or the region is not so good. And if we look at the resources that we have, and on the bottom there you see South Africa, the green, the green uh, bars uh, talk to GDP, and the blue and the red talk to uh, how much research output, scientific knowledge, number of uh, investment in research and development, basically. We see it's quite small. So if you take this in relation to the previous slide, uh, where the static countries are much smaller and down to two orders of magnitude less than South Africa, uh, then we see that we don't have a lot of resources in the region. Um, another, another um, we often look to government to drive things, right? Because government makes policies and government uh, makes plans in terms of where we should be going to. But then we can't, governments can't afford um, all, the, all the funding for all the plans that we might be making. And again, here South Africa stands out among the other set of countries in terms of how much business actually invests in, in research and development. Uh, whereas the percentage of business in other set of countries is much, much lower. But if we compare this on a global scale, uh, so on the x-axis you have uh, years, and then I just pointed out three countries, South Africa, this is, sorry, the, the uh, investment in research and development by business enterprises uh, as a percentage of the GDP. And uh, I put there South Korea because it's the flagship, right? And, uh, and uh, a well-performing uh, European country and then South Africa. So again, this is not necessarily to point out how badly South Africa is faring against the globe, but to point out how we lacking some of the resources and why we need partnerships and influx into the region instead of uh, exodus. And, um, and to tie the three together, resources, governance, and scientific uh, know-how, this is a, a categorization of set of countries into fragile, viable, and <clears throat> evolving. And you see that most countries are actually in the fragile and um, viable categories. And it also seems, as we heard already with the research chairs, the OR, OR Tumbo research chairs, chairs today, that South Africa is also a major investor for other things in the region. And that's really, really important because it's about uh, communication systems and several industrial sectors uh, that really need to um, need some investment. So we're, as we in South Africa might think, we need some investment from outside. The region, of course, needs investment. South Africa is one of these investors. All right. Uh, the, the question is often where do we want to progress to? We heard in a previous talk a little bit about we don't, we can't afford uh, an excessive living standard for everybody <coughs> on the planet. And here, if you look, uh, these are the, this is the Human Development Index, uh, the HDI of um, of UNEP, and of course it, does, it includes some things, not everything perhaps that should be included. It's about how long and healthy people live, the educational standard and so on. And you see in that circle diagram uh, where it's red, uh, this is the lowest uh, human development index and almost one billion people are in that category. And if you look on the left hand side, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest uh, HDI, and most of Sub-Saharan Africa is in that, um, in that category of the one uh, billion people. So of course, we, see, we always see changes needed, right? And uh, how do we change uh, things? We don't want to do this, where the high development, uh, high HDI countries have a huge, for instance, a huge uh, CO2 emission per capita uh, of all their uses. Um, and there are lots of figures like this one could show, of course, in terms of resource use. Uh, so we don't really want to do that. And uh, the scenario building that we heard in the previous talk is really, really important uh, to 
to paint different futures, right? To see what else can there be, because often we're very stuck in what we know, and we're very bad in looking outside the box and see what else could be possible. And lastly, I want to come back to systems analysis again and make a few connections to ecosystems. And I want to make these connections because ecosystems persist over time, right? At least for many human generations, and that's sort of often our planning horizon, unless we're politicians, maybe not. But um, they're resilient, they can adapt to certain things, and uh, we can perhaps learn a little in our governance system and our economic systems and how to uh, structure them in order to persist over time. And that, of course, that goes for some aspects, not for all aspects. But one of them is, for instance, we have in ecosystems a lot of positive feedback loops. And these positive feedback loops, they help us to garner more energy and more matter into the system. And that is reflected as growth, right, in an ecosystem. And we have the same concept in economic and political system, if we go to local system, not sure if you can, on the left hand side, the circle is a local system, a centripetal system, um, garnering the, the power, and uh, if we look towards globalization, we go to a centrifugal, centrifugal system, uh, losing it from the region. And in cities, for instance, that's quite a, a prominent area of research, that, of course, cities exert centripetal forces because they already have some of the resources, the, the jobs, the economy is uh, <coughs> as richer than in, in uh, areas outside. All right, so another concept that we can learn from, in, from ecosystems is about resilience and sustainability. And I want to start with painting what an agricultural system looks like. So an agricultural system can only exist if we constantly put in resources, right? And that might be fertilizer or water or seeds or whatever it might be. And what we do then is then maximizing the output, which is the crop, right? So this is how agri agricultural systems work. Uh, and um, without that constant input, they wouldn't be sustainable. And the con consequence is that we have re very little recycling within the system. Now, an eco a natural ecosystem works quite the opposite. So we have very few uh, inputs and outputs across the boundary, but we have a lot of recycling within the system, and that makes it more resilient and more sustainable instead of being constantly uh, uh, dependent on the outside. So here's an exa a real, real example in terms of uh, fish protein um, imports, and just to illustrate, the sustainability in an economic way. So within the African continent, we have very little movement of fish protein, so selling from one country to another, but we have a massive amount of imports without which we couldn't sustain the fish protein consumption on the continent. Okay. And so just to summarize this, that we could, in some aspects, of course not in all, but in some aspects, we could aim towards a more ecosystem-like configuration because we already know these are persistent systems, and they might, that might give us more sustainability and then also more growth as we garner more resources. And to finish off, the question is, what should we really focus on? Okay, so many people have many different ideas, but, and I wrote a few things down here, and the list could be many pages long, uh, but one of the most important things I feel is that we break with traditional systems to the extent that we make them a bit more flexible and adaptable to certain problems and to certain regions. So we all know where we want to go to, and I found this <coughs> interestingly on the KwaZulu-Natal Provincial Department uh, website, and that paints again this end point, right? What do we want? We want prosperity and we want the planet to be healthy and we want the people to be happy and have a good living standard, but how do we go there? If you look at KZN now, we're not going there, right? There's inequality, the environment um, is not very well off, and um, uh, it's economically not very efficient. Uh, and in this, of course, the, the systems analysis 
again, as I said, adapting for the region, uh, looking regional, but not forgetting the international is a really major step that we need to be focusing on here to make progress. Okay, thank you very much. Or whatever. Yeah. Ursula, thank you very much. Uh, the same to Albert for these two fascinating keynotes. We want to try and focus the discussions within the panels, but if you don't mind, let's allow two or three short comments. I found it very interesting because there's a few aspects that have been picked up. Uh, one that is particularly and currently within the sphere of the NRF is this notion that Albert has mentioned of public engagement. So truth in science, the legitimization of science, and how the action of so-called citizen science can contribute to that. That is actually one of the topics for the Global Research Council, which the NRF will host next year, and is a virtual organization of all the public science councils in the world. The second component is that all of you work in this field from various perspectives, but the complexity of addressing through certain methodologies this massively integrated problems that all of us faces, of course, from each different perspectives, regionally, and I mean sub within a nation or across borders regionally or further afield, is really quite uh, extraordinary. So hence, different approaches and uh, different insights and capacities necessary to take that further. The third one, and this was very clear from Ursula's uh, presentation, is this differentiation in scale and how of the problems and how the different approaches can bring scalability towards uh, achieving some of the solutions. And the fourth aspect is this notion of global networks. Of course, all of us work with the understanding that it is impossible to achieve a complex challenge alone, and hence the notion of networks is important. But from a researcher perspective, from a research supporter perspective, from a global organization like EASA's perspective and further afield, this is critical. And for me, this is fundamental. I'm very pleased, and probably this will come out in the discussions later today, that I think outside of the normal notion, we have partnered inter alia with EASA in the establishment of the SDG Forum of Funders. And that is, for the first time, among many other prominent examples, a true reflection of a global approach in how to address these challenges. So really, uh, both Albert and Ursula, thank you. Colleagues, there are roving mics if you want, but in the first four rows, there are microphones in front of you. It is not compulsory. If you feel a need to make a comment, please do so. Priscilla, please. Well, thank you very much to all the speakers this morning. The presentations have really been thought-provoking. Um, I'd like to direct my uh, question to Dr. Fenyaswald. We've worked with Yasa for a number of years, and on slide six where you had the picture of all the top 1% um, of uh, researchers at IASA, it struck me that there was a diversity of disciplines, but they happen to be all male. So how does IASA plan to find a nexus solution to make this picture more inclusive? With the yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Priscilla. That's very kind of you. <laughs> um, we, of course, at IASA are quite, are quite aware in the, the stark picture that you see in front of you uh, when, when we put that up. Unfortunately, um, I think, and we've had this conversation internally with our research community as well, the challenges out there is for how do we get 
our women scientists to perform at a level because that's a quant it's a very really easy quantitative assessment of the of your citation impact. Uh, they just simply add up the numbers. You know, it's not a it's not a, a secret as to how they get to the answers that they that they generate. But I think for us as a community is to how do we develop career pathways for women scientists and for young women scientists that allow them to compete effectively in that space. Um, and there are issues around uh, family responsibilities and all other things and, uh, and, and that have to be taken into account. Um, and it's unlikely we're going to be able to change the metrics as a consequence of it, but I think it, 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 uh, it forces us to think really creatively and innovatively about what are the sustainable career paths that can put women scientists on the trajectory where they can truly be internationally competitive. And if you look at the Nobel thing, you'll see the same picture emerging. It's not just uh, uh, you know, in that space as well. Um, and it really is the exceptional, the only, one, well, the only one or two females have managed to break into the Nobel space, as you know, uh, as well. And so it, I think it's a challenge for our entire society as to whether we can allow people to, to work more effectively from a home environment uh, rather than being office bound whether that can work in some disciplines, in other words, if you're a chemistry professor, is it a reasonable uh, pathway for you to pursue, to re work in that manner? Uh, I guess if you're a mathematician, that'd probably be more viable. Uh, so these are the difficult societal questions that we have to ask ourselves. But I think also that, um, and, and again, there are mixed feelings. Some people say that we should have a, a separate way of measuring the female scientist performance. Um, but I also know a lot of female colleagues that take huge exception to that particular approach as well. So it's a really difficult, tough question to deal with, but it's a, it's a challenge for all of us. Our next regional EASA conference will focus on engendering systems analysis globally. Tandy? Mine is very quick one. Press your that uh, the, the programs at EASA don't have a feature on um, social and human sciences. Although I know a lot of uh, EASA researchers are working on policy, when I look at the programs of UNESCO of social and human sciences, there's a lot of work on policy and their related disciplines, but it doesn't feature as one of your key themes. I'm just wondering, maybe in a new strategic uh, plan, is that something that you've considered? Yes, that was highlighted in the review um, as, a, as a, a skewness in the way that the EASA has worked traditionally. And I think in the new strategic plan, we need to emphasize the whole socioeconomic landscape uh, in terms of the work that needs to be done there. Of course, the tricky question is, and this is, I'll throw it back to you to, to, to think about that one, is how do you apply systems analysis in a socioeconomic <laughs> context? Economics may be easy. Understanding social systems may be a little bit more difficult, but uh, I think it will be a good challenge for you to contemplate. I think that challenge is, I mean, tongue in the cheek directed at Tandy as the poser of the question, but Ursula, I think speaking from our regional perspective, the national member organization, uh, it could be an interesting notion to discuss. I mean, colleagues, part of the reason of this conference also is to buy in, understand future vision, new strategy of EASA, etc. It is quite fundamentally different from the normal uh, focus, although it was very important. There's innovation that the direction of the new strategy is bringing, and it's been an extremely consultative process through the NMOs of 22 plus member organizations, meaning countries, and a variety of other role players. So please, if we might ask for your consideration to keep that also in mind. It is not just about the science of systems analysis, it's very important, but it's also to help us achieve an innovative regional perspective with the overarching direction of EHASA as the Institute. A quick last question. Satisfied for now. Can we please thank our two keynote speakers? We have an interesting panel uh, that will take us to the break. It's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Tandi Mkwebe. 
You've heard her name uh, this morning. She was instrumental with others in the establishment of SASAC at that time at the University of the Western Cape. She's currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Innovation and Engagement, China University of Technology, and also the DVC Research Designate at Nelson Mandela University as from early next year. Sandy, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the speakers in the first panel. And now we're moving on to the second part of our discussion. Uh, just as a quick introduction and a recap, I think it's widely recognized and it's been said here that the issues we face in the 21st century are complex and essentially connected and dynamic and they change and therefore we also need to be adaptive. We have learned from experience that we cannot manage such connected, complex, connected system, systemic issues through short-term sectoral interventions. We need an integrated approach uh, if we are to achieve uh, society, societal benefit. And my name is Tandi Mgwebi, as previously uh, introduced. And we've got a time slot of about an hour and 15 minutes. And I've got four panelists, if I may ask my panelists to come to the, to the front so that we don't waste time waiting for people moving uh, while we preparing for the next panelist. And while they're doing that, I would like to introduce them quickly. I've got Esther Bure, a research scholar from IASA. I've got uh, Hala Elkedi, Supervisor for the Specialized Scientific Councils in AST uh, from Egypt. I've got Bungani Ngobe, the researcher from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and Con Colleen Fuchel, Distinguished Professor, School of Animal and uh, Plant and Environmental Sciences from the University of the Witwatersrand. And within the hour, I'm going to give each speaker 15 minutes maximum, and then it's 10 to 15 minutes. 10 minutes would be good because this will allow us to have time for discussion. Sorry. And then we have the, the last 15 or 20 minutes uh, for a discussion. And the panel today is looking at regional applications, application of systems analysis and they will present their practical applications of systems analysis in addressing regional and international challenges. And I'm going to start, whoever wants to start first, you don't have to, go to, to start by the first one in the, on the list. May I start with you? <laughs> Do you have the... Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Okay, thanks a lot for the <coughs> thanks, sorry. thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, in my very short, uh, brief introduction, I would like to focus on practical land-based um, ex uh, examples of system analysis in uh, in Africa. And uh, within this, I would like to focus a little bit uh, within the land-based uh, theme or discipline. Um, so for me, when you're talking about system analysis, I would think that there are three key aspects to take into account. Um, and we have to be kind of uh, taking a holistic measure in these three aspects. I think two of them have been already quite extensively highlighted. Uh, the first one is that uh, we need to consider multiple objectives. Um, for example, if we're talking about agricultural producers, it would be uh, policies that are targeted at um, poverty, reducing inequality and reducing hunger. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, goals and targets developed, most notably those of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs that we touched upon already, and these might sometimes be in conflict with those aims. The second one that we already mentioned as well is the, the models and the methods. Um, <coughs> 
And those models and methods should provide a more integrated analysis um, so that they are being a that, so that they are able to consider both the multiple objectives as well as uh, sometimes conflicting objectives. One thing we can think about here is, for example, uh, environmental protect, uh, protection versus resource-based based growth. Um, the third one um, that I think is nice to stress as well uh, are, is related to the data sources. Um, so I think it's good that in our approach we combine uh, uh, various skills of data um, from the local, very local context specific data sources to more generalizable data sources such as agricultural census data or uh, land cover data uh, and household survey data. However, also stakeholder approaches and taking expert opinions into account. I would like to show two examples of um, kind of land based um, models that, uh, that have been used for this. Um, <laughs> and that I think consider these approaches. Uh, the, both of them use uh, a land use model called uh, Globayan that Robert quickly mentioned. Um, this is a, a model that considers uh, basically the most important land use sectors, agriculture, forestry and fisheries um, at a bottom up level and can be a in, used in detailed countries. The first example focuses on the Congo Basin, um, where um, the representation in the Congo Basin for consumers and producers has been improved uh, in order to take stock of what really drives deforestation in the country. Uh, in the slide here, you will see deforestation that is due to cropland versus due to deforestation that is due to pasture. Now, when we, were, when we are targeting pol uh, policies to help um, to look at different aims, so as, such as, for example, uh, economic growth versus environmental protection, um, we would compare different uh, policies that could be related to, for example, again, the sustainable development goals that you see below. If we would focus just on a business as usual approach, there is a certain amount of uh, deforestation. However, other important policies to, into, to take into account are, for example, an increased fuel wood demand, uh, increased consumption, uh, new infrastructure um, development to connect remote regions, and increased land uh, productivity. Now, most of these actually uh, lead to a higher amount of deforestation when they are tackled alone. Um, for example, if we look at the uh, infrastructure development, this makes uh, remote areas, which are high in carbon value and biodiversity, more, ex uh, more <laughs> easily um, to be deforested and therefore um, more vulnerable for um, the environment. The second example that I wanted to highlight is <laughs> Um, <laughs> focuses on countrywide typologies within Ethiopia. Here we looked, uh, we combined different sources of data, such as household uh, data, land cover data, and agricultural census data, to come up with a, a methodology where that, where, which focus, is able to target policies that are uh, farm system specific as well as spatially explicit and can be generalized to the entire country. So you would get uh, a picture where you could really zoom into uh, the local level as well as zoom out to see if the, the macroeconomic policies as well as the microeconomic policies could be met. Uh, subsequently, uh, different policies were introduced um, with the aim to look at the evolution of food security and livelihoods in Ethiopia um, that are uh, farm system specific as well as generalizable. And um, you could see here a few uh, which focus specifically on irrigation and on uh, sustainable development via climate smart agriculture. Um, and it is concluded also here that when we specify, uh, specifically look at one indicator and one type of policy, um, there are negative effects on, for example, environment or on the livelihoods of farmers. So this would stress the importance of, making, of looking at tailor-made policies that 
act at both the local and the global scale, as well as through this variety of uh, measures. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take it out? Yeah. Thank you all for the great start. Uh, I'll uh, talk today about the system analysis in Egypt tomorrow. I'll, uh, actually, I'm a civil engineer, so I'm looking from a, a really different perspective uh, to agriculture and all the, uh, the uh, raised items up till now. Uh, globally, the construction product products are responsible for about 20 to 35 percent of the impacts on the uh, global environment. We are uh, responsible of a uh, huge part of the global warming, the toxicity, reduction in ozone layer. The construction sector also is responsible for consuming a um, um, significant percent of the our non-renewable resources, around 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so actually, uh, construction industry is actually engaged either directly or indirectly to a significant number of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We are directly related to goal number 11, addressing the sustainable cities and the, the communities. Besides health, energy, climate changes, and all the other uh, SDGs. Applying the system analysis in this industry shall not only be directly to the optimization of the structural systems as we used to do, but we need to integrate the system to have a foreseen view for the future. Uh, on, the, on the local scale, actually, we have in Egypt some concerns. We have uh, our aging civil inf infrastructure and its environmental impact. We have an, uh, over 1,300 years old city with all its infrastructure, with known and unknown cumulative documentation for the maintenance programs over the last years. We are fully aware that the long life systems uh, will have functional upgrades in system element replacement through their lives. Um, for example, the tunnels, they have a design lifetime of about 100 years, but the ventilation systems in these tunnels uh, will be frequently upgraded. We have a running technology now, and we have a improved safety legislations every now and then. Uh, to be in compliance with the environmental regulations. So uh, we need to have an interconnected system for the infrastructure systems that will adopt the evaluation, the analysis, design, and maintenance plan, clear maintenance plan, using the existing data for different networks. We need an updated alongside, uh, database along with the implementation of this action plan. Um, actually, Egypt's carbon footprint is still increasing by, by about 1% every year. We are around over 100 million capita with 200 plus million metric tons per year uh, of carbon emissions, which is not actually on the individual level that much. We produce about two tons per capita, well, not that bad, but we have huge population concentrated in such a tiny area around the River Nile. 
um, and we still have to look at, at Egypt's future. We have a lot going around in Egypt now. We have projects of over $335 billion going on. We have uh, uh, finished a new roads network covering over 3,000 kilometers constructed in the last three years. We have six tunnels under Suez canals, two of them for the railway and other for the vehicles with the investments over 6 billion euros. Actually, we have um, a huge capital under construction with an iconic tower reaching almost 400 meters high with investments exceeding now $8 billion. This capital has to be Okay. The capital has to be smart not to go back again in the dilemma of the environmental issues. So uh, during constru construction stage, we need to avoid the environmental damage, either noise, air, water pollution, consuming our non-renewable sources, and reaching a smart city, which is well-connected, integrated systems in transportation, utilities, renewable energy reliance. We have a lot of common techniques used in system engineering, especially in civil engineering. We work with linear optimization, linear programming, transportation and assignment problems, networking analysis, simulation techniques, decision analysis, nonlinear optimization, the critical path method, and all these well-known uh, systems. But to make all this effective, we need to have a project system model which focus basically in the planning stage on our problem definition, the model formulation, decision-making system. This includes optimization in which all the structural engineers, I'm one of them, strongly believe in. And we need to estimate and predict for the future. Uh, we need environmental systems, analysis tools for decision-making. Actually, which, uh, which tool to use? in a specific decision-making situation. It depends on the de decision context. We need dynamic risk system, uh, risk analysis systems. We have a lot of uh, um, risk factors in civil engineering. While you are working especially on mega projects, we face inflation. Sometimes we face unexpected monetary regulations. And actually, we faced that in 2017. Uh, our currency lost half its power all of a sudden. We sometimes, under the pressure of squeezing the project duration, we get change orders every now and then from the owners, and uh, all of us suffer from that. Inefficiency of the owner supervisors, we have sometimes machinery breakdown, and of course the deficiency or the deficit in the financial resources is one of the problems that we always get stuck in in the midst of the projects. Um, so we need to have the system tools, the system analysis tools for both construction and demolition and waste management. Um, finally, um, just to, to get um, where are we going uh, in Egypt and uh, the system analysis aspect. Actually, in ASSERT, um, in the um, uh, Academy of Scientific Research and Technology, I'm supervising the specialized councils. Uh, we work on, we work at, actually at the think tank for the decision makers in the government. So we are currently working on a comprehensive roadmap for science policy makers, along with the executive ministers, to implement all the valuable SNA research on the ground. We have great engineers in Egypt, professors, researchers, output, uh, citations, impact factors, patents, and all that stuff. But it's not actually implemented on ground. We are trying to update Egypt's environment protection legislations. Now we are working on building our, on our building codes to work green and eco-friendly construction systems and procedures. We work on improving practices uh, by encouraging the contractors, especially the contracting firms working on such mega projects, uh, to be licensed either the, uh, under the eyes of 14,000 family especially 14,001, 14, which is the world's most recognized framework of the environmental management system. Uh, and hopefully, we will reach the full implementation uh, within the view of the 2030 vision. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hela. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, are you ready with your presentation? I'm going to ask uh, Bongani Mube from CPUT. You want to connect on your own? Okay. Uh,
I just realized there's enough time, that's why I decided to go to my slides. <laughs> um, we were asked just to, to give an example of practical applications of system analysis in the region. Um, according to FAO, smallholder farmers produce 90%, 80% of, uh, of food in Africa. So my, my choice actually is uh, on the smallholder farming systems in, in Africa. That is uh, uh, the, the, the area that I decided to look at. So by 2050, we are going to reach uh, 9 billion people. And uh, of course, the demand for food will also increase. And therefore, the pressure on the smallholder farming systems is going to increase. In sub-Saharan Africa, our smallholder farmers face quite a lot of uh, uh, issues, uh, especially around food shortages, low crop yields being um, the main uh, problem. And uh, traditionally, we have focused on uh, increasing yields, um, looking at fertilizer rates, looking at managing uh, 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 the land, plowing, and things like that. Um, so that is what we have focused on in the years. But um, there are other issues, such as uh, poverty, which then affects uh, mechanization, which affects uh, labor costs, uh, if you are poor, you cannot be uh, managed to, 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 to hire labor for your field. And of course, the purchasing power of inputs. So that is in addition to soil fertility decline, which is a big problem in the smallholder farming sector in Africa. And of course, um, in recent years, the biggest challenge that uh, Africa is, faced, is facing, especially Southern Africa, is the uh, extreme weather uh, patterns. We've got uh, a crippling drought in Zimbabwe at the moment, but it is the same in Zimbabwe together with Mozambique and Malawi, which were affected by serious floods recently. So we've got those extremes. And that, of course, added to that is uh, access to markets. Um, if farmers produce, where are they going to sell uh, the excess that uh, they want to sell? And a lot of our farmers face that. If you come to South Africa, in addition to, 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 to all the, um, the natural uh, 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 issues and poverty, there is also the issue of access to water. Therefore, uh, it means that sustainability in the future cannot be in, uh, in, uh, in, in water-based uh, agriculture, but we have to, to make sure that the rain-fed farming systems, uh, they, they, they continue to, 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 to produce and they, they, they produce better in the future. Um, there's been quite a number of, um, of approaches that have been used uh, in Africa, Southern Africa. Uh, we've got the challenge program that ran from 2004 to 2013. And of course, the focus one was on water management strategies, catchment management uh, to reduce uh, uh, food deficit, of course, improve livelihoods. And of course, there were institutional models and capacity building. And the focus was on all of farmers, extension, water managers, managers, and we've had also some networks. The soil fed net has been running for for quite some decades. I think it still exists. And then we've, we've had uh, projects like the smallholder uh, systems innovations, which was uh, run by the UNESCO IHE uh, in the Netherlands, which also looked at environmental, social, institutional conditions. Uh, to enable uh, sustainable upgrading of rain, rain fed agricultural systems. And uh, of course, that one ended. And then, of course, we've uh, recently have, have a lot of, uh, of saying about climate smart agriculture. We've heard about ACDI in, uh, at the University of Cape Town, and of course, the World Wide Fund for Nature. They are also into that, and they are also focusing on smallholder farming systems. And of course, Conservation agriculture, which uh, some people have questions on, I, uh, my my uh, my PhD supervisor wrote a paper about uh, being heretic on on conservation agriculture with a lot of questions on that. 
But despite all that, conservation agriculture is seen as one of the, uh, uh, the ways that will um, help farmers. And then, of course, uh, of late, we talk about sustainable intensification. So what I'm going to give you now are just uh, two examples, but mainly one on how conservation agriculture in combination with sustainable intensification has, is seeing some uh, positive uh, um, developments in, uh, in, in the Africa region. The first project is the Africa Research Sustainable Intensification for the Next Generation, which is called Africa Rising, which is led by uh, the International uh, Institute of uh, Tropical Agriculture, IITA, and of course, uh, the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI. Uh, it's all about innovative farming technologies for sustainable intensification, and the geographic focus is Mali, Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Malawi, and Zambia. And of course, they are now in their second phase, which is focused on upscaling whatever they found in the first stages of the project. And the second example is um, the sustainable intensification on maize legume systems for food security in Eastern and Southern Africa, which, Simlesa in short, which has been running since 2010 and is going all the way to 2023. The project is funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research and also it's led by the International Maize Research Institute, which is uh, CIMIT. And of course, there is a number of national agricultural research institutes, a number of organized, local organizations in the target countries that are participating in this project. The project aims to improve maize and legume productivity by 30% and reduce the yield risk uh, by 30% in 650,000 farm households. Not this is households, not individuals. So the population that is affected by this is much higher. And of course, the project covers quite a number of countries, Australia, Botswana, up all the way, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, South Sudan even. Um, what are some of the, uh, uh, the approaches of this project? Uh, of course, they are looking at uh, conservation agriculture as a, uh, as a way which is really looking at disturbing soil as little as possible, keeping the soil covered and, res and, and uh, by residues as much as possible, and of course, intercropping and rotating as, uh, as the third principle. And uh, of course, the main uh, uh, area of the conservation agriculture based sustainable intensification project is focus in look it's a big area covering all those other countries but there's also uh, another the the focus countries of some of the projects for example Ethiopia Malawi Mozambique Rwanda Tanzania Uganda the focus here in addition to agronomy this is where the systems approach comes in in addition to agronomic practices looking at seed uh, looking at fertilizer looking at all the, these other things the focus is also on institutions the institutions that work with farmers the focus is also on policies in those countries where the project is taking place and of course there is markets uh, markets for uh, inputs and also markets for the produce and of course there's incentives involved um the big thing that the, the project is engaging with is on the agricultural innovation platforms where there is farmer training there is organization of farmers into collective action and of course the value chain integration and the most interesting thing is that the project uses um quite a number of models, but the main ones being the APSIM uh, model, the Agricultural Production Simulator, and it is being applied in multi-environments in those countries. So there is comparison, and of course there is integrated analysis tool, which also looks at livestock, and then the APS farm, which is also looking at livestock. What are some of the, uh, the results so far? Uh, the project has seen increased crop yields uh, in, uh, in the countries uh, where it is taking place. And of course, there's uh, increased in organic matter. The infiltration rate uh, has increased, of course, because of the, uh, the, the improvement in soil structure. And of course, soil health is improving, soil biodiversity. And then far, farmer awareness and adoption is going up in, uh, in almost all these countries. Why? Because they are using the appropriate uh, 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 institutions to work with the farmers and of course there is improved agricultural extension services in those countries and of course the big thing that affects farmers the labor there is it's going down 
as far as as much as 41 percent and of course access to markets uh, from uh, smallholder farmers is also being realized in those countries in short this is what I have to say about the smallholder farming systems in, uh, as an example uh, where uh, uh, systems analysis is working in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Colleen from University of the Witt, but that's wrong. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for giving me a chance to give you my humble reflections. I think systems analysis can sometimes be how long is a piece of string, <laughs> and it's hard to decide where it starts and where it ends. So what I'd like to share with you are a couple of things which have already come up about the missing, I think, and the elephant in the room, which is where are the social scientists? Where are the people who should be helping us to really understand some of these issues? And I'm going to talk to some of those. So we're in a region at the moment suffering hugely from drought. Our own country has just given a huge amount of money to try and help with that drought. So what do we do? And I'm not decrying that we don't need models. We do need models. And we've seen EASA is producing some of the best integrated systems models um, that we can have on the food, energy, and water nexus. But what I would like to argue is that I think we really need to start shifting, and there are people who are really doing that, starting a different conversation, an additional conversation, and that is with the social sciences, particularly those who are working with social learning. And I'm going to give you a couple of those people. They're out there. They're doing fantastic work. And instead of doing modeling only, they are starting to work with landscapes of practice. They actually reflect deeply on their practice, on their praxis, and what they do. I get a little bit nervous in the room when we hold up the SDGs, and I agree with you, Albert, that we can't do them separately, but we need to be careful about how those targets are framed, who frames them. Very often those instruments that we use can be blunt. They fail to get implemented. I have experience and gray hair to prove some of that. They're difficult to mold, and they're not context sensitive. And why is that? And I'd like to just put on the table a couple of tensions that I think we're not dealing with. And we need to start having this conversation. Otherwise, I think we're going to come to the end of the systems analysis set of work and say, oh my gosh, what did we miss? Some of the tensions, I think, link, and these have been brought up by these social scientists who I work with. The one is governance, how we steer this debate. Do we do it tightly and try and force it, or do we actually really allow it to adjust? The complexity and the controversy, are there spaces where we can have those tough questions about uncertainty? The emergence of the problem, often we go in with the problem already predefined and then we try and retrofit it backwards and then trying to start out with situations of concern. In my experience as a climate scientist, I've often gone into cities and tried to scare them with models of what's going to happen rather than starting out where are the situations of their concern. Is it service delivery and then connecting backwards into the science? So I think some of these issues might sound like common sense, but honestly, Honestly, we've been talking about these for 30 years, and we still seem to be coming at it from the other end. And then mirroring back, mirroring back to communities and to the people that you're working with. So I want to just pause before I give you a couple of examples. How is change being affected, and from whose perspective? I really think we need to have hard discussions about that. So the first example I want to give you is a project that was done in Stellenbosch University, working in Enkanini, a settlement in Stellenbosch, where people broke through onto land that wasn't theirs, they started to settle, and they started to need electricity and energy. And what John von Breda and others in this community did was actually start to do transdisciplinary experiments. So they started to do small experiments, not large model uh, experiments, and started to work with the communities in this social way. And they worked with emerging stakeholder alliances and trying to work in interim ways rather than imposing from the top. So that's the one example, a softer approach rather than hardcore steering. The other two mega projects that have happened in this region are with climate decision makers, namely Mfula and the fractal experience. And here it was a very interesting way of working. Rather than only doing decision making with models that were fed into the system, embedded researchers were actually embedded into 
the municipalities and a co-design really happened rather than having models being presented to people and almost force-fitting, if you like, um, the outcome. So those were two others. But the one that I'd like to end off with and then give you a couple of examples of what we're currently doing here at the NRF and with the um, DSI is the SDG Transformation Forum led by a gentleman called Steve Waddell. I'm part of that forum and what they're trying to promote internationally, they've just met in Chile, is to really look at deep systems change. What is it going to take? At WITS we've also got a climate justice charter that just recently met. If we're serious about the stuff, we've got to, if we've got to come off coal, how are we going to do that in the time that we've got left? And, and are we really taking these issues seriously? So what the uh, SDG Transformations Forum is trying to sponsor is to look at, and I can give you the website if you'd like afterwards, innovation in transformations, narratives, capacity, systems work, financial systems, looking at transition towns, really trying to think differently um, into these areas and especially about challenging some of the entrenched structures, attitudes and practices. But now I ask those of you who are sitting in the room who are from universities, how on earth do we get this <laughs> approach into the university? And we really have to take this seriously because if we are going to do the transdisciplinarity, your ethics process is not up to scratch because you can't come in and say I'm going to go and work with communities in a soft way, in an emergent way, in a all the resilient speak way because the university is not designed to do it like that. Um, Co-writing with colleagues from cities, are they, is that credible or not? What does that mean? The time taken to do this kind of work is immense. It's taken me three years with the city of Johannesburg to work slowly and immersively in these kind of processes. So we need to be having, I think, some hardcore uh, chats about this and particularly, I think, trying to rethink some of the things that we're doing. And I would hope that um, we're going to try and do that here at the NRF and the DSI. I've been tasked because I chair the Global Change Committee of the DSI and the NRF to come up with a social science agenda, which we've co-produced and workshopped with a number of colleagues. And I'll just give you a flavor of the themes, which are still under debate, but they are going to be going out for ring-fenced calls. And perhaps there can be some ER engagement I think would be quite interesting. So the first one is global change, the global change system. I'll just read them quickly to you. Social and sustainability transformations and we've got a number of bullets under that. Then transformations in development, economics, technologies and practices for advancing socially just global change contexts. The third one, which I think is a very important one, global change and transformative social learning. There's a lot that we can be learning from this community, multiple, multiple um, dimensional meanings and values. The fourth one, global change, transformative social movements and social change. Are we even investigating these social movements? Are we looking at pathways that the youth could take out of all this energy into future job creation? Or are we just marveling at this change? And then finally, transforming institutions for responding to global change. Are our current institutions designed for the change that we want to see? So those are just some reflections and I don't have the answers. I don't have all the cut in the box neat answers, but I don't think we're having the deeper conversations, um, if I may say, amongst not all of us, but I think we could be furthering that and I look forward to having some of those deep conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, a warm round of applause again for all four of our speakers. Now I'm going to open the floor up for a discussion, questions, comments, and uh, views and opinions. Uh, you can decide who you want to direct your question to if it's a question. I've got a couple, but I won't take the advantage now. I'm going to give it to you to, um, to ask. Any takers? Um, that's one. I'm going to take three at a time. There's one, and then Albert, and the last one. To say briefly who you are, and then ask the question. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Kidani from Global Water Partnerships, Southern Africa region. Um, I just want to t um, t try to understand um, the whole purpose of the systems analysis because I, I, I'm getting a kind of mixed kind of message from the previous two presentations, uh, which gave me like a system analysis more trying to see um, the scenarios in the future, trying more integrated approaches, holistic approach, going beyond your specific area of intervention. Uh, but the kind of experience um, from the case studies now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing them more talking about using your analysis to improve your productivity, for example, like uh, rather than, we also mentioned very interesting case like um, how can we learn from ecosystems because they're more, more resilient systems, sustainability issues. So are you talking about increasing, for example, productivity of smallholder farmers um, or, or small farmers in, in Ethiopia or uh, sub-Saharan Africa? Or are you talking in terms of future sustainability and resilience of the bigger system? Um, when we talk about the bigger system of sustainability, we have to consider our analysis beyond the agriculture sector. So I just want to understand what does that system mean? Thank you. Um, thank you, Colleen, for reminding us about the value of soft systems approaches. I think uh, we just just to, to, to update you, I think many of the models that you see coming out of Yasa these days is driven by a bottoms up soft systems analysis approach in terms of the Zambezi Basin work, the Indus Valley work and so on. I think we've come to realize that you you can't just impose models on you. You have to have a conversation and co-design, co-produce, and co-implement with societies. I think that's definitely the route to go. So I'd encourage you to continue pursuing that in, in, the, in the approaches as well. Thank you. One comment, maybe we share uh, the, main, the same problem in agriculture for marketing and technical problems, deficiency in fertilizers and all the issues uh, you raised. Actually, I believe that we need parenting for the small farmers. This will be the clue. And this is how we can use system analysis. You just go on screening first. Uh, the whole sectors, uh, young um, uh, agriculturists will demolish in few years. They cannot cope with the big enterprises and that stuff. So it's better to find some kind of parenting for them to uh, find suitable marketing. You cannot just export two or three tons of tomatoes or whatever, but you can just go on for uh, collecting mass exports through a parenting company, either private or public or governmental. Uh, actually, for the social scientists, uh, we have a cultural problem actually in Egypt for the water management. So before looking actually in system analysis to get more efficient, efficient use of water, we need to go back to the people first. That's where the social scientists have to be there. Um, we are used that we have the River Nile, we have no problems in, in water, we don't think about it. So to change the uh, thoughts of people, this will be the social scientist's role. Actually, it's more important than making a strong systems without changing people's beliefs first. Uh, and the same actually goes for the low value crops. We uh, have some ethnic uh, uh, food in, in Egypt and we stick to low value crops uh, without regarding to improving the, uh, the income of the uh, uh, workers in that field. So uh, I strongly agree with you that we need social science with us in this. Thank you. Maybe if I could just comment, I don't know if I need the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope I, it's coming apart. <laughs> it pops up. It's good to be prepared eh, for the un, 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 uneventful. Um, I think we need to be careful. I, I hope I wasn't translating the message that you know once you've got social sciences in the room, then you know, you kind of get there. <laughs> because I think we need to be careful that in the sciences, we're not trying to promote a deficit knowledge approach. Mm. People out there have knowledge, right? We don't have, and maybe it's better in some cases than what we have. Mm. And so I think the, the, the trick, and we've been talking about this for years in these global change communities, are issues of scalability, how do you set up those practice communities, et cetera, et cetera. But I think with 
technologies now, we can start to do that. And as I've indicated to you, there are some really intelligent people internationally who are not plugged into these networks, but they're starting to think and get big funders, big, big, big funders behind them. Um, and so I, I just kind of wonder, if, is there a chance for us to move the gears a little bit? Um, but I don't know what that looks like, and I don't profess to know how to do that, but I think there's a captured audience here. Maybe we can start to be thinking, and maybe through the Southern African work, linked into now some of the stuff we're trying to generate with the NRF and DSI, um, you know, maybe things can spin out of that. Um, I think in, in, in simple terms, now, you need to understand that a system begins with uh, smaller uh, uh, particles. Uh, when we talk about farmers, we, we talk about smallholder farmers as, uh, as individuals, but smallholder farmers make up that food production uh, system of a country. And uh, in the past, we used to approach them with technologies, uh, demonstration plots. If you put uh, two bags of fertilizer, you'll get higher yield than everything. But uh, the farmer does not necessarily understand what we're talking about. We forgot about his ability to buy the two bags of fertilizer after we have left. We forgot about uh, the ability of the local shop to supply that fertilizer after we've left. So when we talk about systems, now we are trying to, 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 to sort of to look at the value chain of every uh, uh, body who is involved in that food production system. But also, you can't run away from all the other factors like the environment. What does the environment provide for those farmers? Are they able to survive? And is everyone a farmer? So we need to ask ourselves a lot of questions when we are looking at the farming system itself which is why we now talk about their livelihoods. Are farmers able to, 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 to if, we, if we come up with this technology, are farmers able to, to do it? That is why citizen science becomes very important, that farmers give them a choice based on their abilities, based on their capabilities. So at, at, that, at, at, system, at small the farming system level, we are talking about all those uh, issues that make the farmer produce better, that makes him uh, food sustainable, but also the environment around him. Yeah, just to very quickly comment uh, on your um, comment, sorry. Um, I think <clears throat> what we are trying to convey, the message that we are trying to convey is indeed to not just look at the productivity perspective, but to take other um, to take a more inclusive approach while also looking, looking at the environment, at sustainability, at equality, uh, at this, also this local level. But I think what you're actually highlighting and what is very true is that as long as we stay on this a bit more theoretical level from the first two presentations, of course we can be inclusive and take all the SDGs in, into account, but, or, or all the metrics into account. But then when it comes to a practical example of a case study, uh, we run into issues such as financial resources, time, um, or uh, the context-specific knowledge um, that enable us to still look to a certain point at being inclusive, but not to the full extent that was highlighted maybe in the first more, part of the morning. So you're running out of time. I'm going to ask, I'm going to take just, I'll, I'll give you now, I'm going to just take one more question. I see Mary, your hand is up. Uh, if I may, okay, there's five, so now I'm going to have to choose three. Um, Mary, Priscilla, and then Professor Sanupul, and that will be the end of the, the questions. And then I'm going to ask you to respond, and while you're doing the response, you know that will be your final closing comment as well. <laughs> Mary. Thank you. I just want to bring your attention to two of the posters outside that relate directly to what we've just heard this morning. One is on an approach to try and bring together soft coupling of data from biophysical systems and social systems and the identification of essential variables. So it is one approach to implement what Colleen was talking about. And the other project out there specifically, which links to the smallholder agriculture, the posters there, is a question that's been asked, well, what will farming systems in the SADC region look like in 2050? 
and it's the coupling of commercialized farmers with smallholder farmers because we cannot keep those two farming systems separate into the future. Thanks. My question is directed at Colleen. I'm very interested in transforming institutions to respond to global change because currently in the South African system, students specialize very early. So you pick a physics, chemistry, and then you pick your research area. And I'm wondering how institutions are changing that approach and, and perhaps responding to uh, lifelong learning so that those who wish to go back and sort of expand uh, into various areas can do that. Is that something that's been considered as well? Thank you, Dr. Mahwebi. My question or comment actually linked to what Mary was also saying. A lot has been said about the importance of smallholder farming. And obviously, it's critically important on the African continent. But I think we really need to think more and more, at not only of food security, but food systems transformation, which includes integration of smallholder and larger scale commercial agriculture, but trying to address specifically the failures or the food system failures, which is unique to the African continent, which includes affordability, for example, because good food or healthy food is expensive. Many of the smallholders cannot afford it. Efficiency, the high food waste, for example, also inefficiency in terms of use, uh, use of water, um, food safety, reliability of the system, and most importantly, inclusivity. Again, emphasizing that we need to also, in terms of our training of graduates, uh, prepare them as subject, subject matter, matter specialists, but with a very good understanding of the socioeconomic complexities of where they need to go and apply their knowledge. Panel response. Just to add um, to the questions, maybe perhaps when you're responding, you can also pick this up. Uh, am I hearing you correctly, Colleen, when you're saying, when you're making your examples, that perhaps it would be better to start with the challenge and work out the, the, the steps of how to solve those challenges. You made examples of the case studies of Stellenbosch and then others. But also, I, I fully support your, your question of the role of the university. And yesterday, we had another discussion, which was a pre, pre, prior to this workshop, talking about the role of the, perhaps we need to the rethink the role of the university and how the universities are structured if we are serious about societal benefit. But uh, to you, um, uh, Esther, about poverty and inequality, just a comment perhaps on what measures were we using to, to look at poverty. You mentioned poverty and inequality as one of your, your three, three questions or three pillars. Uh, were, you also, were you just looking at income or were you use, using other indicators to look at, at uh, poverty? You mentioned food, but I was just interested in poverty and inequality. Then I'm going to give each one of you to respond to the com questions or comments and also wrap up as we about to break for coffee. I'll start with you, Colleen, if you don't mind. I'm not saying that we need to have one size fits all. This is not for everybody, I don't think. So we still need some of the basic disciplines. And I would um, defer the question to my colleague, Mary Scholes, who's been working extensively in the SASAC program and who has lots of experience and can give us a lot of guidance. And I'm hoping that um, she'll be able to talk either now or later on. Um, in terms of, um, I think what we're missing is that we, we talk in a kind of trendy way about these things. And I don't think we have some of the robust science underneath to make the case. And perhaps that's why we don't get traction in the university. Because, you know, our research heads have all got their KPIs and it's publish or perish, right? But we have got examples. Um, Sheikh and Bao sitting at the back of the room and I have been involved with the LERA initiative, which is a learning integrated research program where we've tried through the ISC, working with Haida Huckman and others to clip and couple together practitioners and scientists. And those cases are coming through now. We need to have a look at those and then I think have a serious conversation. 
what does that mean? Rather than, I think, sitting in a closed room in a Senate committee trying to abstractly do this. And I think, so when you say, must we start with the problem and then go backwards, I think problems vary. So it's not, you can't just put your head in the sand and, and follow. And I think that's where we, we're not being reflexive ourselves, I think, in our work. And honestly, I spend sleepless nights thinking about this because, you know, when you've worked for 30 years trying to work on this, push this transdisciplinarity and other things, and you just get so little traction, so little traction. Um, and I, I don't know how we get that, but maybe with Future Africa, Pretoria University, others who are now coming together as a collective, I don't think it's one person who can do it. We need to start to move in sync, but I'll leave some of the tougher questions around university course offerings to people who are much better informed than me. Okay. Oh, and I've got the, sorry, <laughs> if I could quickly just give you the website for, sorry, um, <clears throat> it's www.transformationsforum.net, www.transformationsforum.net. Net. And the gentleman running that is a guy called Steve Waddell, W-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Careful with that. Okay. okay. Yeah, actually, I don't have much to add except that we should uh, implement the system analysis and the uh, assessment of the environmental impact of our methods of construction. Actually, we are going around crazy building skyscrapers. Uh, factories and uh, all that kind of massive construction, we have to keep an eye on our welfare, our life quality, beside our mega project and being proud of um, experts, engineers and doing outstanding projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that there is um, a, a, a poster on now. Uh, on how uh, smallholder farmers can transition from being smallholder to, to commercial. One uh, big question that I always ask myself is how, is how are we going to do that? Because uh, in South Africa, for example, the issues of land and water access come in. And uh, what models are we going to use to make sure that happens? The National Water Resource Strategy is supposed to grant access to smallholder farmers to water, but how is that going to happen? There's, uh, at policy level, there are changes that happen all the time, but at the end of the day, we look down the line 10 years later, nothing has happened for the smallholder farmer. So I, I, I like it that uh, there's also thinking along those lines that uh, we need to see how smallholder farmers can transition to commercial farmers because we need to understand that there are smallholder farmers who will stay smallholder farmers, but there are smallholder farmers who have potential to become commercial farmers, and how do we make that possible? Thank you. I'll be quick. <laughs> Just for your specific question, I think also when you're talking about poverty, inequality and food security, it's still important to be inclusive. So poverty would not just mean income, but it would also mean kind of the resilience of your income. So uh, the off-farm work versus your the supplies to the market. Um, if in terms of inequality, this means also access to markets, and especially in uh, transformation economies, it's very important to to also include the share of the population that migrates away from rural areas towards cities. Um, and lastly, for uh, food security, I think it would be important to not just count calories, but also look at nutritional values. Thanks. Well Colleagues, thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, we can continue the discussion during the tea break. And uh, now we're going to break the tea and Dr. Aldous Rubel will uh, sh tell us what's happening next. Thank you. <laughs>
Jake Kimbo. Uh, he's the director of Future Africa at the University of Victoria. And Jake, we particularly pleased that you are able to participate in this program. Thank you. We will break for uh, now, uh, and if we can rejoin at 12, I'd like to uh, kindly request you to see to it that your presentation is loaded before your session on the computer, and specifically on the computer that is linked uh, in front, so to avoid switching computers all the time. The posters are available outside, and uh, we remind you also of the interesting posted list session in the afternoon, where six of the shortlisted posters will make short oral presentations of the content of the talk. Final request, uh, we have a total opportunity of the group that has been set up outside, and this will be on the main stairs in front of the entrance of the building. We can also kindly request that all of us go there immediately and quickly, and uh, we can then, of course, relax as well for the break. But thank you indeed for the excellent Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Priscilla Mensa, and I'm Director for Human and Infrastructure Capacity at the NRF. This morning, um, Ganson shared with us uh, an African proverb about going further together. And I must say, one of my favorite um, West African expressions is, how far? That's a complete sentence. It can mean, how are you? So if you say to a friend, how far? You say, I day, which means I'm well. And uh, it can also mean, how far are you from a rendezvous location? And if you have given an assignment and you ask how far, you want to know what is the progress with that assignment. So in the context of um, systems analysis and capacity development, this morning we've learned the power of systems analysis. We've seen how that power has been harnessed in the South African, uh, in the Southern African context to find nexus solutions to common challenges. So um, it's very important that we continue to reflect on the value of systems thinking in order to create an implementation environment for various policies. The SDGs have been mentioned, the Paris Accord, the African Union's Agenda 2030, and locally, the National Development Plan and the White Paper on Science, Technology, and Innovation. So the question that I'd like to ask is, how does South Africa and the region create a critical mass of future systems analysts to advance our development agenda? Fortunately, I asked the questions, and the wonderful audience in my esteemed panel will help to answer that question. So each panel member has um, has played a critical role in systems analysis capacity development initiatives. So we've asked them to reflect on the role that they've played. Some of them um, are beneficiaries of these interventions, and they give us that perspective as well. And at the end of the day, we want to know how far have we come, and how much further do we need uh, to go. Now, my OCD wants us to go in chronological order because First, we had the Southern African Young Scientist Summer Program, then we had SASAC, but it really doesn't matter. We can start at any point. So I wonder, Andoni, whether I can hand over to you. Um, and you can tell us, um, as, a, as a SASAC uh, student, what the program has meant to you. OK. Um, hello, everybody. I was instructed to sit, so should be fine. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. It's such a great honor and a pleasure to be speaking to you about such an amazing program that has really changed the way in which I think as a PhD student, soon to be doctor, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, so I have three main points that I was asked to kind of inform you guys on, on my own experience as um, a SASAC student. Um, so I joined the program in 2016 with an amazing cohort of young people. And the main thing that the program has contributed for me is, the first thing is that 
because systems thinking is such a new idea in terms of our African mindsets in, an, in our continent, more especially in the academic sector, having a cohort of these amazing young thinkers made me focus and force myself to think of what does it mean for my research topic when I say I'm a systems thinker. And not only that, when I was doing my own research academically and also just structuring my chapters, I started to think of it as a more holistic perspective. And most importantly, not only did I look into finding solutions from, say, your scientists or your um, climate change experts, but then I actually got to speak to accountants and people that are in a financial model, in a business model, and people that are social scientists. This didn't just come from the fact that I knew that I needed to do this, but it came from the fact that in the systems thinking and in the, in the way that we were taught in this training, we were taught to really, really think outside the box. And then most importantly, what does it then mean when you are done? What impact will you have when you're done? So it really had a major influence in how that in the way that we think and also how we see ourselves then as policymakers and leaders that are coming up. So if we now are the next cohort to graduate and influence these positions, we are now have this kind of seed in our heads that says, um, how do you look at a, prob a problem? in a trans or an interdisciplinary manner and not just from your field of expectations. So my highlight really was it did not only teach me an analytical tools or, or, or whatever um, networking skills, but it also taught me how to communicate myself, not just with my science colleagues, but also with my academic colleagues, my business colleagues, and most importantly, my supervisor. So it actually helped me to understand the dynamics of actually in everything that we are doing, it's a system, it's not just your academic journey, but it's also your PhD journey and it's also your personal journey that contributes into you understanding the different dynamics of, of that you are in a system. And I think that was great. And a side note, we got to meet the minister at the time, who was Naledi Pando, and we took amazing pictures with her. And that was... The, the best part of the whole exposure. And most importantly, we got to spend time um, at the African Doctoral Academy. And here, yeah, the, the, the great part of it is that we got to actually interact with other African people that were from other thinkers, other disciplines, and you don't just get that opportunity and you also just undermine the importance of that opportunity. So where do I think that we can actually improve in the program? Um, I think that the program offered us a various amount of skills. Um, I wasn't aware at the time that I was doing my PhD that by the time I do my second year, I'll need some skills in Python. So maybe what we can actually do is to give more flexibility into what kind of skills would the student need, as so, uh, most importantly, as they get into the anal analysis stage. So there are certain skills that we got to learn that I, I really loved, such as R, um, but I really wish I got to learn, I had a choice to say, okay, maybe I need some GIS skills or um, some Python skills or some remote sensing skills. I feel like there needs to be more flexibility in that, in that sector and what we select. And then the last part that I think can be improved is, so after that, how do we continue to unify and to, um, what's the word, glue together all of us as systems thinkers? So the alumni program, how do we actually continue to be kind of advocates for this and also to also encourage other people to do it in a more professional um, space. Thank you. Thanks, Shea. Uh, Am I allowed to stand? Good afternoon. And welcome again back to the, to the NRF for the station. I was, as Priscilla was speaking of how far, I immediately uh, zoned into myself and I forgot about my speech. If you speak of systems analysis and how it has trained me to where I am today, I'm a product of YASA's YSSP way back in 2007 when I participated in that program. And the networks that it created, the opportunities that it created, how it brought it up the way I thought around systems analysis, not just from this research perspective, but from the institutional perspective, from the societal perspective, it's, it's been a journey. So it's been quite a long journey. Back to uh, 
how far we've come as South Africa or Africa aligned to systems analysis. As earlier was mentioned, it's, it's, it's been since 2007 since we joined um, YASA as an NMO member. And since 2012, we've actively been involved in a number of engagements. A lot of resources has been uh, put across from the NRF side and the Department of Science and Innovation. If you look at the total investments that has gone in and the products that are coming out uh, over the last 10 years, I think it's been quite a very useful investment, should I say. If you look at the amount of value, you're speaking of more than 4 million US dollars that has gone into the investments. You're speaking of close to uh, more than 120 students that have been trained in systems analysis in different phases. When we started, it was over three months, and the last couple of years, four years or so, it's been through the PhDs that we've we've been finding that at the moment we've got about 60 PhDs, a small amount of them are graduating. But that now brings me to the discussions following up to this morning as well, to the what next, how do we make sure that what if we're training students, we're training them on skills that they can use to build other challenges that we have on societal challenges. If we're doing research, we're making sure the research that we're doing is having an impact on society. That now needs to feed into uh, the discussions that we have and looking back as the NRF as well in terms of the, the investments that we have on systems analysis, what has been the impact of the investments? One of the impacts, of course, on myself here, I can show that, but as we're looking now in terms of the students that are coming out now, are we training them in the right, uh, uh, are we equipping them with the right tools to address these challenges that we're speaking of? And I think I'm happy to say that the majority of the students we are training, they are well equipped, especially during the last uh, uh, phase of SASAC, where we're not just giving funding for the students, but we're training them, working with them within the journey of doing their PhDs. And other soft skills, for instance, you heard of small things, we speak of systems analysis and policy alignment. That's not easy. But through networks, having to meet ministers, having to meet different managers within different ministries in South Africa, that network on, its, on, on itself, it, it helps the students to start think of the research that they are doing, as well as how it contributes directly to the policy issues that are being faced uh, within South Africa and within, within, within the region. So it's, it's quite dynamic on what we've done. And of course, it doesn't mean that everything has been perfect. There's quite a few things that we need to to shape as, as, as we go forward. One of them, of course, we started was aligned to the pipeline approach when you speak of systems analysis. So if you look at the first four years when we started in 20, uh, 2012, the first three years, it was still focused on PhDs, a bit of masters. Similar, the last uh, four years or so, it's been on, almost on PhDs and a small component on honors program. So the pipeline approach is very, very important. You can speak of highly qualified experts uh, the PhDs, postdocs who know systems analysis, if you don't have the pipeline of the owners who are coming up uh, as they go towards masters, uh, PhDs, postdocs, and becoming experts in systems analysis. So the pipeline approach is, is very, very key, and we need to start emphasizing now, and that's the drive that, 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 that we're, uh, we're doing now. The other area is aligned to what we've been doing, of course, the last 10 years, the exposure, the networking, the core investment, the core supervision of students with, with IASA colleagues. That's very, very key. And as part of that, I usually think of like what most of the stuff we're doing under IASA is being mainstreamed with, within the NRF. A good example is the JKP, the Global Knowledge Pat, uh, Program that we are currently uh, designing within the NRF. It will basically make it mandatory for every PhD student, as long as they are good, that's being funded by the NRF and uh, postdocs to spend at least six to 18 months outside South Africa. That's as well spins out to some of the engagements that we've been working with, with, with IASA. So we believe through that exposure, the students, the postdocs will be much more networked, they'll be much more exp exposed, they'll finish their PhDs way in advance, and not just finishing, it's not just about counting numbers, but the quality of the products that we produce at the end of the day will be, will be top class and world class. And other 
areas of course that need to be shaped is also aligned to the policy uh, engagements uh, and the, the practicality of what we train students. It's one thing to train, you sit in a room, and it's one thing to get exposure to meet the people, to spend time at uh, different, uh, if, if it's an industry or it's, it's a department, a ministry. So I think one of the phases that we need to go to, if we speak of policy contribution development, if you're speaking of students or experts in that field, is to spend time at different departments so that they can contextualize issues that are happening within the policy space, and they're part of that network. They know the people within the different departments, whether it's water department, energy. As they're crafting those policies, it's a circle, but of course, a circle can start anywhere. They're also part of those engagements, and we're building a network that's not just theoretically uh, aligned to what we want, but they know the people who are developing policies. They know the issues that are happening within the different spheres. I'll leave some things to my colleagues. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Seppo. Um, can I ask, because Brian's presentation is up already, so uh, Brian, can I ask you to um, give your presentation, and in the interest of time, I'll, I have a stopwatch to count okay. the speakers down. <laughs> All right, thanks. It's a pleasure to be back here in South Africa and see friends as well as new faces. Um, and what we talked about this morning was clearly about like what is systems analysis keeps coming up and you know whether it's tools or whether it's um, you know approaches and methods and models. But one of the things that I think is behind all of it is the systems thinking and 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 just kind of approaching like where do things come from, where do they go, how are they interconnected? Right? I mean that's the basis of systems thinking. Well, you also when their doors opened now almost 50 years ago, as you heard this morning, kind of ran into the same issues of not only what it is, but how do you find people that can do that? And, um, and so we had the second director of the Institute, Roger Levian, had this idea of, um, of starting the YSSP program. And, and it was because they were trying to hire staff that could, that could participate in, in an endeavor like applied systems analysis, and it was hard to find people that could do that. And so um, it really, I think, a, a key part of IASA now for um, 40 years is that to uh, – to bring to, to, the, to the Institute every summer uh, about, well now it's about 50 PhD students for three months and to work with the NASA scientists. And um, what's interesting about this is so they had a, a nice summer program for young scientists, but can you see the slides? Oh, why are they not changing? I see you guys see it. Mine are changing back here. Anybody know what's going on? PowerPoint. Yeah, it was. <coughs> I think that it is. No, I think that there's another presentation already open. Maybe no. Go ahead. Which one is it? It was. Yeah, I must admit this mouse is it very, is very slow. slow. Albert, I second you. <laughs> it's not moving at all. That's the one, right? Okay, we need somebody with IT skills. I'm not managing to get it going. There, it's actually working now. I just can't see it here, but it is working. So, okay. So, well, this is Roger, the second trick of the Institute, who started the YSSP in the first class of, of 1977. And this idea of having a summer program of young scientists made perfect sense until then they realized the acronym would be SPIES. And if you know anything about the Institute, <laughs> back at that time, that was not what they could call the program. So, they just did a little reshuffling, and we ended up with this maybe word salad a bit, but it's the Young Scientist Summer Program. And it's been that uh, ever since then. So, um, so yeah, so there you see that to date there's almost 2,000 alumni, including SEPA, including myself, uh, of this program, and uh, it continues on quite strongly. And, and as I mentioned, some of the highlights of it, that you're working with the uh, YASA scientists for three months, that you have the chance to, um, you know, hopefully publish a paper, have a, you know, material for a publishable paper by the end of that. It's, in, it's interdisciplinary, it's, it's international, and the networking that you form there is, is really key. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that was just kind of just a plug for YSSP. Our deadline is coming up soon, so if any of you are thinking about applying for 2020, um, I think it's January 11th or 12th or something is the deadline this year. And, um, and yeah, please, uh, please look into this. Now, I will also say something, as Priscilla asked me to, is that I've been a, a supervisor, co-supervisor for the SEO program. In fact, I've co-supervised five um, PhD students in that program. 
the key is to have a really good partner here. So I'm working with Ursula Charler, who knows more about networks than I do, and so it's been a great collaboration to, uh, to be able to, to come down and work with her and to, to solidify our, our collaboration, which we had already had established. And so, so try, to, try, you know, try to network. I mean, that's what IASA does well, network, make connections, make collaborations, and having a student as a focal point of that is also a, a nice way to do that. Um, with SASEC, I'm co-supervising two of the SASEC students, and they're kind of finishing now, though, right? You guys are finishing, graduating soon, graduating part of that early cohort. But anyways, that, um, those are the comments that I had about that. I think it's been a successful, I'm excited that South Africa is really trying to, um, to engage in systems thinking and systems analysis, so thank you. I just wanna try seeing if I can duplicate mine. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karina Dutoy. I'm the program manager at the African Doctoral Academy. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. So a little bit about the ADA and how we're contributing to this critical mass of systems analysis scientists and researchers in South Africa. Is we based at Stellenbosch University. We were established in 2009 as a training arm for doctoral capacity development within the university and then further abroad. Ten years later, we are hosting around 500 delegates a year at two training opportunities at our yearly summer and winter schools. Um, at the past winter school, we had 20 nationalities, mainly African, and some of the, our focus point is current and prospective PhD candidates, their supervisors and researchers in general. And we have five streams uh, for training that we've identified. The first one is preparing for the PhD. How do you sketch your roadmap? What is the PhD really? What is your role? Then we move on to developing your research design and methodology thinking and training and writing for the protocol. We look at analyzing research data, quantitative and qualitative. Um, we always take on board what our um, delegates ask us for. So we've incorporated R that Andoni took, and maybe in future we'll also have Python, we'll see. <laughs> How do you disseminate your research data? We've got specific courses in scientific communication and disseminating your research, and then also do sort of boot camps in writing and publishing your work as you progress through your PhD. And then life after the PhD, supervision, uh, teaching and learning. So. I was the representative for the SASAC program for, on behalf of Stellenbosch University, and my main focus was helping to draw up a capacity development program. So typically in the first year of all the different cohorts, they would gather at Stellenbosch University in January, and we would do an introductory session on what is the PhD. But then also we used to work in bespoke aspects on systems analysis. And here I drew, for example, on Mary Schools, who's the Saatchi chair, in compiling a program on what is systems analysis. You've heard that it's quite elusive, and we try to work in programs and seminars that would help people understand and come to grips with how they can be applied in their own research. Um, as with the SOYSSP and the YSSP program, the cohorts, uh, we try to form quite a cohesive cohort. People stay together, and the feeling I get is that people are still very much in touch even after three, four years of having been with us. So in January, we also do a needs analysis on what your training requirements might be for the rest of the, maybe for the next 18 months. And then the SASAC delegates used to come back to Stellenbosch for our winter school program and attend the ADA winter school, take subjects of their, their choice, but also that aligned with their needs analysis. And then after the winter school, we would have, again, systems analysis specific programs and some social events modeling workshops, and then also we offered doctoral supervision training for the PhD supervisors that were in our program. So quite a holistic overview. Then in year two and three, what Seppo mentioned was also the focus on policy. So both for the YSSP in its last year and for SASAC, as the PhD candidates progressed through their degrees, we did quite a bit on bridging the gap from research to policy to practice science engagement, public engagement with ministers from the Department of Higher Education and Training and the DST, 
in an effort to produce scientists or put members of the public as experts that could help inform policy and also help to educate civil society. Then in year three, it was mainly a writing breakaway for article publication, once again with the aim of producing an article from your research. So that was our contribution. Um, I think it also adds to what Priscilla said this morning about how the program is structured. And uh, I'll be available for questions afterwards, I guess. Thank you. Let me just close this. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many faces that I've seen over the past few years. It's a pity that I don't see you often enough. Uh, as you might have heard, so I've been the dean for the three consecutive uh, summer schools in terms of South Africa, where about 60, 65 students participated. Uh, of whom 35 came from South Africa. So I believe there are currently about 65 students in the, the program, the PhD program, so touch wood. Uh, in South Africa, in a few years' time, there should be 100 people walking around with formal training in terms of systems analysis that can take forward systems thinking. I think there, that as such is an excellent contribution. When I think of a system, I think of a circle. And you can think of a small circle, if you like, or a big circle. But the system is not half a circle. It's also a circle that's constantly 360 degrees. You might know about the platoon sergeant that asked the the uh, soldier, uh, how many degrees in a circle? And then the guy said 180 degrees. And the sergeant said, no, it's not. He said, it's a small circle. So it's not a small circle. A system continuously is 380 degrees, uh, 360, sorry. Um, if you think of the Olympics, so there are many circles that bind together in one big overarching system. And that's the way that I see it. So think of a system as this, please. Not as this, because it's only half a circle. What I think I missed during this period, and which we will probably miss in future, is the lack of other hard scientists to become involved. In all my six, seven years associated, I've never been able to convince one chemist to become involved in system analysis, nor one physicist. So, so Corinne, uh, we struggle also to get hard scientists involved. What I do see a need for is to have more management sciences become involved. If you look at the situation of municipalities and many situations in South Africa, something like that, I think it's critically important. What I really also missed is the um, inability to convince some university management structures of the importance of systems analysis. And I think many of you can also speak to that. So that is something that is a pity. Uh, finally, what I miss, missed is although this investment is really significantly, as Sepo basically pointed out, in terms of our GDP, um, I think government should push yet also harder to have systems thinking in many of the processes governing our dear country. So that's something that I miss and that's my wish that this would still be able to expand more and I give the baton to you young guys who've been trained, this hundred people that have basically been trained. You should run with systems analysis in future. Thank you. A very useful colleague from the Free State to uh, from do the, the tech for me. So I'm Mary Western Scholes. Cape. Western Cape. Yeah. I'm Mary Scholes. I'm from Wits University. And uh, what I would like to do today is to share some of the things that I've been driving over the last few years and then to highlight what I've been doing in 2019. But I want to start with um, the research program, as you know, SASAC was funded 
for that certain period, for the three years. And coincidentally, I was also awarded a chair in systems analysis. So I would like to thank the NRF, the DSI, and IASA for the contributions that they've paid over the years, played and paid for over the years, and creating these opportunities, not just for me, but for many other people. Some of them are in the room today. So as you've heard, the SASAC program had three components, an honors program, a PhD program, and the emerging researchers program. My responsibility was to take care of the honors program and the emerging researchers program. So you haven't heard a lot about that this morning. So I'll talk to you now about that. Um, you've heard quite a lot about the PhD program. So the honours course I developed at WITS three years ago with my colleague in the audience, Shai Clifford Holmes, who's a systems dynamic modeler in South Africa. And we've been offering it's a six-week course at WITS in global change and systems analysis. And during that time, not only do they get the theory, but of global change and systems analysis, but also get introduced to some of the software tools. So we have one honor student in the audience this afternoon. Victoria, will you just stick your hand up for us? So if anyone would like to know more about the honors program and what it consisted of, Victoria is here to do that. But I'd like to point out that it's a very, very small cost to run an honors project. It's part of a pipeline and it really is a good return on investment because those honor students can go anywhere with the knowledge that they've been given in that very short module. The other thing I took responsibility for was the Emerging Researchers Program, and this was really fulfilling. The requirement to get accepted onto that program is you had to have a PhD and you had to be employed at a South African university in some kind of teaching post and you didn't have to be a South African. So over the three years, we have offered this course to 68 emerging researchers. And we call them emerging researchers because we believe that they are going to go on and become the supervisors of young emerging researchers into the future. So it's critical to train them. It's not good enough just to train PhD students and then let them loose. We really need to keep up the training of young people. So we taught this in both an urban and a rural setting down in Mpumalanga and at WITS. And we introduced them to, again, systems dynamic modeling, to policy engagement, and a lot of rural development kind of work. So unfortunately, that program did not go on this year, the Emerging Researchers one, because it is quite expensive to run, but it has a fantastic return on investment. The Honours Project will continue to run through whatever period I'm still alive for. So um, what I would just like to, to move on to now is I've done a lot of work with policy engagement, which I will talk to specifically for this year of 2019. But I would also just like to start with the opportunity that holding the systems analysis chair has given me in South Africa. So I was trained as a plant physiologist, but I've become a biogeochemist, but working in a whole range of different systems. So we, I've got three of my students here today who are working in different catchment studies and looking at either the biocomplexities of physical and sociological systems, climate systems, and mining systems. So the point that I want to make is that all of my current students, which was not true of my previous history, all of my current students are not only engaged in the fundamental research of the theory of that topic, they all have some policy relevance, either at the municipal level, at the industry level, or at the national policy level. And I think that's really been a shift in the way that I've personally developed over the years. I have a young woman who's working in heritage studies. We have fantastic heritage in South Africa, but what do we do about it? It suffers. And that's of both social and biophysical heritage. So there's also a post on that. And then in the area of rural development, 
We've been looking at whether low-income shacks, RDP houses as we call them in South Africa, are actually a suitable place for people to live. And we've linked that to ambient temperature change and climate change. So we've got a very wide range and we are lucky that we have supervisors at the universities, not only at WITS, but others who are helping to co-supervise these students. So when new supervisors are taking on students, don't just look internally for your own supervisors in your universities. Look externally, both nationally and internationally, and especially to YASA. So I would like specifically to mention uh, the policy engagement I've been having with the Department of uh, currently Environmental Affairs, Fisheries and Forestry, and we're still having a number of mergers in the country around which department is sitting where. But forestry globally is suffering. There is a global world shortage of wood because we didn't think that people would com continue to use as much paper as they do. But what is really driving the market now are secondary products and construction timber. And that's driven by carbon dioxide taxes on the production of cement. So things are changing really quickly. The forestry industry in South Africa is very fragmented. And because of our systems approach, I was given the mandate to rewrite the R&D strategy for Forestry South Africa, which has meant extensive engagement with stakeholders this year. The difficulties of trying to get people across national and municipal boundaries to talk to each other, as well as industry. But it's something I will continue to do because it provides a home for future generations of students, but it also links directly the co-creation of knowledge of research students to the development of their research for the policy that it will finally be implemented. And then the three things or the few things I'd like to continue to do, and I hope with considerable assistance from whoever wants to, I will continue to offer the honors course and we have good resource materials. If any other university wants to roll it out, they're very welcome. I personally want to see the emerging researchers program sustained. It's the best return on finances. I and we and Colleen and many others are already working on a new integrated systems, climate change, social structured master's degree that we hope to put to our Senate in 2021. And then I am working with a number of govern government ministries and looking at policy coherence across those various ministries. And I continue to work with industry. And I think as a package deal, systems analysis has brought a tremendous amount to the country. Thank you very much, Mary. We'll now have our final speaker, Mercy. Um, my name is Messi Shoko. Um, I'm very honored to be here today to present at such a prestigious event. Um, I've been asked by Priscilla to provide, uh, to give a reflection of the three months that I was a SAYSSP participant and beyond in just three minutes, and I'll try to do that. I was part of the 2013-2014 SAYSSP leg that had young and not so young scientists uh, with different educational backgrounds, but all with research with a system approach bias. I would also want to admit that as a social scientist, we were the minority, but I, in my opinion, I think we brought a, a breath of fresh air in the discussions. The program helped to show that the scientific rigors are the same regardless of the field of specialization. I've also established links with a number of participants. And now and again, we talk to each other and we run ideas by each other. 
the experience also underscored that the fact that we do not work either in isolation or in a vacuum. As such, this ensures that our work scaffolds, as it were, on the work of others. This ensures that studies done in our field do not just accumulate, but they become cumulative. Paradoxically, however, I realized how diverse countries grapple with aspects unique to their situations. This helped me to appreciate how the variable contexts shape research and how these contexts should be considered in any research for evidence-based decision-making. And that research should go beyond abstraction. Notwithstanding differences in context, however, it occurred to me that this difference should not be seen as a negation of the level of rigor that we have come to expect in systems approach research. As a matter of fact, differences in context are expected to yield more nuanced research as opposed to a one-size-fits-all approach. As a demographer, it's just as a, uh, which is the National Statistics Office in the country, I'm faced with complex problems. My main role is measurement of demographic phenomena, which includes mortality, fertility, and migration. This is made complex by inadequate civil registration and vital registration systems in the country. And uh, this applies even to the rest of the region, which is sub-Saharan African region. So it is not just a matter of a numerator and denominator. So reasonable assumptions are made to adjust the data that we get so that we estimate and provide indicators that reflect what is on the ground. I also measure issues relating to the human population, which is dynamic with that variability over time. So it's also not only about numbers. The temptation of desk research that sometimes becomes speculative theorizing is real. As I went through this program, I could see uh, how my research could translate into practical knowledge that could inform policy that translates into better life for my country in terms of real bread and butter issues. Furthermore, State SA is at the center of um, the government efforts to address the national and international development agenda. So our estimates are far reaching. I've, so I've made an effort to address this in my research. Where possible, I've also made an effort to address um, uh, to integrate, sorry, where possible, I've also uh, made efforts to integrate the work that I do in my corner as a demographer uh, with work done by various other divisions in the organization or with other organizations outside uh, State SA. For example, I've triangulated State SA data that we receive with other data from other research organizations to provide a holistic picture and as a way to integrate our data. Finally, the program, the SAY SSP program, also informed my prioritization of my work. So I need to see what do I do because first with so many social economic challenges in the country, we have to prioritize and how to integrate them so that in one research, I can address a multiple of issues in the country. With that, I thank you very much. I'd like to thank my panel very much. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the SASAC was made up of a consortium of universities, including University of the Western Cape. So I wonder, uh, Professor ba Baker, whether you could say a few words about um, your inclusion in the program as well and contribution. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. Um, it's indeed a great privilege for me to, to make some comments to this esteemed panel. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, the questions that I've raised are critical questions that we have discussed. So I think I'm going to stir the pot today by putting them on the table and maybe from the broader panel, because I haven't had the opportunity to speak to all of the various student representatives, there may be some new insights. And the one is, every PhD student is always worried where are they going to work. And so in the context of systems analysis, what have we done and what should we be doing if we think of going forward towards shaping the exit value of the PhD? So there's the academic value, you know, the, the educational value. There's the value of printed output and publications. But when we are 
when we are training professionals to function in an economy and in a government structure as our own, are we doing enough to link them to the representative sectors of government? Is government as an entity through the NRF, is that the only involvement that we want from them? Do we not perhaps want government to be telling us what are the problem areas in making the policies work or updating the policies? In my experience with the students, they will refer to, as Mary has also mentioned, um, uh, policies relating to water or community health that dates back to, and I'm not going to mention years, but way, 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 way back. And those are the only policies that students have to work with or within the framework, you know, that they have to work. So the question, you know, it begs the question, what are we doing to update and to make our students that are produced in this system and going forward relevant to solving those issues? How are they going to move into those structures? What can we do and should we be doing? I mean, perhaps it's not for us to intervene in this. So it's, a, it's you know, it's meant to provoke uh, comment. And then the second one is, of course, the monitoring of the output deliverables. I think from an NRF point of view, and this is a discussion that we've had, the value of investment has to be measured in terms of returns. That makes economic sense. And so are we doing enough as the management team and the participants in systems analysis to make sure that we keep track of and that we promote the output, not just at uh, the postdoc level, as we heard with Mary's programs, but for every individual participating. So are there certain disciplines that it's more difficult to publish in for whatever reasons? And are we looking to address that perhaps through the doctoral program? So I'm just throwing a stone in the bush, literally. Um, and then the, one of the comments that we had from all our inception meetings was always the su supervisors coming, because these are new intakes mm -hmm. and they're what is systems analysis all about? What are we supposed to do? And I'm an engineer and how does this fit in? So maybe we should be doing more or we should find innovative ways of bringing the supervisors in existing disciplines because we can only work with what we have. We, we hope that one day we will have well-informed uh, systems analysis supervisors but let's argue that perhaps at the moment we don't have and what can we do to bring the supervisors on board so that the honors programs gain momentum at more universities if, you know, if that's one of the ways that we can do to accelerate systems analysis. And then finally, I, I'd love the comment from uh, Professor Ruet in terms of the chemists that are not on board. It's been, I'm a chemist, so it's something I've been saying right from the beginning, but I think there are reasons from there for, for that which I've discussed with the NRF as well. And some of it relates to how we take the students in, our screening methods for applications. We, we should perhaps, and this is a suggestion from my side because I'm favoring the sciences, we should perhaps look at incorporating selected universities and selected disciplines because we want them in and not because they qualify on their own merit for systems analysis. And through the capacity building programs, then start to develop uh, capacity in systems analysis. It's not true that there are no systems in science, in the hard sciences, in mathematics, chemistry, and physics, mm -hmm. but perhaps the panel doesn't see that, and perhaps the practitioners should be given the opportunity to state, yeah, I'm a good supporter of uh, new ideas. So I think, let me conclude on that, no criticism, no judgment, but I think these are some of the comments that we have discussed, and I think um, perhaps would be benefit for us to explore a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, follow up on that. In terms of deliverables, uh, one of the things we look at is graduation. So the first cohort had about 19, but uh, there were exits and there were 13 that uh, went all the way to their final year of the doctoral studies. Uh, three of them have graduated and we expect the remaining 10 to graduate in the first half of next year. And we will continue to track um, their performance in the program um, and monitor deliverables from the Emerging Researchers Program as well. I also have a piece of good news about the screening process. So the National uh, Research Foundation has developed a new policy for funding of postgraduate students which funds them from an honors level to doctoral level without interruption and that will begin with the 2021 intake of uh, students. So Mary, that will mean that the students in your program, including Victoria, um, will be able to get NRF funding and as long as they main maintain their performance, they will be considered for funding at master's and doctoral level. 
Um, the other thing that we've done is we've mainstreamed uh, the SASAC program. So it began as a standalone uh, doctoral training and emerging researchers program. Uh, SASAC is now part of the NRF postdoctoral call, or postgraduate call for funding. So to all the supervisors and, and, and students in the room, if you're applying for funding, for postgraduate funding, then you need to um, look at the NRF call for postgraduate students. Um, beginning next year, we will start funding at the master's level as well. And so we now have master's and doctoral, and depending on additional funding that we receive from the DSI, we want to be able to fund the entire pipeline. I received some happy news from Aldo to say that we can go up to quarter past one and lunch will be from quarter past one to two. So I'd like to now open up um, the session for audience participation and we will take a round of three questions. Yes, there's a hand in the middle here. Do you have a mic? Can I go? Yes. yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Christina Trois. I'm a search chair in waste and climate change at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I would like to ask a question to everyone, but specifically perhaps at Mary or uh, Corinne, um, with respect to um, how we can, uh, what is the process to maximize uh, the uh, introduction of systems analysis at the universities? Um, with particular respect to training of uh, students, uh, uh, and the reason why I'm asking this question is that in my field, which is all about systems analysis, although we don't say it explicitly, um, we run uh, and have been running for many years uh, um, summer schools, uh, postgraduate seminars, uh, and the same type of training that uh, SAC, SASAC uh, is, uh, is advocating. So uh, how can, uh, in order to ensure the sustainability of your programs uh, going forward, and most importantly assisting our students to, in fact, uh, translate our research into policy, which is at the basis of, uh, of our uh, uh, reflection towards uh, improving the impact of our research. How can we um, join uh, these realities that already exist in many universities in South Africa and certainly in my university uh, with uh, a program like the one that you do at SASAC? Thank you very much. I'd like to take two more questions. Are there any additional burning questions or is it almost time for lunch? <laughs> okay, Mary, please go ahead. Yeah, how the sketches runs, but I'm really good at talking to the audience. Right, so thank you for the question. And I, it's come to life. I, I think what's important is that in South Africa we have the complexity of the synergy between high school education and and universities. I, I go out and do quite a lot of school presentations trying to understand about systems analysis. And I not only talk to learners, but I talk to governing boards of different schools and PTA groups. Most parents in South Africa, it doesn't matter if you're a public school or private school, want their child to be trained in a discipline. And when I go and suggest something like systems analysis, I'm often hounded out of the room and not even given a cup of tea. So, so there we have that kind, and I, we can't do away with that. Disciplinary-based knowledge is critical, actually, for good systems analysis, because if you don't have that, then everything becomes a bit mediocre. So there, there's that issue we need to work on. Secondly, universities find it very difficult structurally to have interfaculty programs. We seldom get them right at the undergraduate level. We are now much better at getting them right at the fourth year level. So that's why we believe our honors programs are critical to maintain the start of systems analysis and then to grow it into master's PhDs and, and post PhDs. So it's not going to happen overnight. I've actually been very impressed about how much progress we have made in my area in South Africa in the last five years. So, 
just to add on Mary's one as well to follow up with Priscilla's component, at the bottom of most of the things we're doing, it needs a collective approach. I think that's why we are all here as well to look at. It can't just be VITS, it can't just be NRF, it can't just be YASA and the other universities. But how do we come up with all these collective approaches? And it as well starts with the supervisors themselves, the institution, as, as Mary uh, put it here. If you're speaking of the training component, if you're training a, a, stu a student, there are uh, opportunities that you, you avail to them, but as a supervisor, so how do you make sure that you've got that contact with uh, the industry, the policy makers, and etc. Institutional level is the same story. At the NRF level as well, what we do is we provide systems to support or resources to support the system. And it is, of course, very expensive if you look at a program like SASAC. If you look at when we did last numbers with Priscilla, when we're now trying to look at the next phase for SASAC, just for 30 students, SASAC dedicated over a period of uh, three years, the numbers were coming to around 60 million rands versus almost a quarter or a third of that if you're just funding PhDs because of the resources, the uh, network that goes into it, the mobility that goes into it. So it's quite expensive, but collectively, I think there's quite a lot that, that we can do collectively. Similar to uh, the honors programs that has already been uh, uh, produced by Mary in terms of the global change, how do we get that to, if it can work with, within, other system, within other institutions, instead of duplicating it, use it and see how we can work together from different institutions. Thanks. Okay, Corina, did you want to add to, or are you still reflecting? Okay, I think the point that has also been made is that there are uh, centers of training around the country. SASA provided some training, but I'm hearing UKZN also provides training in systems analysis. And the question is, um, should we look at uh, whether there are redundancies or duplication of effort in the system or whether this actually needs to be decentralized to institutions where the capacity exists, you know, to maximize on the use of our resources? Okay. I wonder if any of the other panel members would like to weigh in. Karina? Um, just to, to add on to what you were saying in SEPO, um, having been involved with hosting a lot of the training capacity development programs and, and hosting systems analysis experts, it is an incredibly expensive program to run, but I think the outcomes might have been worth it. You know, if we're looking at jumpstarting systems analysis as, a, as an approach and a methodology in South Africa and Southern Africa, um, I think it would have been a wise investment, and I look forward to, to seeing more of the, P the reports on the PhD mm. publications and um, graduations as they continue. Thanks, Karina. <coughs> Brian, did you? Yeah, let me just make a comment to um, Priscilla's, um, and maybe tie in what Andre was saying, that um, I have students all the time come to my office almost in tears. What am I going to do with a degree like this, right? Because they, they need jobs and they, they, they have a reality to face. And, um, but, but as Andre said, you know, a system is a circle. And right now the circle is reinforcing in a way that's causing the problems that we currently have. And so in a kind of insidious revolutionary way, the more people train like this, maybe they'll create different circles and new circles. Of course, they got to get in there first somehow to do that. But, but I think the more people we train to do this kind of thinking, that we'll be able to create better, newer circles. Um, but it also gets to the point, I agree completely with Mary, that it's not that we're trying to get rid of disciplinary-based or reductionistic science, but it's, it's a balance of the two. And right now it's overwhelmingly in the favor of reductionistic science and, as opposed to holistic science. So if we could get a 50-50 balance, then maybe we'll have new circles emerge that, that uh, have jobs for those people and not as many environmental human problems that we have. So I'm an idealist. Thanks, Brian. Mary? Thank, thank you very much. I, um, I think what's important is you do have to have probably, because of the geography of our country, at least what we could call centers of critical mass. 
of people who do systems analysis. And it needs to be academics and researchers. But I think the ideas that were put on the table maybe five years ago around co-creation of research really need to pick up exponentially in terms of, of doing work right from the very beginning that has a user. And uh, there are quite a lot of examples now. And the users for me are local municipalities, industry, and national policymakers. And I have convinced a number of people to start working together with postgraduate students so that they never ask the question of where am I going to get employed. The majority of our students do get employed. So I think we need some critical mass in the country. I don't think we did a very good job in SASAC in actually dispersing that critical mass in a systemic way on road shows. So why should I always teach the honors program at WITS? Why don't I actually go and teach it at Free State? or somewhere else where we could uh, then spread the knowledge much more quickly. We could teach the same honors project but at, program, but at different times during the year, and then move experts to places rather than moving all the students to one particular location. So I think there are a number of ways where we could minimize the cost but maximize the benefit. OK, I have two questions, uh, Dr. Finjarsfeld, and then Priscilla, I'll come to you. It's just not a question, but just a, a sideways comment about where do we find the YSSP graduates from IASA today mm. in the broader framework uh, globally? Mm. Um, well, you've seen, met some of them here today, and they're all gainfully employed as far as I can see in one way or another. Uh, they serve as cabinet ministers in different governments around the world. They serve as vice presidents in different governments around the world. They serve as captains of industry around the world, um, and some of them even stay in academia. And so um, I think that the idea is to, that these people do seem to find a way to, to, to be gainfully employed. Um, I don't think that we can define a category of jobs yeah. or a particular job that is suited to put somebody with a systems perspective of, of the environment in which they function. Uh, I think we need to be, uh, these people find their own way because they've got, they're highly skilled, uh, they are really creative thinkers, and I think they contribute to society in many, many different ways. Uh, I think it's just good to have people that think in a cabinet or in some society like that slightly differently from the way that everybody else thinks. And I think in that way we can add value across the society as academics, but also as researchers, but also in industry, in the private sector, and in government elsewhere. So it's not a, it's not a competition with the existing disciplines. I think it's just adding value to it at the end of the day. I think that's what Absolutely. I see have, happening in practice. Mm, we have three of them on this panel. I see Dr. Shakespeare don't be at the back. Um, so yeah, Mr. Lass? So yes, um, I see my part, myself as part of having to you know, take ownership of these questions. And so I just want to be clear to the panel, I didn't throw you to the walls. So firstly, as an academic, I have to say, it's nobody's job to create jobs for PhDs. If a PhD is a leader in training, so we are capacitating you for thinking in a certain way and for leading. However, I work with real students and they worry about where they're going to end up and it's across the sciences and also in SASAC. So it's not unique to SASAC and we have to keep in mind what is the aim of a PhD program, that it is to train you to think in a certain way. However, government is investing in this program and this is what I say to all of these fancy programs. We have another one at the University of the Western Cape called the uh, t uh, Trading Platform in Masters in Nanoscience and my, my question is always when we are investing to train and build capacity, we have to bring the existing structures and they don't have to be a PhD and you'll notice I'm elevating PhD because that's how we see it, whereas the practitioners on the ground often have the real knowledge and will be able you know, to feed both ways, those who are practicing to the new leaders and the new leaders. And so my challenge to the NRF finally, NRF Mary, do with, to me what they do to you at the parent meetings, I'm going to run. I, I, I'm not expecting tea. 
But the NRF um, is strategically positioned, I think, in the context of this program and in the context of government to make available practitioners in government who would like to listen and needs to perhaps hear what is happening here. And I don't think that they're perhaps well represented today. We're talking amongst ourselves who know the value of this. And so in our planning going forward, how do we make where the need has to be addressed? How do we get what we can do, um, communicated to them in a way that they can understand? And then secondly, you know, there is capacity in this concept of systems analysis outside of the program of systems analysis. I don't think we can run away from that. However, as a researcher, again, if I am working in capacity building or sorry, in systems analysis within this area or policy development in this area, I do commend the NRF. They do have strategic programs. And so both the new PhDs who are uh, entering the world of work, as we call it, post-PhD, in this area of systems analysis, as well as the other pockets who have not been incorporated in this first round, should see the NRF as that point of call from which to depart. So we should also be coming to you and say, I'm working in systems analysis. I think I can add value to this honors program, or I can take the honors program in the next round. How do we do that? And I think that would also be beneficial for the NRF to say how we should uh, you know, invest in future um, and make the links possible and make, keep the conversation going mm -hmm. so that it moves from kickoff and developing a base into growing um, something really strong in future. But it's been an excellent program, so my commendations to everyone involved. Now, points well taken. I would say that they, there is willingness among policymakers to engage. And in fact, as part of the SAYSSP, and as Karina has indicated with SASA, the policy dialogue sessions, the training in science communication that ended up with developing a policy brief for engagement with policymakers. But there's room for improvement, um, is what I'm hearing you say. Um, I would like to give the panel an opportunity, 60 seconds, for concluding remarks. Since I started here with the presentations, I'll start at the very end with you, Mercy, uh, for a 60 second concluding remark, and then we'll, we'll round up. Uh, thank you. Just briefly, uh, I was thinking that maybe for myself I benefited uh, from the program because I come from also an interdisciplinary program. So maybe what the, the programs can do to enhance systems analysis in universities, for example, is also to target those programs that are already interdisciplinary. So it will be easier to merge in now the systems analysis because in a way they are already systems analysis but not directly uh, saying it. So that's, uh, that's my view. Thank you. I think one of the models that we're working on at the moment is to locate a number of students who are working in different areas or disciplinary areas on the same research platform. And in my particular example, I've got them all working in a small community called Bakastra, where they, every day when they're there doing their research, they're interacting with the community. And so very quickly, the ideas get rationalized as to what works and what doesn't work. But I think what we've also been grateful for over the past is that one of South Africa's climate change negotiators, Elf Wills, who Albert might know, Elf and I have teamed up in a policy decision exchange process to train postgraduate students and he has taught on our emerging researchers program. So somebody with years of very high level negotiation skills, it's not so much making the policy, it's negotiating how to get to that end point. And I think that's been a, a very fruitful area that we can grow. Um, maybe from, from my side, uh, just a quick comment on what you, you said in terms of chemistry and my point on chemistry people involved. Um, maybe the system in South Africa is actually a problem. Uh, if uh, you want to involve very good hard scientists, usually the hard scientists that I want to involve are already strictly discipline orientated and they don't have five minutes to spare according to them. The people that I don't want to involve 
are the hard scientists who are not 100% busy. So it's sort of this catch-22 situation. It really needs to be the good people that, want, that needs to make an extra commitment to become involved to realize what this is. And hopefully, maybe we should thank the deterioration of the environment to force more people into thinking about these things to become involved and therefore uh, more actively in systems. Okay, um, just two points then. One is that, uh, I guess echoing Albert's comment, that, uh, um, that they end up, you know, people with systems analysis training obviously do end up in, in a, a lot of different places, and that's a strength of it too. There's not just one career for a person that has a systems analysis background, but, but you want people with that way of thinking to be everywhere, basically. And, um, and the second point would be then just appreciating again and, and thanking what South Africa has done to recognize the need for that and to build these kinds of programs. And we would love to, again, continue to make this a model for the other YASA NML countries and to, to spread really what you guys are doing here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, in 2015, following the SAYSSP, we were at UWC working on the SASA call by the NRF. And we were grappling ourselves or ours with what is systems analysis and what is the point of the program. And the point of the program was to introduce and solidify and strengthen systems analysis as an approach in research in South Africa. And from hearing now being exposed to some of the other universities in South Africa using a systems analysis approach and the posters and the fact that the SASAC bursary calls are now being mainstreamed, they, they're part of the generic call yeah. with the NRF, probably means that we've hit some of those boxes that we've tried hitting. So I just look forward to the approach solidifying more and being more widely used. Good. Here's your mic. Thanks, Priscilla. Uh, just to start, I think I would like to thank uh, the people who have been involved in systems analysis in South Africa since 2007. I think a lot has been done in South Africa, even compared to other NMO countries in the world. I think South Africa, we are punching beyond our, uh, uh, our limit. If you look at the numbers that were shown in the morning by USLA in terms of the money that goes into research and development. So quite a lot of dedicated programs has, 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 has gone into our programming. A lot of resources has gone into it, both in terms of financial, the skill set, and the people that have been involved in, in the programming. And that even be, goes beyond uh, South Africa. That's why we even spoke of the Southern African Center. It speaks of what South Africa and the region has been able to develop and do or during the last uh, decade or so. So it, it's been quite an amazing journey and I'm sure going forward that will still continue with the network growing as, 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 as we are seeing it now and that means being much more involved especially uh, from the institutional perspective where we're looking at it holistically from South Africa and the region and the link between the region and yes I think that will be key from s small simple things for instance like the alumni if IASA can start opening up the alumni, not just the expertise at, at IASA, looking at the last 48 years and the alumni that you've built over the last, how do we tap into that for the benefit of, of the region, if you speak of called supervision, mentorship, opportunities for research beyond South Africa and the exposure that, 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 that we'll get. As we go into the next phase of SASAC, I think there's quite a lot of discussions happening now. We will still continue engaging with the various stakeholders. Now we'll shape uh, the SASAC program. As, as you're aware, there's a human capacity development PhD component, but there's a suite of other uh, potential components that we can push for going forward. So I thank everybody for being so actively involved. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank the team. Um, it's not easy changing a mindset of people, especially if it wasn't designed or tailor-made for African solutions. So I just want to say thank you for the team for really changing a cohort of thinkers and how they're going to lead and how they're going to influence going forward. I would really like to encourage the question that you had around um, the pipeline of it in that how can we use the already existing cohorts of SASAC to actually be the engines of making sure that the pipeline starts at high school going straight up to um, graduation. And I think um, we need to be more utilized. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, colleagues, please join me in thanking the panel. So as we um, break for lunch and as you have your conversations over lunch, I want you to reflect on what how far means to you in the systems analysis journey. <laughs> and that you can, uh, you, it can be bespoke, you know, uh, you can customize it to what it means for you as an individual, what it means for your institution in general, and what you want from partnerships with various stakeholders that are in this room. I'd also like to acknowledge the support the program has had from the British Council um, that's also represented here. So colleagues, let's break for lunch and can we uh, return at two? Um, but Professor Scholz would like to conclude the session. Just a very quick word. Would the people that have been chosen to present in the posted blitz session, please just meet with me now very briefly here so I can find out what medium you're going to use in that last session of this or one of the sessions later this afternoon so that we don't fumble around and, and waste time. But now I have the mic. I would like to thank Priscilla. Because she has been instrumental over the years at the Free State University and subsequently in her more administrative role at the NRF. But she's really, if somebody says, so who's the longest remaining Priscilla Mensch? Yes, I think that's who she is. So thank you very much, Priscilla. Enjoy lunch. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are pleased to have you back in the, in the room after vivid discussions on sustainability and how to carry transdisciplinarity in universities, doing research, establishing fellowships, and making sure that everything is integrated. And this session is a follow-up of this spirit of integration, how to connect people to people to deliver a high level of information on sustainability aspects. Um, this panel has two speakers, but two premium speakers on issues of integration. But before they start their presentation, I would like to share with you a few thoughts um, that can that spin off from that are spin off from uh, what we discussed this morning, but also some reflections of what we can expect from this session. The first line of thought which I want to share with you is that for many of the discussions, the content and the type of influence we want to establish are all related to impact. How do we use science? to do, to have impact. And part of the discussion this morning, as far as I understood, was a lot of transaction-based uh, approach for, for impact. How many students, how many universities, how much money. And to me, impact is not always transactional. It's not always running up numbers. Impact is a lot, a great deal to do with how do we influence, how do we transform, how do we create change. And to create change, there's some principle we all agree. We all agree here that we refuse the status quo. We don't accept the situation, the way science is developed and, and implemented. We don't accept that way. We need to change it. We need to improve it. Colin Vogel was very vocal this morning on let's do it before we know what the caveats are and try to adjust it. It's not really impactful to really stay on the rhetorics without doing the implementation. And to do the implementation, there is two things. One is leadership, the science leadership. I'm very happy that ISR and partners and all the people who are here are just having this pathway through leadership and trying to get the next generation of leadership in science to engage in this process. Talking about engagement, who are the engagement, um, the most strong engagement um, stakeholders um, we need to have in our hands? Uh, in this type of discussions, it's unfortunate that we don't have any stakeholders. There is no municipalities, there is no farmers group, um, there is no people dealing with water in a daily basis. And we have been talking about co-design. Just thinking about the format of the way we do science, uh, how do we discuss things. Um, if we do it and out there our solutions are not applicable, then it's really a big issue. So my page in the, the synergy side, the co-design side, is to get more non-scientists into the debate for the sake of integration. Uh, for the science side, um, and this has been coming in all the discussions on SDGs um, across Africa, the issue of information and data. Two years, one year ago in Dakar, there was an assessment saying 
that the, if we need 100% of data for the SDGs, what we have right now is less than 30% of data. And the scientists have to play a big role in collecting those data. And we can't, in our own area, just collect everything we need. We have to collaborate with people. This collaboration is extremely important. At the same time, the, the type of policy structure we have is not fit for purpose mostly. And we have been talking about governance. Uh, the policies are working on silos still, you know, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water, Ministry of Energy. Uh, the, the type of synergies which are needed for decision making should be connected to the type of synergies we have in science. And that's the parallelism of forms that will make that things happen. So where do we come from? We're talking about SDGs. It has been established since 2015. We only have 10 years to, to go. We have 10 rainy season of growth. We have 10 fiscal years for a baseline which is showing very, very worrisome figures. 70% of the most, the countries which are very poor, 70% of them are in Africa. More than 70% of the African countries have a poverty rate of 40%. The discrimination in terms of services, water service, energy service, and other services between urban and rural is the highest in Africa than anywhere else. The population growth, you put, give me the numbers. The urban rate, give me the numbers. The gap in there is not only a gap of idea, it's a lot of deal of gap of implementation. What do we know and how do we implement it? And this notion of gap of implementation, we cannot just embrace it as scientists. We need to do it with others. The implementation is also requesting a lot of people to come in. So in this session, I hope, and having seen the draft of the presentation of our two brilliant speakers, they will try to give examples, feasibility solutions. How do we do things? How do we do integration? Barbara will speak on issues of transboundary water. And as you know, Africa is full of resources. And if we, don't do, if we do not do business as unusual, that those resources cannot benefit from the continent. So we have to rethink the model of integration and how data and, and transdisciplinarity can be applied. The second presentation from Ethiopia is by Kiflu. He's a researcher on, uh, on policies, and he will be talking about land use and food system. And I think there are some overlaps between the two presentations, and pay attention to these overlaps. One is integration. They will all strongly speak about integration. And second, they will take examples on the most challenging issues in Africa, which is water, food security, and land. And without further ado, I think I can invite um, Mrs. Barbara, Dr. Barbara, to come for the presentation on the program, which is serving as an example for this integration process. Barbara. Okay, yes, it works. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here to show in some of the work that we are doing at YASA currently on Africa. I won't have the time to go through all of the work, but I would like to feature some of the projects where I have been mostly involved and use this also as a mean to follow in the discussion that we were having this morning. I mean, we, we need to, within the academy and within the, in the research organization, put the science together and coordinate ourselves to advance in systems analysis. But I think there is something very important, which is bringing this into practice so that when we discuss how costly, you know, is to maintain the SASAC program, that is not an issue anymore because the return is quickly seen and resources are there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would like to uh, discuss uh, three main things. A little bit on the practical side of what does it mean uh, bringing systems analysis and systems approach or integrated approaches into practice? How can we, you know, how can we tackle this? Second, um, 
thing is I would like to discuss some of the ongoing projects that we have in Africa. And third, what are the lessons learned and probably, you know, what still needs to be uh, done. And of course, collect views uh, from scientists, but I also think that we need to engage more broadly with other actors that we should also make sure that they are here in the in the table. So in terms of uh, integrated approaches, so how difficult is sometimes uh, you know, to communicate uh, this? And I think, I mean, using a, a simple and at the same time a complex example of a transboundary basin. No? This is a perfect example of a complex system that requires integrated approaches. I've used here some pictures from the Sembisi basin and basically when we look and when we approach the basin, I mean different people will have different understandings. They will come from different entry points and they will value or put their priorities or their interests in different dimensions in the basin. Some might see, you know, the beauty of the of the Victoria waterfalls and the huge economic potential that the tourism sector has in this part of the basin, but for some other people, the same water means something different, and it means, you know, sustaining their livelihoods downstream. Same thing, we can have other actors we are, which are seeing, you know, the economic potential that this region has for hydropower. And all these different interests and values, they need to coexist, and that makes, starts to make the problem a bit more complicated. And as complicated as this, I'm just here summarizing what could be the management operation, water management operation of the CNBC. So this is summarizing all the different sources of water, the different uses across borders, etc. So this is a very complex problem and requires definitely good science uh, and strong science and strong tools to be able to address. But this is only one part of the equation. The other part of the equation follows up on what we were talking this morning. We can put the science together. That is a challenge, but we can do that. But how can we make this fit for purpose? How can we, how can we communicate from the scientific community? How can we bridge this gap to decision makers and make them understand what we can offer and what, we, what would be the return of the investment? No? Because this is, this is actually what we need to do to bridge. There is many different reasons why this bridge exists, exists but I think from an it not can be all led by the scientists, but I think it's our duty as well to try and put effort in trying to bridge this, um, this gap. Another key feature of the approach, I mean, um, I think, I don't remember who said that, but I mean, if you want to go somewhere, you better go, you know, you better, you better know where you want to go because otherwise you might end up somewhere no? or anywhere. And I think this is, I mean, from every, every uh, sector or every perspective, this is very important. You need to have a vision. Where do you want to go and how can systems analysis allow you to, to get there? Um, importantly as well is that the solutions that we can be discussing today with all the actors might be not maybe the most suited ones when we look into the future and we need to do this long-term planning. So it is important to have these future visions. And unfortunately, forecasting and especially with these complex systems, it's quite difficult. So this is where this is what makes the case for uh, scenarios. And this is I'm including this because many people will know that EASA is quite advanced in the development of these scenarios, but maybe some others not. And, and this is another key feature of the of the work that we do. Um, scenarios are not projections or are not um, projections about the future. Are, are, different possible futures which are also plausible futures and we need to understand you know how this might unfold there is different uh, examples including we have also the ones from the IPCC which EASA is hosting some of the databases and a very important component so what is left when we do our projects I mean we need to ensure we talk about capacity development but I think we also need to talk about knowledge uh, sharing because we are learning in the same way that decisions makers are learning we need to understand you know what also what is their operating space what are the boundaries of what can be done or not so I think this is also a um, two-way process so to summarize before I jump directly into the specific projects I wanted to give the big highlights of what is our thinking especially when we tackle these uh, projects at regional scales like the ones in Africa first 
the determination is to use systems analysis to do science, applied science, science for development, which is very much needed. The combination of different modeling techniques, we can have the most fancy model, but if the model is not able to understand, you know, what is the operating space where decision making can take place, you know, we might end up providing solutions which are not simply not um, applicable. And then this forward looking, I think we do not need to plan for now, we need to plan for now and for the future. And the knowledge sharing and capacity announcement. So experience from Africa. Um, there is two very interesting projects that uh, are happening now, among others, and I unfortunately don't have the time to go through the details. So I'm going to focus on one, but I still would like to mention another one which just started, which is the Scaleways in uh, Lake Victoria, uh, because I think um, that's, that's actually a very nice, interesting project uh, in collaboration with stakeholders, including the Victoria. Victoria, Lake Victoria Commission and other partners like ACRISAT. And basically, this project, what is trying to look is what are the options, what are the enablers, and what are the barriers of trying to upscale some of these pilot projects in agricultural water management, successful projects that have been, and what are the, what are the potential for um, scaling these out, and also what are the barriers, no? Because um, I think someone mentioned it this morning, I think the political economy also plays a very important role here, and we need to, uh, we need to understand that as well. And then I would like to directly focus into the, um, the project that I've been myself uh, involved since 2017. It's been a long journey that it's about to, uh, to finish, but it has been a, yeah, a, a, great, a great experience of how to bridge this gap, as I was saying, how to bring the, the science closer to the, to the decision making. No? Um, the whole purpose of this project was about developing the tools and the capacities, not prescribed solutions, even though the title suggests that, but no, the focus was actually in developing these tools and these capacities. We did some work at the global level, and I will be happy actually in the presentation, there is some extra slides because I think there is some interesting dashboard um, product that can be interesting for you to see, but I'm going to focus on the on the work that has been done at the regional level and specifically in the in the SMBC. So this work involves not me. <laughs> I wish I could do this by myself, but no. I mean, this is a huge collaboration effort from EASA scientists and non-EASA scientists, other partners, including uh, Jeff, uh, very strong um, steering committee that we have and you need as well as implementing agency. Okay, so what is the quest? I mean, I could put like many, many different justifications of why this kind of uh, approaches is needed, but maybe one simple one is that if we look at how are we progressing in terms of SDGs, I mean, this table summarizes the progress by 2017 from African continents, the red implying not on track and the green in time on track. Overall, we can see that we are failing. I mean, and this is not exclusive from Africa. This goes beyond Africa, but I wanted to showcase uh, the example here. The reasons, I mean, the reasons are multiple. Uh, it's a matter of cost. It's a matter of cooperation. We were seeing this morning and we were hearing this morning that we still have this very nationalistic sometimes approach. And in the context of transboundary river basins, this is actually a big, big constraint. Uh, we have a stakeholders with their very different values and priorities, how do we combine this? Because there is not just one understanding about sustainability and there is multiple. And I think this is something that we need to recognize. And then there are trade-offs. So we have SDGs that might generate synergies for achieving our investments, that might generate synergies for achieving certain SDGs, but also some investments that can be counterproductive. So how can we, how can we deal with all this? So this NBC, this NBC is just going into the so what we have done, so we talk about developing tools and capacities. I mean, and EASA is very well known for doing these very um, um, sophisticated and advanced integrated assessment models. But we wanted to go, as I said, one step uh, beyond. And we also wanted to develop some sorts of tools to develop also a little bit of institutional capacities. I mean, why this nexus approach uh, matters and how can we communicate these to audiences which are not necessarily familiar with the very technical terms, but on the other hand, have great power not to 
to implement um, decisions. So we develop a number of tools. We develop an integrated, we could call it a decision support system, which integrates the water, energy, and food dimension. Uh, we develop also a participatory scenario tool. We were talking about the vision, but I mean the vision, the decisions that will happen in the SMBC are up to the stakeholders. So what is the vision? What they would like to see themselves collectively and then as countries as well. We also develop a number of what we call serious game. One is quite popular. I think probably some of you have been involved, like the Nexus game. And we are now developing another tool, which is, um, we call it the simulation exercise. Basically, it's an exercise building on the Nexus game, but it's no longer a game. It's basically using the outputs of the scenarios, the modeling scenarios, that we try to replicate these on a, on a board and run with the stakeholders these different scenarios, so for them to understand. The scenarios themselves and then uh, some important component on the capacity development through a number of research collaborations, YSSPs, we had two, and then another number of trainings that we have done back to back with the workshops. So the, the overall approach, and then I go into uh, one by one. So understanding, okay, if we want to develop, if we want to envision future solutions for the basin and the, ba and the vision for the basin itself, we need to understand what is the, the current situation and very importantly, who is to be involved there. So um, this is of course not all the stakeholders that need to be in the table, but this was uh, for our project, our main entry point, the SMBC Water Course Commission, and through them we connected to the national stakeholder um, basin committees, and there were also some regional and international organizations like WWF or the or the World Bank. So basically, it, it was at this level where we were trying to develop this visioning um, and the scenarios exercise. I might, I mean, I could take a long time explaining what's behind this because this is actually the, the synthesis of a big work uh, done on understanding, you know, what are the sectoral challenges from country perspective across the border and so on. But maybe to summarize, if we think about the main challenges um, that we are coming from, from a sectoral perspective, I mean, basically, I mean, many of them probably are very familiar to, you know, from the water system, from the land use system, the lack of agricultural productivity, which is a big constraint as well, access to water, Water quality, it's a growing issue as well. And this generates the, the investments that need to be done to overcome this also in, uh, generate uh, additional challenges. The expansion, I mean, the increasement, increasing of agricultural productivity is very much seen through the lens of increasing irrigated area. And this is one part of the solution, but that also generates trade-offs for downstream uh, users. And this is the, partic the particular case of SMBC because the, most of the big irrigation developments are actually upstream the hydropower development and that creates um, a conflict. Um, of course, um, as I said, this generates a conflict with the energy system because we have so much water, how do we allocate this water? And then on the energy side, coming back to the inequities between rural and urban areas, we have a massive large of the population in the basin relying on non-clean energies and relying on charcoal, which generates huge land degradation and erosion processes which at the same time affect the hydropower potential. So it's a really complex, uh, a really complex situation. Um, and one important thing here and bringing in this forward looking is that there is a number of boundary conditions. So this is the situation how it is right now. But the truth is that this, these issues can be exacerbated, you know, if we think about the future and these important um, drivers. So in terms of the um, visioning and the stakeholder process. Um, Albert this morning showed this uh, slide and I would just like to underpin one thing that I already said. When we think about sustainable futures, we need to understand that there are different, people have different values. So when you bring in reality all these stakeholders to the table, there is not probably sometimes just one unique desirable future, but many ways of understanding how this future can be achieved. And also there are some constraints. I mean, cost and investments are a constraint. So if you have to do, if you have to establish some priorities, where do you, where do you put the, you know, where do you draw the line? Where, what do you make as a priority? And another important thing from this participatory process where we're trying to eliminate 
created these pathways to this vision and then these pathways was that we were seeing the basin connected to the global world. I mean, maybe this basin is not as connected as other basins to the global markets, for instance, but it's definitely connected. And we need to see this in the context of climate change, but we also need to see this in the context of economic integration across the continent and beyond the continent. Mm, uh, this is the participatory process. I'm not going to go through the tool that we developed. So just to show that this was really a very interactive um, exercise where we work with the stakeholders, you know, using maps of the basins and different using different cards where stakeholders can put, you know, um, their current infrastructure, the other uh, cards indicating risk, where they were seeing risk, opportunities, etc. So we, um, we step from, the, we start from the understanding of what is the current situation and then we move forward to okay so this is where we are right now what is it where is it that we wanted to be in the you no know, in the future so this is well I mean just some feeling of how this was uh, happening in practice and this is also some of the reflections from uh, people from um, um, CBC Water Course Commission. No? They actually um, very much appreciated this, uh, this participatory exercise and in words of the program, uh, program manager for the CBC strate Strategic Development Plan, um, they were highlighting you know, how, how useful this process was in terms of participation and the, the amount of information and knowledge sharing that was happening in a relatively uh, short period of, um, of time. No? And also the idea of agreeing on a source of a direction. Okay, um, so this was, I think it was, uh, I don't, no, this slide was not shown because this is actually a new figure <laughs> that we have, but there was something similar. Um, this is, I'm not going to go, as Albert said this morning, I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to show here that to address this first slide where we were seeing, you know, the complexity of how to manage and allocate water for different uses, we definitely need uh, very strong technical capacities. And this is what we, uh, what we try to, uh, to develop, combining our uh, modeling capabilities with agroeconomic, hydroeconomic, water quality, hydrological model, and crop models. And of course, related, relating this to different next um, um, indicators. Um, will I have one more minute because I think we are coming now into the selling point. I mean, when we talk, okay. So um, just, I mean, the narratives that were coming out of this um, exercise that we did, I'm summarizing here like the highlights no, of some of the things, but the business as usual, of course, it basically means, you know, this country approach, development approach where all these national development and investments are being implemented. There is this predominant paradigm of base, the, the development uh, of the basin mostly on the use of surface water, um, and there is little at least on the paper uh, and the review that we did from the different national development plans, there is little consideration of climate change adaptation. Somehow it's mentioned, but not, not you know. The economic scenario, um, it's a vision that actually maximized the business as usual from the perspective that it's seen this very traditional approach to development. No, we need to first reach a certain level of economic development and we have to assume that we have certain losses along the way, but then we can, you know, the classical goodness. Uh, um, curve. And then the environment scenario, which basically has a strong component on climate change adaptation and very importantly, the development of the basin needs to be subjected to meeting the environmental targets. So every development should be um, should happen on the basis of, of uh, maintaining and securing this uh, environmental capital. And one interesting thing, this was the first, um, the first group that actually talked about the untapped potential that groundwater has and how strategic this resource is in the light of climate change. And I think this is something um, very important. This is one more slide and I'm finished. I keep saying this, but uh, yeah. Um, so when we talk, I mean, this is what we were saying, okay, how can we generate this evidence and then we can talk to decision makers and say, okay, this is the cost and this is the benefits. So without going too much into the detail, definitely, I mean, pursuing a sustainability agenda, it's probably more costly than going business as usual. But if you see in the graph, it's not much more. And if we look at the, uh, from the benefit perspective and what will this allow us, I mean, this cost includes 
both investments, maintenance, and operational um, cost. And if you look at the benefits that this will um, deliver, they are quite significant. Definitely, I mean, the economy is scenario. It's a, it's in a scenario that will deliver or will generate more trade-offs actually than a business as usual. But the environment scenario has very interesting points. The environment scenario, as we see it, as we under, as we model it, actually it will allow it to continue expanding this agricultural sector. It will not have, it's not incompatible with the development of a strong agricultural sector and it will have an impact on hydropower production, but there is also multiple opportunities for developing other renewable energies, not necessarily only relying on the, on the hydropower potential. And at the same time, this environment scenario will also have benefits in terms of maintaining the environmental flows as we, um, the river flows as we have them today, and it will contribute as well to offset large part of the emissions. Yes, um, this is some pictures of these other policy tools, and yes, that's it. Thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara. I, I share the experience of ISI in doing this transdisciplinary integrated rural research. It's so rich that we can spend many hours to, to give examples. But, but I would allow maybe one or two questions for clarification before we give it to Kiflo. And I see there are some overlaps between the two presentations. I would like to allow some time afterwards, 10 or 15 minutes, for people to, 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 to contribute overall to the two presentations. Is there any clarification to Barbara before she, she gets a break? Yes. Uh, probably it could be interesting if you can see the lessons, particularly the last slides, that would be useful. Sorry, the lessons you learned so far, I think that's important. Yes. Uh, can, can, we, we can, can, we hold, can we hold that question after, uh, after Kiflu, mm -hmm. and this lesson learned will be kind of uh, a panel discussion. Yes. Hi, Barbara. Did you model Batoko Gorja in this scenario or not? Batoka Gorge. Uh, so in, in between Big Falls and, and Kariba. Okay, all right. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, now time for Kiflu to come and share also issues related to land, but on the biodiversity and food security perspective. Kiflu, the time is yours now. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you for the introductions and uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, <clears throat> today I will talk about the food, agriculture, biodiversity, and land use, and energy pathways consortium and what we do in Ethiopia with this consortium. And we just started working with the consortium and we, we don't have so much experience, so I will try to be brief and uh, highlight what we start doing and how we do things and uh, what we are planning to do. And before I start talking about the consortium, let me give you a little bit of background about Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia, in terms of population size of 110 million, is the second largest country in, the, in, in Africa. And in terms of GDP, uh, it is the seventh biggest economy in the region, and it has also recorded uh, double-digit economic growth over the past decade or so. And the country in general has made uh, some progress in terms of poverty reduction. Uh, for example, the proportion of the poor living under the poverty line has been reduced from 44% in around 2000 to 23.5% in around 2015 and 16. But this doesn't mean that achieving food security is not a challenge anymore, but we still have a major problem of achieving uh, food security in the country. For example, in 2016, as of 2016, 38% uh, of the children under the age of five are undernourished. <clears throat> so under, like, like any other country, food and land use systems in Ethiopia are unsustainable, and this is likely to undermine the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Al uh, Agreement. And this is actually the main motivation behind the uh, Fable Consortium. And this implies that there is uh, a need for an integrated approach when you try to uh, modernize the economy, industrialize the economy, build infrastructures that will transform or negatively affect the food security in the best that you, that you plan to do. Uh, for example, the increasing population pressures under, 
uh, urbanization and uh, industrialization that's going on in the country uh, forces farmers to convert their farm and grazing lands to uh, urban dwellings, industrial sites, or infrastructure sites. And this uh, leads to land degradation and adverse climate change, which in turn affects performance of the agricultural sector and going back to food security problem. So to tackle this kind of problems and make sure that land use and food systems are sustainable, it's important to have uh, robust tools to model impacts of policies uh, and predict their impact. And this is where the FEBL consortium becomes relevant. Uh, FEBL is a global initiative that focuses on identifying scientific pathways for sustainable food uh, system and land use in line with meeting the, uh, the sustainable development goals and the Paris climate uh, 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 agreement. And in trying to integrate uh, ident or design integrated uh, strategies to achieve sustainable uh, land use and food systems, the consortium identified three pillars in the areas of agriculture, biodiversity, and food. The first pillar in agriculture, the issue is increasing efficiency of utilizing resources and making agriculture resilient to climate change and also increasing productivity of the sector. And in terms of biodiversity, the issue is conservation and restoration of biodiversity. This also involves issues of reducing uh, emissions from uh, deforestation and ensuring that land is preserved for uh, supporting biodiversity. And the third pillar, uh, the food security and uh, healthy diets, it focuses on targets of zero hunger, low dietary disease risk, and reducing food waste. So the consortium thinks that these three pillars are equally important, integrated, and synergetic. And uh, the work is uh, involves around this. And even if FEBL is an independent uh, organization in itself, it's also part of a greater coalition called the Food Use, uh, Food and Land Use Coalition. And FEBL mobilizes top knowledge institutions from around the globe uh, to support development of data and modeling tools. And this is with the objective of uh, capacity development in the areas of data management and modeling tools and developing national pathways and analyzing national policy options uh, and sharing best practices. And the consortium is consists of 20 countries, including the European Union, like counting the European Union as one country. And it involves three countries from Africa. These are Ethiopia, Rwanda, and uh, South Africa. And South Africa just recently joined the consortium. And the works of the consortium uh, are coordinated by the YASA and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And this is just to show you the distribution of countries, the country teams around the globe. So it covers most countries. So in terms of uh, methodology or approach, Fable uh, Consortium promotes two types of complementary uh, uh, modeling platforms. That is the Fable Calculator and the Partial Equilibrium Modeling Tools. And the Fable Calculator is a purpose-built Excel spreadsheet that country uh, uh, teams used to develop their own scenarios and develop uh, national pathways. And the steps in the FEBL calculator is that you collect national data for each country team on consumption, land use, population, and this data will be used to develop national pathways. That is to compute evolution of key <coughs> variables of land use and food systems across uh, starting from 2000 to 2050 with a five year step. And once these pathway or uh, computations of these pathways are verified, meaning comparing the parameter estimates against relevant benchmarks, country teams will submit their results to the linker tool. And the linker tool is uh, an aggregating tool that aggregates uh, the results of each country team at a global level. And this starts the Senaton, which is an interactive process where uh, aggregate national uh, pathways will be uh, compared with global ambitions or global targets, and uh, it will make sure that trade is in balance. And it will uh, continue this process, interactive process across uh, national teams. So the major steps is that human demand, like the consumption, 
along with production of livestock and crop, uh, will determine the target of uh, pasture and cropland. And if this calculated pasture and cropland is uh, exceeds the maximum that is available uh, initially, and given the restrictions for forest and bio, uh, other conservation use, then the model calculates feasible crop and pasture land that will then be used to calculate feasible crop production and livestock production and determine uh, the feasible human consumption. And based on this, we will get uh, indicators on food security, GHG emissions, and biodiversity. And when we come to the partial equilibrium modeling, Fable supports uh, geospatially explicit partial equilibrium models of sustainable land use and uh, food systems. And these models are integrated into model of trade in agriculture and food, uh, forest commodities. And these models serve as geospatial models to generate maps uh, for policy making and interaction with stakeholders. Okay. And, like the Fable calculator and the Fable uh, uh, Senatum, country team's Fable pathways will be continuously aggregated to be checked against global targets and to check whether trade is in balance, whether aggregate imports are required to aggregate exports. And in terms of specific modeling tools, the Fable consortium uh, allows country teams to choose between two different partial equilibrium models. The one is the global uh, uh, model, which is developed by YASA, and the other one is the model of agriculture production and its impact on the environment, MAGPI, which is developed by the post Minister of Climate Impact Studies, the Peak Institute. So with this, I will come to the Fable Ethiopia. Uh, the Fable Ethiopia team is based at the Policy Studies Institute, uh, which was formerly known as the Ethiopian Development Research Institute. And this is a government policy research think tank and with close contact with policymakers. And we have participa participated in the Senaton using the Fable calculator, and we uh, participated or contributed to the write-up of the Fable interim report in 2019. And in terms of partial equilibrium modeling, uh, with the help of YASA, we are in the process of refining the global model that is specific to the uh, Ethiopian context. Uh, this is to say that FEB, like global is a global model consisting of 50 countries or regions. Some of these regions are individual countries. Others are like group of uh, countries like Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, former Soviet Union countries. These are regions, but in the case of Ethiopia, uh, Esther here uh, from YASA are helping us to separate out Ethiopia from the sub-Saharan region, and uh, so that will be the work that we are doing. And we have received training on the global end, and we'll be working with uh, the YASA to further refine the model in terms of better data and local contexts. And this is just to give you a brief highlight about the Fable result that we that we just published in the Fable interim report, focusing on the three main targets, uh, the food security. In terms of food security, the national result on Ethiopia uh, shows that the average daily energy intake per capita increases between 2000 and 2030, and it remains stable after that. And still, the Ethiopia will be able to uh, uh, achieve this minimum daily energy requirement uh, of calorie intake by around 2030, with a calorie intake of 2,330. And at the aggregate level, the aggregated uh, result shows that this, uh, by 2030 and 2050, all federal countries will be able to uh, exceed their respective minimum daily energy requirement. And in terms of GHG emissions, uh, again, our results on the agriculture, food, and land use uh, GHG emissions increased from 37 million tons in 2000 to 90 million tons in 2025. And uh, it starts to decline towards the mid of the century uh, to 71 million tons. And we show that this is mostly driven by GHG emissions from the livestock sector. And in relation, similarly, the aggregate result uh, shows that the fabled countries and the rest of the world uh, do not seem to uh, meet 
this target. And specifically by 2050, the computed emissions from crops and livestock sector amounts to six gigatons. And this is 50% beyond the, the target that is set at four gigatons. And in terms of forests, the world station peak is computed in 2015 at 230,000 uh, hectares per year. And this is uh, deforestation is mostly driven by expansion of pasture and cropland. And the zero net deforestation target for Ethiopia can be achieved early by 2021 and 2025. And similarly, the aggregate results for favored countries and for the rest of the world included shows that this net zero deforestation target can be achieved by 2020 and by 2030 respectively. This is the last slide. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm uh, so, yeah. so the next step, uh, we are trying to use the Faber calculator for engagement with policymakers and land use in land use and food systems. One advantage of the Faber calculator is that you can easily change the assumptions and the scenarios, and you can show results quickly. So this would be a convenient tool to to have engagement with policymakers. And in terms of the partially crude modeling, uh, as I said before, our objective is to refine it further uh, and. Uh, use the global inversion of the Ethiopia to analyze impacts of government's plan to expand small, media, medium to large scale irrigation uh, in the country, and also to analyze impacts of Ethiopia's uh, joining the uh, free trade agreement with the rest of Africa to analyze trade in agriculture and forest communities. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Come, come. Thank you so much, Kiflu. Um, this is another example showing how collaboration is, let me see, let me say mandatory in this kind of business and how open data and accessing data and harmonizing the way you collect data is really central uh, to achieving the type of projection, scenarios, planning and influencing policies. Is there any clarification question before we open a discussion, you know, on these two uh, presentation, Mary? You know, I recognize you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's very interesting, but what I think would be really fun now would be to take Fable for Ethiopia and just analyze some of your scenarios with the new, what, 40 million, let me not exaggerate, 80 million trees you've just planted and see what that does to your greenhouse gas emission scenarios and your deforestation scenarios. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, I have got this question from Esther as well earlier. She wants to analyze the impact of these planting trees using the global model, but uh, so far we are not seriously taking it because we don't know uh, specifically where these trees are planted, but uh, I think we can do it with Fable. Uh, yeah. I think, Mary, you're, you're raising, um, uh, and if you feel free to sit down, I'll just start distributing the... It, it, it's, it's really a good question you, 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 you're raising there, because most often when we do this scenario, we just take the trend as is it projected now. We never include the new policy and how the new policy are transforming the reality. So let's open up for, for discussion. I think these two examples really show us how some ways to do things with collaboration, type of data different, but targeting sustainability on natural resources. It can be biodiversity, food, agriculture, land, water, you know, uh, energy production from, from big rivers. And how to negotiate between various aspirations, such issues of norms and values. How to vision the future? Uh, what's the objectives? Do we have a same understanding of where we want to go? And how do we negotiate that, uh, um, uh, that, that, that um, direction? The issue of priorities, the issue of trade-off and synergies. So many questions came out from these two presentations. I'm sure I would like examples, comments, questions. Um, I'm, I'm sure from various places in Africa and elsewhere, people can really bring other examples that can really enrich the discussion. So the floor is wide open, wide, wide open. After, you know, it's very difficult to chair a session after lunch break. <laughs> I try to speak loud and do merry. Thank you so much for opening the floor, and then you're the next. Thank you, Barbara, for your presentation. You know, Southern Africa is probably cursed with having many cross-boundary 
catchments and potential river basins that we all want to draw water from. Um, did you have, a, or is there a system for prioritization of water usage and allocation in the Zambezi Basin? And, and how is it going to change in the next 20 years? Yes, it's, it's working. Yes, it's working. So thank you, Mary, for the question. So um, something, I mean, at this level, there is no, um, I mean, the CBC water course, it's a commission, it's not an authority. So there is not a, an allocation um, at, at the basin uh, level. This is done within the within the countries. And I think there are disparities between how the allocations are being set within the the different countries. Um, so the answer to the question is that I think it will be desirable if we aim to achieve, you know, for a integrated um, management, you know, of water across sectors and across boundaries that this kind of um, um, allocation uh, legislation regulation will come into force. Um, the second question about climate change, I mean, there is a reality as well, and is that uh, probably if we have climate scientists here, they will, uh, they can better um, support this, the uncertainty, and especially in this part of the world uh, about the likely impacts or the changes, for instance, from the precipitation point of view, it's, it's the uncertainty is huge. So all the different climate models, they they range from plus 15 to minus, I mean average, no? So that means plus minus 15, so that means that anything basically can happen. So we just need to, uh, you know, cope with this uncertainty and probably um, be ready also when we do this planning to be able to cope at least with uh, you know, some of the worst uh, scenarios. But Within our scenario simulations, we could not even uh, really track and say, okay, there is a clear impact on uh, from the precipitation uh, perspective. I'm talking, so and probably also, Mary, the upstream downstream land management is not only purely climate, but how human uses space where those you know transboundary rivers are happening. Uh, one example is the Senegalese River between three countries, or the Gambia River between three or four countries. The management system is not the same from one country to another. It might be very different. So good question. Um, for follow up, yes, you were the second. Yes, thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question to Barbara. Um, the, in, uh, in the matrix that you showed us at the last, uh, one of the last slides on uh, the accomplishment of the SDGs for uh, uh, the African countries, I think it was like that, and with the nice colors, red and green and so on. Now, I'd like to ask you, in uh, uh, setting up a um, a chart or a matrix like that. Um, who sets the indicators of evaluation of accomplishment of the various SDGs? Question number one. Am I allowed a sub question on number one? Okay. So let's uh, question one A and one B. So the question one B is. Um, no, because Albert always says, me, says that I speak too much and I ask too many questions. So, um, so the question, the sub question to that is, uh, in, for example, in uh, in translating the concept of sustainable cities to uh, an African country, for, sorry, for African cities, we we identified a number of uh, uh, so the concept of smart city is uh, is available in uh, and well regulated, I would say, in terms of indicators in the northern hemisphere, in the so-called global north or developed countries. While instead, uh, um, how do you translate the same indicators uh, in, uh, uh, of evaluation in uh, uh, a developing country context? So uh, presumably the two questions are related because uh, that is the same process that you might have used uh, in setting up the same SDG matrix. Thank you. Yes. 
So first of all, I I mean I use this matrix, but it's not this is not something that I'm you know with my I don't have my hands working on it. But my understanding, and I think the two questions are quite pertinent because there is a big discussion you know on how to track the the progress with these SDGs and then the scale, no? Because these are done these evaluations or these assessments are done at the at the national level and then the the then there is the issue, you know, how can you actually track the progress at different scales, subnational level, because the indicators might be different. I'm not an expert. I mean, I don't, I don't have maybe um, full answers to this. What I, from our perspective, the way we approach it in our project was try to use at the scale that we are working, which are sub-basins. We were trying to map indicators which could somehow, you know, connect to some of the SDG targets. This probably requires further uh, discussion, but this is the way we, uh, we did it. So we didn't use the national ones in some cases because they are not relevant at the scales that we are working. But I think it's a really good question. I think the context matters. We cannot just replicate data from the north to be applied in Africa. Um, you asked a question. We did not forget about the question about what the real impact of those programs are. You keep it in mind, and you have to tell us. But there are some hands. I think I'll go to the back. Um, let me jump in the back and come back to you, and then go in the left. <laughs> I see all the right. A quick question, um, we don't have much time now. Okay, thank you. Uh, nice presentations. I'm a lady from TU team. Uh, just to tap on the SDG, the SD goals, I mean, it, it's a scary picture to see that you are far from achieving them, and yet a lot of research has gone into it. We've published a lot of papers. I just want to understand as to from where we are, how do we get to get to where we want to be? as Africa as a continent? I know it's, it's an unfair question, but I mean, really, what, what impedes us? What are the challenges? Maybe you can zoom into one country uh, from, from that um, slide that you showed us. My second question is that uh, we've, we, we've, we've done a lot in terms of systems analysis, and uh, we are very active in science communication and engagement, but uh, the gap, like you mentioned, the implementation part of it, how, how do we encourage it? You know, how do we play an active role in the implementation part of it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Let me take the other questions and then give them the opportunity to respond at once because time is running very fast. There was a hand over here. No, then it's you. I just wanted to respond to Christina's question about the target setting because I think it's an important thing for us to. And I think the answer lies in the presentation that followed on Barbara's from Ethiopia, um, where we used the Fable network as to how we actually do it. So the idea is that we want to allow people at a national level to have discretion and flexibility in terms of how they set the targets internally and what they feel is achievable within the context of the socioeconomic realities of that particular landscape. And then the idea is that we will bubble up the information from the bottom up into a calculator at the top that gives us a sense of how we're faring at a global level versus the targets that we've set ourselves. And if there's a huge discrepancy or a gap, we have to come back to the countries and say, Folks, our collective effort is not good enough to get us where we want to be. We need to tighten up our processes. So it's got to be an iterative process, but I, think, I don't think it's an idea of imposing targets from the top in the space. So it's got to bubble up from the bottom. And I would suspect if you're looking at this, at this city environment, um, you probably have to set yourself targets about what you'd like to achieve in that city and then say to yourself, what can the contributions from the different suburbs or the different configurations within that city can be, and, and use a similar iterative process. So people take ownership of the issue. Otherwise, I think it just becomes a, a sort of administrative uh, process that, that doesn't uh, take, have traction. Absolutely useful. Thank you for those clarification. So to our panelists, back, the floor back to you. And a very early question about what all those things means in reality. Does it allow us to move forward in achieving the SDGs? What are the real implementation challenge we have uh, for achieving sustainability in those areas? So, your reflections. Uh, 
works as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I just want to respond to one of the questions. Why are we not able to meet the SDGs? And uh, there can be mentioned, like I can mention so many reasons, but uh, to focus on the presentations, lacking the lack of uh, an integrated approach could be one reason. Like when you try to uh, modernize the country or industrialize, then you have to also think about the consequences that we'll have in terms of uh, other objectives. So having uh, an integrated approach would be important. In other words, Kiflo, if this project made a difference in Ethiopia accelerating transformation in the area of food security and, and biodiversity or not, or is it just the business as usual is still going? Yeah, in our case, it, we are just starting and we are hoping to have a, like close stakeholder engagement and that will help in the future. So, yeah. so I guess if I had like a straight question of why <laughs> Africa is not on the agenda, then you know, I think the big question for all of us in the room will be, will be solved, no? Uh, I wish I had like a, like a perfect uh, answer. I guess uh, if I look from my perspective, uh, how can I support this? I guess we need to guide, and this was in a way what I tried to convey the message, that we need to generate evidence base to decision makers to for them to realize that there is a return you know the return of the investment is much larger than the cost that will initially be um, you know required because yeah if we look only uh, at what are the investment costs yeah of course because there is large investments required but what is the return uh, this is the key. So if we can generate, you know, with projects and case studies, if we can generate this evidence, this is what hopefully slowly will mainstream and will contribute to see that there is lots of benefits um, for all of us. As we say, to be continued. Um, this discussion cannot be really have the strong conclusions because there are so many different challenges out there. It's good already to show, to see that, you know, from from these examples, we can learn a lot. We can learn how to use data, how to develop tools, how to integrate those tools, those tools how to build scenarios, how to co-design the activities on the ground. There are so many hows that are responded by the project which was uh, presented today. And with your permission, I will just close it here and ask you to, to give a round of applause to our, to our panelists, Barbara and Kiflu. Thank you so much for your insight. And uh, I'll hand it back to the organizer for the, for the next um, session. Or is it coffee break? Where, are, where is Aldo? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Colleagues, thank you indeed. And uh, Professor Mbo and keynote speakers, uh, interesting session. Thank you for ably facilitating this. Um, it uh, leads very well to the next session, which is the last content session of the day. Alex, and it's my uh, pleasure to invite uh, Kinesius Kanangire, the Executive Secretary of the African Minister's Council on Water, or EMCO, to come to the fore and uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kanangire. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, thinking of the 15 years back when I came to South Africa. Uh, I think it was the first time I went through these universities, uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal, University of uh, um, Western Cape, University of uh, uh, Stellenbosch. I was then a researcher, a, a lecturer, and I was thinking differently. Today, I represent the African Minister's Council on Water, and I may be the only stakeholder uh, and uh, the beneficiary of the research activities that you are developing. So uh, I'm glad to have this panel here. And uh, as a stakeholder, I think I will uh, be there to ask questions uh, so that I can have something I bring to my constituency. 
Before I go to them, I will first of all commend this initiative and thank YASA at the National Research uh, Foundation for inviting us and organizing this uh, conference in Africa. I will say why. And um, today we are talking of systems analysis in and Africa. And as one of the colleagues said earlier this morning, we expect uh, more conferences to be organized and uh, the theme to change to uh, system analysis in Africa. And I will add uh, system analysis for Africa's development where we will have uh, a more diverse uh, audience with uh, ministers or ministries represented, private sector, and other people who will need uh, this uh, uh, way of thinking to address issues and uh, translate the uh, research findings into action, which uh, can lead uh, to impact. Africa is endowed with so many resources. We talked about them. You can talk of water, you can talk of forests, you can talk of uh, uh, fertile soil, you can talk of, uh, of people, etc. We have resources, but it is also a continent burdened by so many challenges. Poverty, hunger, degradation of those natural resources. We have so many of them. And yet we have so many great visions at the level of the continent. We can talk of the Africa we want by African Union with the horizon of 2063. You can talk in the water sector of the Africa water vision and then the SDG to which Africa committed. So visions are there. Why don't we, with the resources we have, with those with very great vision, don't transform Africa and address those many challenges? Could it be because we work in silos? Because in some areas, in the water sector, for example, you have a ministry dealing with, with the resources, ministry dealing with water supply, a ministry, a different one dealing with uh, wastewater and sanitation issues. Is it because we work on silos? Could it be because of low capacity, low level of investment in research and poor quality data? Could it be that? Or could it be something else that we need to identify and uh, try to address? What could the global research network bring us as a way to fill the gap to address those challenges? What would be the contribution that we need from the global research networks? Can they help build the capacity of Africa to address those issues? Can they bridge the gap between science and policy, policy and action, so that we can change the way things are addressed and be successful in the race we are doing towards the SDG challenges, I mean targets. I think those are the key questions we expect to have solutions for uh, from um, my colleagues here. Christian, Christian Achema, Raya Mutarak, Farah, who replaced um, uh, France, Swazenepol, and uh, Nelson Torto. I welcome you uh, to this panel. And um, very quickly, I will call you to uh, the podium uh, to give some uh, presentations, 10 to, I mean, uh, five to 10 minutes so that we can leave time to our colleagues to ask questions. I will start with uh, Christian. Can you please give your statement? Great, thank you very much, Canisius. It's wonderful to be back in this very hall. I was just telling a few colleagues how much I like to be 
in this particular conference room. Thanks for the invitation. Let me start with a couple of examples of work that we've done at the academy level with some of our other partners. And it will sound very easy in terms of sentences, uh, but then I'll tell you exactly what went into getting that work together and then go into detail tomorrow morning on one of those issues around uh, urbanization and African cities. So we started out with uh, work on urban governance, particularly in Kampala. We, many of you who've been to Kampala know that there are many issues. You've loved the traffic congestion there. You've seen what happens when uh, it rains heavily. So we asked those who are involved with the capital city authority and others what exactly was needed. They said, we need to figure out the governance issue. Above all else, we need to figure out the governance issue. So being the academy with all sorts of expertise in-house and also networks uh, outside the academy, we put together a consensus study panel that responded to those governance issues. Soon thereafter, our other friends, our academies in the region, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and even Ethiopia, say we need to do some more work. We say it on what? And then it turns out now, at national level, the governments wanted to hear about this thing called urban health. So we did that work, finished it. Fast forward a few months later, we were asked to do some continental work on rural urban linkages uh, for, on sub-Saharan Africa. And this work really was nothing that was planned per se, but we're just open. They say we are open to doing this work, and even our strategy is open to welcoming new work streams that might not already be predetermined. And then working with all sorts of uh, experts, and one thing one learns from doing this work is that working with experts is very difficult very difficult because that single expert has very complex systems at work, just one of them. Now multiply that by several others from different countries and you really have a party on your hands. But the end product, after you manage those human dynamics and get minds to work, the end product is superior. And how then do we get the work to the policy makers? This is one thing that happens from the get-go, is that we posit an intelligent audience. So when you hear about translating work into language that policymakers can understand, you can imagine a policymaker hearing that and the reaction. They will cringe. They'll say, what do you mean? Does it mean that I'm an idiot? So what we do is we posit an intelligent policymaker and most times include that person in coming up with the quick questions that we have to answer. So that is one, well, that's just some examples of what can be done. And what comes out of it? There is this elusive thing that you can't quite touch, this thing called trust. If there is that trust there, you can move any project, you can move so much together. If there is no trust, <laughs> the project will be dead upon arrival. And that, uh, that in many terms is what you do, making sure that your word counts, making sure that you are credible, making sure that when there are issues, you solve them very quickly. And now on the funding side, making sure that you can be humble enough to realize that there are local partners who have the experience and the minds to work on this, on this project. I've seen several things fail because of a superior attitude employed. Just because I bring the money means I know what the answer should be, means I know what should happen, and then things are just derailed. So that's one side of it. What is another derailer? We ourselves as Africans many times derail each other. We don't want to work with Nigeria. We don't want to work with South Africa because of the big brother attitude. We don't want to work with Mozambique because they are Lusophone. We don't want to work with Senegal because they are Francophone. And so we divide ourselves along those lines. And who, else, who ends up losing? We ourselves lose. And I'll give you an example here of something else, another phenomenon at work. It does not matter how far in advance you have scheduled a meeting. Eight times out of ten I've seen if there is a meeting scheduled in Kampala and you have that expert there and that expert is called to Geneva, the Geneva meeting will take the expert. <laughs> Period. Why? Because the local thing seems not to matter at the end of the day and somehow they've made their names at that level. And that 
again is a huge derailer uh, to us. I will end by telling you a story of how I learned a lot about getting these regional networks done. And this was from Ethiopia. Some have gone as far as to say that that is where stubbornness was born. Uh, and it is for a great reason. It is because you can't just carry your priorities to Ethiopia and expect them to work. They will show you out of the way. They will tell you, there is the airport. Thanks for coming. Have a nice day. Uh, I learned that very, very well. I learned it with a colleague who showed up to do books of account, and he was kept in his hotel room from Tuesday to Saturday. On Saturday morning, an accountant showed up with books in Amharic. And why was that? Because he never said, hey, I'm coming, or is it all right? Is it a good time for you to show up? So that respect was really lacking there. I learned a lot from that one example in Ethiopia. I learned another one uh, on when there was a pressure to have a conference on, on vaccines and immunization. That was not the agenda. That was not the priority of the Ethiopian scientists. They looked point blank in the eyes of the funder and said, if you want vaccines and immunization, you can go ahead and have the conference, but it will not be under the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. The founder had to say, okay, what are your priorities? And that's always a very good place to begin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I will uh, just invite the next presenter. <laughs> uh, yes. Raya, please. Thank you, Christian. You, you woke me up. Um, I just had four hours sleep. I, 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 yeah, I got in this morning. Good morning. Uh, good mo <laughs> we are in the same time, so pretty much. Um, I'm not sure if I would manage to answer difficult questions that the chair posted, but I'm trying from my own experience as well, roughly. Um, so I have to say that working at, at YASA, I myself have benefited a lot actually from, from the networks that we have established at YASA through different programs. Obviously the Young Scientist Summer Program, the YSSP, plus the SAYSSP as well. Um, I have collaborated with so many people and, um, and we know that, uh, that co collaborations, especially international one, brings about innovation and exchange of ideas and it tends to have higher impact in terms of research, right? Um, so, um, and particularly, I'm a, I'm a social scientist in this room, so I'm a sociologist and demographer. So, for us, the knowledge of the context of the country that, that we work in, um, it's, it's quite important. So, I actually managed, I, I've counted, I managed to wrote five papers about India on different things without having been to India, actually. But I did um, benefit from, um, from collaborating with, with students from India, for example. And then I, I learned also how to communicate with people with different cultures and so on. Um, so first, perhaps, let's just take a look of some of the data. Um, in terms of the top 10 countries which have uh, international research co collaboration. This is based on Nature um, Index. So they collected um, co-authorship of 82 kind of high quality journals across the past 20 years. So as you might imagine, the US top um, the ranking as the countries that have the most collaboration, followed by, um, I think, I believe, so China, then, then Japan, of course, you have UK inside. The f international collaboration has, as you might imagine, has grown over the past 20, 30 years, all over the world. But actually the fastest um, growing region are in Africa, also China, Japan as well. So we, we do observe that, of course, I mean, the it still has been dominated by, by Euro, by the US, but, but, um, but it, it's been growing quite fast also in, in other places in the world. If we focus a little bit more in, um, this has come from different sources, they um, use uh, articles from Thomson Realtors databases. Um, if we focus a bit more in, in international collaboration in African region, um, focusing on the countries, that kind of the six countries that top the international collaboration, um, South Africa has the, the highest research output, followed by Ethiopia, um, 
sorry, followed by um, Egypt, actually. So South Africa, Egypt, and then we have um, Kenya, Nigeria, Algeria. But you can sort of see that the patterns of collaboration, um, international collaboration across uh, countries in, in, in Africa, in this case, it's based on cultural and then local historical factors. So you can see that Algeria or um, Tunisia, for example, tends to collaborate more with uh, France than other countries. And then we have South Africa, the distribution would be yeah, quite equal between the US and, 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 and the UK. Um, one thing, though, if you look at what kind of research um, themes that have been focused in Africa in, in, in general, it tends to be a um, theme that is related to health, especially infectious diseases, because as you imagine, the continent has a lot of things to, to discover, to learn about, and also natural resources. So some people said um, this might, might be a good thing because it's a, it's, a, it's a hot topic that needs to be researched. But some people also said if you compare with um, places like Asia Pacific, for example, um, many of the collaboration would be about topics such as chemistry, engineering, or, or physics. So it's sort of maybe the focus, some people argue that maybe the, the focus in South Africa, actually most of the research output is about HIV AIDS. That's that, that top of the, the, the research field. So maybe it might, um, it might undermine the development of, of, of the continent as well if the focus because it depends on the, on the money where the funding is, right? Because the international um, funding can, funders also tend to be interested in these two topics, natural resources or health. So the, the argument would be perhaps we, we could also develop in, in other fields as well. Um, before I move to the next slide, actually, I would like to ask you if you have more than five collaborators, maybe the current project or the paper that you have published with people of different countries, can you raise your hand, please? More than five. One, two. I think I do have pretty much equal distribution of men and women, but we would say, yeah, I think it's roughly half-half, actually. Because um, I just want to touch upon a little bit the differences between the gender. <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, obviously here the, the audience we would call positive selection, so it's a selective group. But generally, women tend to um, collaborate domestically more than men. But internationally, um, because if you think that international or global type of collaboration would bring about innova more innovation or um, higher impact research. So women tend to collaborate less uh, internationally. So this is the studies that they, they did um, in, in, since 1996 in, in 12 countries. But in general, that, that, that's the pattern. Um, that's some explanation because women tend to be less mobile than men, like that more family obligation, for example, because international collaboration also up until now require that you, you are more mobile. You're able to move around a bit more. But I'm going to touch upon this later because I think these days with communica communication technologies, we don't have to always be in the place where our collaborators are. Right? We, can, we can do it without. Um, in terms of um, interdisciplinary, so it's not, it's not um, the pattern is not quite clear, but slightly maybe women engage slightly more in um, interdisciplinary research, but the argument also said that um, interdisciplinary type of research might have lower impact, so that's, that's uh, debatable. Um, so I'm just uh, wrapping up, uh, two more slides. <laughs> um, just, just based on my ex experience, um, what I think is the keys to successful international and also multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. So one thing, um, sometimes uh, people tend to approach researchers in in lower income countries tend to approach just because you either you because you need to fulfill your funding requirement or sometimes just because you need to get access to the data or ask them to collect data for you so this is um, I think the more successful collaboration is to to allow people to be able to to do the cutting edge science together with you, not treating the people like just because they're useful to you, kind of thing. So that's a that that that's one thing that we have to probably rethink of when we collaborate with people of of different countries. Um, another thing is. Uh, 
actually culture, you, Christian, you mentioned every country that <laughs> that that you have had maybe issues or ex interesting experience working with, right? So culture actually does does play a role, um, and also different disciplines also have different languages of communication. So we we need to 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 be able to co communicate professionally as well because sometimes people take it personally, but we have to be able to to confront. Um, to make professional um, arg arguments. And, and culture counts a lot when I have uh, students from India, the first time, uh, whatever I say, so he he agree with me, but he shake his head this way. And I, I kept on thinking, but why? You don't like my ideas or what? And that took me a while uh, to understand. So it just, it's, it seems for now, but it is important to be able to, to, to learn the differences, I think, and to accept the differences as well. But the project needs effective leadership. I think um, this, this is important. Of course, you, you, you can do things, you can establish a big um, network and so on, but it needs someone who, be, who are able to, to lead and, and make things happen. And this has already been said, the sharing of data, um, open access to, to, to different things. And I just uh, finished here because it's not only the researchers, but we need the research environment that enable us to do collaboration. One thing is the funding. So it, in, in Europe, I think we benefit a bit more in the kind of the, the type of uh, call um, for funding that, that have certain theme, right? So you can do it. it it's required that you do um, research across disciplines. But sometimes many of the research funding, it's still kind of silo, uh, single disciplinary, and you get judged by, um, for example, I work on population and climate change, so demography, but also environmental science. But I have a difficulty where, which discipline do I bid for my type of research project because it doesn't purely fit in demography. On environmental scientists would look at me as it's, it, she's a bit weird, uh, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's, it needs the, the, the funder that understands and also the selection committee that understand multidisciplinary type of project and also the outlet, right? So we need the journals that understand this type of cross-cutting type of project and also we get evaluated um, by either university or academic institutions that understand so the type of output that, that you produce. Maybe you produce more, maybe you produce less, maybe you don't fit directly in the discipline, but we need that to understand us also. Us. And I think the last thing is important, infrastructure for, for efficient communication, because some, some places you don't have good internet connection or the power cut and that's, that's, that's important also to establish the communi communication. I am going to stop here. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I will welcome uh, Farah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, my name is Farai Kafuzarua. Um, I'm working in the Strategic International Partnerships Office at the University of Pretoria. And I'm representing uh, Professor Swanipu, uh, who has had to travel um, somewhere uh, to, to represent the university. But um, my, my presentation, so to speak, I will just highlight specifically what is the role, the collective role of universities, particularly linked to the uh, to the discussion on um, research global networks? How can universities utilize their collective um, intellectual uh, capabilities and resources? I think to 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 create more impact because today I think through the presentation that was uh, by Albert, I think he um, clearly outlined. How how if you use the um, system analysis frameworks and solutions that is greater impact um, uh, for you know within the society so my presentation i think i just like to highlight um, using the examples of our research networks uh, which are growing here in, in Africa, uh, how can those um, research networks be utilized to create the critical mass and scale which is really needed to, um, to, to, to create an impact which, is, uh, which allows the continent, particularly the intellectual um, 
uh, capacities at universities to respond to the challenges that uh, the continent is facing because I think at the moment uh, even here in South Africa we have a few um, university networks we have the Association of South African uh, Universities uh, within the continent we now have um, Arua which is an association of research intensive universities we also have a roof forum which is focused on um, responding to issues on, in food systems and I think here at the University of Pretoria uh, we also have a clear strategy which we are referring to the Africa Global, Global, Global University Project which is mostly focused on identifying our key partners uh, to, uh, to, to collaborate on, on research excellency and uh, also capacity development of young researchers. So within that framework, I think the, one of the key issues that I would like to highlight with regard to how can um, um, collective uh, universities utilize their collective um, capabilities through research networks to create a greater impact um, um, in terms of uh, impact for research, I think, is the fact that uh, uh, these evidence which shows that uh, transdisciplinary research uh, uh, through partnerships involving um, uh, non-state actors, the private sector, NGOs, uh, together with government, they uh, have a greater social benefit. But I think there is also research which is showing that um, oh, over probably less than 0.1% of African invest, uh, inventors in, in Africa, they own uh, the uh, patents of, uh, within the uh, across the globe. So that doesn't necessarily mean that um, there isn't any good research which is being done in Africa. I think the key challenge, I think, is some have mentioned today is that the issue relating to science communication. How do you, uh, in, uh, universities, uh, how do research um, global networks communicate the research that they are doing um, to policymakers and also people in the private sector so that they can be implemented? So one of those kind of ways that they could do it is how can is through through those research networks and how can they effectively collaborate with institutions such as the African Development Bank and um, the African Union which have the responsibility to implement a lot of these uh, um, SDGs and also the agenda 2063 and that is very important particularly within because the universities I think they have a very important uh, a uh, convening platform uh, which they can utilize to uh, to bring together different stakeholders for greater impact. And I think the second point that I would like to uh, share I think, is regard, relates to a sharing of research infrastructure. Uh, last week I was in Tanzania as part of a, a project on peer learning which is supported by the Carnegie um, Corporation and also the NRF. And one of the things that um, the, the, the postdoctoral fellows uh, mentioned was that very often times they have to go to Europe or North America or the developed countries if they want to access the best infrastructure, the best research labs um, for them to do their research, which in a way usually undermines, you know, the efforts uh, uh, of their research. So, but at the same time, I think um, there are a lot of centers of excellence. So, for example, Arua, they now have very various centers of excellence. At the University of Pretoria, we have the Center of Excellence for Food Security. I think uh, uh, Albert also mentioned earlier that I think IASA is starting to expand into the continent, and most likely they are going to bring in resources to produce a great infrastructure. So, there is opportunities for sharing that kind of infrastructure. And at the University of Pretoria just recently, this year in March, we launched um, the Future Africa Campus, which we call is a Pan-African um, uh, platform, which is going to be very, very helpful to bring together African colleagues and uh, researchers and managing researchers to work together in co-production, co-innovation, and uh, co-implementation of our research which is being done. And then my third point relates to funding. I think a lot of uh, presentations today also highlighted, I think, the importance of funding um, because I think there's evidence, the UNESCO reports that I think Africa, the sub-Saharan African countries, they uh, contribute probably 0.5% of their GDP towards R&D. And also, I think, Professor Shona in the morning, she indicated that there's also disparity within countries here and on the continent regarding their contributions towards the R&D and research. And also the private sector, I think, was mentioned, I think, in South Africa, 
uh, the private sector contributes 38 percent so there is an important I think, uh, need for us to, to to increase funding I think uh, I would, uh, I think earlier mentioned that I think there are the traction with regard to funding so there is um, uh, what are calling the science granting councils within the continent uh, research foundations such as the NRF which are coming together to leverage resources together to provide funding to, uh, to, to research in Africa. And then um, the fourth point that I also like to highlight before I finish, I think, is relates to partnerships for capacity building. I think everyone knows, I think, a lot of African universities, there is an increased number of PhD graduates and also postdoctoral fellowships which are taking place. So there's Africa Development, uh, I think, the African Academy of Doctoral Program at Stellenbosch. I think IASA also has uh, the Young Scientist Summer Program. So there are a lot of initiatives which are there to support the capacity development of, of, of emerging researchers. But I think there is a need for, for, to, to share those kind of resources and opportunities for a, lot of, for a lot of emerging researchers. From the work that I've been working with a lot of postdoctoral fellows, they indicated I think they tend to learn more if there's peer learning and sharing of their experiences. So I think there is opportunities for that through the programs which are existing uh, right now. I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. May I now invite Professor Torto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I also like this room. <laughs> it, it feels like last year, and Aldo, maybe you are responsible for this. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, I think quite a lot has been said, uh, and I just want to, uh, to give you a different perspective, uh, because we are a pan-African academy, uh, and our mandate really uh, drives uh, uh, aspects that are Africa-focused, Africa-centered and Africa-driven. So it means that we focus very much on the NDPs going up on the vision, and then from the vision we look at, 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 at the strategies that come from, from Addis, and then of course the SDGs are, are important. But as you know that, you know, uh, I think the most important stakeholder is, is, is the one who votes. So clearly the NDP is the one that, predomin that dominates uh, this space. So we, uh, the African Academy of Sciences, uh, that's where I work in Nairobi. And um, as a Pan-African Academy, we are, we are based in, in Nairobi, and we have what, uh, five regional offices uh, according to the geography of Africa. But I think what I want to uh, uh, say before I could give you some examples of some of the work that we do is that uh, we have what, three uh, aspects in terms of our mandate, the first of which is just recognition of excellence. You know, you know that's how the, the old boys club you know, sustains itself. You, know, you have to find equally competent people and you bring them on, and then they become fellows of the academy. It's not like that anymore. We are really an academy that is really focused uh, on the stakeholder. We want to ensure that Africans live a better lives sooner, and this is done through science uh, and technology. And I like, I like, I like the, uh, the, the, the statement which is on, on the wall here, you know, uh, from the NRF perspective. So the second aspect is obviously uh, think tank related uh, services where we try to advise and link up with government. So we've had a very close relationship with, with NEPAD, we've had a very close relationship with, uh, with, the, with the AU Commission. Whenever the ministers meet, we are there and we try to report back in terms of what we are doing. And the third aspect is implementation of programs, and you mentioned IESA. So IESA is our you know, program implementing platform, the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa. That's the full name for IESA. So in terms of IESA, we have different platforms really that drive different aspects, which colleagues have raised already. Uh, one of the key ones is R&D infrastructure. We know that most of the African universities, they're not, they're not endowed with uh, the, the requisite infrastructure. So we try to support the capacitating of these universities to make sure that they have the fiscal infrastructure, they have the human resource infrastructure, and they have the systems infrastructure. Because I think one of the key issues is that funders uh, don't necessarily give money to the one who seems to have the best idea. They want to make sure that their funding is, is secured, so they want to see that there are proper systems in place. And for that, you know, through our programs, we try to help in that process. And the other thing that we, we drive is uh, postdocs as well. We have a variety of postdoc programs uh, with collaboration with, 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 with the Royal Society, for instance. FLAIR is one of our superior postdoc programs. And I was saying earlier on in my earlier contribution that, uh, you know, we normally have about 700 applications for this program, and we shortlist about 60. We bring them to Nairobi, uh, and uh, it's, it's quite fascinating that 
at the end of the day, we just give about 10 or 15 uh, award, awards to this. And so anyone who gets a FLAIR program, if there's a FLAIR award in this room, then they're, they're really top of the top. Because I've seen very good projects not make it, but the ones that make it are really, really good proje uh, projects. And they really uh, sort of uh, say that there's a lot of good science that is taking place in Africa, and we can't underestimate the, 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 the powerfulness of, of, of the youth. So, I mean, the other program that we, we have is that relates to uh, critical gaps, again, where we are looking at, uh, at, at, at addressing issues of, of, of the gaps that exist within, within the university infrastructures. Uh, in, and, and one of the key aspects that I'll talk to you about is addressing the issue of due diligence. You know, when, when a funder comes in and they, and they want to understand how your systems are in place and how they can be able to assess you. Uh, we, we have come up with a standard uh, that addresses that. And of course, the other program that we drive, which also is very important in terms of networking, relates to innovation. So I just want to give you uh, 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 some four examples. The first one is well, but a, a program that we, we, we fund in partnership with Wellcome Trust. It's a $100 million uh, project. It's called Delta's Development of Excellence Leadership Training and Science in Africa. We have about 11 networks uh, from Mali all the way to Durban, and the funding varies from $3 million to about $14 million for five years. This is a big project where, in fact, we have, I think at the end of the program, we'll have trained about 1,400 PhDs and several MSCs and postdocs. And of course, we'll have uh, grown the capacity of the leaders to lead at a higher level. And this program has demonstrated to us that you can actually be able to build a network within the continent because having 11 groups in the continent is a big deal because Africa is a big continent. When I fly from Nairobi to Dakar, it takes me eight hours. And, and it's a long eight hours, you know, because you are, you, it's almost like you haven't gone anywhere because, you know, from one bush to the other. But, you know, you have moved you know, quite a distance. You're still in the continent. So uh, this program is one of our very uh, uh, strong programs. And I can just tell colleagues here who, uh, that uh, we have just had a renewal of this program with Welcome Trust. So we have another round of $100 million coming, uh, you know, next year. So we are going to send a, a, a call out. So, you know, you know, try your luck. Uh, it's, it's a very good opportunity. It puts you in a different space in, in the sense that uh, we have what these annual meetings for the researchers. And a couple of months back, we were in Dakar, where we had about 400, uh, P, uh, 400 uh, funded researchers from all over the continent. I mean, that, because of the fact that it goes on uh, through the period of the funding phase, it means that you, you, you create a cohort of people that will ever be together. And I can tell you that, these people, even the, the main leaders of the research programs, they've been able to raise money more than that we have given to them on the basis of their collaboration as a network. So in a way, you, know, you can see how easily you can, uh, you can be able to bring uh, people together. So the, G, uh, the, the GFGP Good Financial Grant Practice is our, is our standard. This standard was developed in the continent by practitioners in the continent. It went through different phases, but eventually it was approved by ASO in Durban last year. So it's an ASO standard. So the role of this standard is, is that, as I said earlier on, is that it, it, it addresses issues of, of, of due diligence. When, when a funder comes and they want to understand your level of competence, so if you go through this standard, what happens is that they, the standard will, will put you in a different category, you know, one of the Olympic colors, bronze, gold, silver, platinum. And, and, on, and on that basis, the good thing is that you can be able to structure your own growth because it actually indicates what are the gaps in terms of your competencies. And I can tell you that some, you know, A-class universities, even in this country, you find that, you know, there are areas where they're doing badly the, the, to the equivalent of a spaza shop, if you know what I'm talking about. So sometimes you, you need to take yourself through the system and be able to address some of these issues to be able to see the gaps. So the, the, the good financial grant uh, practice standard addresses HR, it addresses procurement, it addresses uh, governance and also it addresses finance. So clearly it makes sure that you are tight in those areas. And it's one of the things that was developed uh, by Africans uh, and eventually also uh, approved it. And so now it's an ASO standard. So the other network that we have been able to establish is obviously the Grand Challenge Africa, which is an innovation network. Grand Challenges Africa is a very important program in terms of sort of leveling the playing field in the sense that those who have good ideas are you know, requested to send a proposal two pages long, and you know, uh, depending on the sense that we can assess from that uh, uh, project, you can be funded. And of course, you can be funded to the tune of $100,000. And once, that, uh, once there's a reasonable outcome from that, 
then there's a possibility that one can have access to a million dollars. And normally from our perspective, because we've got funding from other entities like CEDA, et cetera, et cetera, we can actually be able to match the funding that a country puts down if they were to want to uh, go to translational uh, stage with regard to, a, to an uh, output from, from the research. So the, other, uh, uh, so, so, so the other program that, again, we have been uh, working with, with uh, NIH and Work on Trust, I think the funding for this is about $170 million. It's, it's called H3 Africa, and uh, I know that uh, uh, one of my colleagues is here from UCT, who is one of the drivers in terms of data. But H3 Africa obviously looks at human hereditary health issues in Africa. And uh, so Nikki Muda is one of our drivers. I, I know she, I saw her on the other side. Um, and she's one of our drivers in terms of uh, driving this pro, uh, project from a data perspective. Because obviously, you know, you, we know that uh, there are a lot of things that are affected by the genetic components of who we are, uh, from HIV to malaria to, to all, all the NCDs. So this is a program, again, the way we have brought in different players. And the, and the way we allocate funding for these programs is that you find that it's always a cluster. So there's a group in Mali, there's a group in Ethiopia, there's a group in Uganda, there's a group in, here uh, in South Africa, in Cape Town, that is looking to the link between hearing issues and, and genetics. So we, we try to make sure that we bring in uh, several people together so that you know, there can be some convergence in terms of discipline as well as culture and all the other things that uh, the colleagues were, were, were talking about. So in summary, really, these are some of the things that we are doing uh, to make sure that uh, you know, uh, people benefit from the existence of other people with equal competencies. And of course, you know, as, as a facilitator, our, our nose in, is in into the, in terms of the business, but our hands are out in terms of the fact that we are not necessarily the ones that are driving the work because we want this work to be uh, uh, driven uh, by, by the Africans in terms of their needs. Uh, on the basis of the uh, national development plans. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, presenters. I think it was very informative. Uh, I will come to three, four things. The first one is the need to build trust between scientists, researchers, and those stakeholders, those who will use the research findings uh, for action, for, uh, the, uh, uh, for policies. Uh, and, and that is one thing which is very important to build as we strengthen our networks. We uh, have heard from one presenter that most of uh, uh, activities, most of research are yet to uh, health area. There are other areas which are not served or equally served but which are very important. I think uh, we have the duty to also uh, stimulate that kind of collaboration, those networks, to also venture to those other areas, which are equally important in the system we are dealing with. We have heard that uh, we need to communicate effectively those um, research findings to policymakers, to practitioners, and uh, build our partner's capacity. I think that is also a very important thing. If we want our research our findings to find their way uh, to the implementation and produce the impact that we need. At the end, we have heard that uh, there is a demand by Africa for research, for capacity building, and uh, there is also partners who are very much willing to fund at the height of many hundreds of millions of research so that uh, we can strengthen this partnership. We need to harness that and to use it to produce uh, that kind of uh, uh, engine uh, to transform Africa. I think uh, those are the key uh, takeaway from the four presentations uh, or summarized at, uh, at uh, this stage of the discussions, but uh, I know that you have uh, certainly gotten some other perspective. You have uh, uh, some questions. You may have some comments uh, from this, and this is your time. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. I will uh, start with uh, uh, Professor there. Thank you. 
Uh, I totally agree with Nelson, and we still need to improve our international collaboration. Actually, in Egypt, we are doing quite fine uh, from the research aspect, but to close the innovation cycle, actually, we uh, need to uh, scale up our research work to go to the industry and to be commercialized. That's the key pivot. We don't have the luxury for research, for just research and patenting and prestigious journals. Uh, actually, I want to share um, our uh, previous experience in this way with you. We uh, spent about 10 years trying to get a legislation uh, giving us the right as uh, research centers uh, to be profit organizations. We were not allowed to have any profits from research. And actually, uh, this uh, legislation passed uh, June 19, uh, three or four months ago. Uh, this, uh, actually, this legislation has a, a very important item that it will allow us to have counterparties from different countries. We can share our experiences with foreign countries. We are not allowed before to exceed the research level with foreign countries. So this may, may close the cycle. Uh, we, ha we got bright ideas. Maybe we don't have the tools to implement it on higher scale, on uh, in high industrial scale. So this integration, especially in Africa, will have a big impact if we start collaborating with all these research ideas ready to go to, to, to make the ordinary person benefit from it. Yeah, not, not just having an uh, impact factor and citations and all that stuff. Actually, um, we took a nice step last week with the United Nations ESQA, and I suggested that we have an e-platform to start this kind of networking to uh, just to display uh, what's ready to go on this platform uh, with the other, and share it with the other contributing countries. Maybe you can find a beneficiary outside your country. You don't have to stick to your local borders. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you so much for the uh, information. It's really quite insightful. I'm insight insightful. Um, my comment is on the um, networks. Uh, there have been a lot of um, networks that have been mentioned, but when we look at the role players in these networks, they are the same people. Uh, I stand to be corrected on that one. Um, I think that is a problem because you know, like in most cases, you find that there are key people which are supposed to bring other role players into these networks. But when we look at the landscape of these networks, you find that the same names appear all the time. And uh, my other comment is on women collaboration. Uh, the study that was done in the EU, uh, indicating that women collaborate more locally than internationally. I would think that in Africa, it's none of the two. Not even locally, not even internationally. In most cases, it depends on the funding. And in, in many cases, you find that women are becoming collaborators just because the funding requires that there has to be a woman uh, in the project. So there is no true collaboration um, in terms of women taking leadership. There are just a few women that are in that position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Kidani, and then I will come to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, for Raya, I think um, particularly on this one, um, I will be interested actually to get some clarification. Who are the collaborators for the research in this case? Are you focusing only, I mean, your study has covered only the academic institutions, um, or does it also include other institutions outside of academic institutions? Because there's a lot of global network for actual research outside of academic research. That's one. The second one is, I just want to also know, what really is the driver for this collaboration? Um, are those countries established some kind of joint um, issues that they want to address? Like, for example, are they collaborating to address a, a common challenge, or is it driven by um, some kind of financing partners, probably the Open African Program Research Program, so that you, you have to collaborate within that framework. And the last, the last one is I just want to know also in terms of the quality of um, collaboration, if you can reflect a bit, um, uh, are this collaboration leading to a joint innovation process or, or some of in the collaboration process some are leading 
research scientists as a said like for the uh, means of data collection and something so if you can give us a bit of clarification on that one. thank you take another person there and then i will give the floor to the panelists Because I think um, the, the haphazard kind of um, I think the, the, the haphazard kind of collaborations possibly wouldn't like if I ask the a question so hard, it's almost like if I meet somebody in the conference, we like each other and then we collaborate on the paper. But it it, it it's not structured into you know, unlike, for instance, if you look at malaria research and HIV, there is quite a strong drive by the government and the private sector. Possibly there is a win-win situation. You know, we take care of the, the sick and the pharmaceutical companies make money from it. But outside the, that space, you know, when we talk the social issues, the governance issues, where there is no private partner, um, it seems like as you know and the governments are not driving it 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 will seem to me at least that these collaborations are besides the ones that come from uh, you know you know international big calls you know from some of the big funders a lot of the collaboration that happens at least in the african context it's like friends collaborating with friends out of peer review material and then we are excited but I don't think it's got the, the, the kind of impact it should be and I think maybe the, the last one maybe to Nelson I wanted to find out you know a, you know the, you're talking big money from the African Academy of Science how much of that comes from the governments of Africa in other words saying we need science to guide us on evidence to create to generate evidence to guide our programs here and there how much of it comes from us I, I like the points the gentleman from Uganda made that at, at the end of the day unless we stand up the funder will tell us what to research and it will be of no value to you you will just research it for the sake of the money but the outcomes are of no value to the problems of the current, current problems of the country uh, presenters, let me start with uh, uh, Raya, and then we move uh, on. Uh, try to be short and concise. So this research, they took the data from um, Thomson Realtor, this academic articles publication database. So it's all peer review articles. So it's quite selective in this sense. So we, it wouldn't reflect who initiated the collaboration because it's purely based on what is the institution that each researcher, each co-author, each author in the paper is affiliated with. So, so, so that's the thing. So probably if the collaboration with the private sector make it to peer review journal, that might be reflected there. So it's not, it's probably not representative of, of, of the whole thing. Um, yeah, what does it tell us? I mean, it just, Pretty much, this is the country with higher research output in terms of peer review articles, and um, and it has changed. So we 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 seen more actually. As I was saying that um, we seen more collaboration emerging, and I guess because people also look out for different countries to collaborate with. Like what we see, China and Japan wasn't quite the key players, but now it has become the key player. Brazil as well, South Africa as well. So it it, it will it will change. Um, I don't have much comment on the gender um, collaboration in, in Africa. I think, though, because we've seen also in countries like in Asia, in Europe, the, um, the, the output of female researcher has been increasing. And although women still collaborate internationally less than men, but it has been increasing. So as a demographer, I probably believe in the cohort change, so it means that I think probably Africa is not yet, but it will catch up, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. 
Thank you. I think I'll comment on two points. The issue of international collaboration. I think it's very, very important that we collaborate outside our borders. And uh, we have some uh, programs. Um, so our postdoctoral program, the, the, the APTI program, is a collaboration between ourselves and NIH, where we have the researchers spending two years in the US at NIH labs, and then they come back to Africa for another two years. So I think that already exposes them to whatever environment. So our Grand Challenges program, the innovation program, so the, it's Grand Challenges uh, Africa, Grand Challenges Brazil, Grand Challenges India, uh, Grand Challenges Canada. So already you can see that there's a space of innovators that meet you know, on a regular basis to, to feed on each other and help each other on, on different aspects. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the uh, funding, uh, you know, I was a professor at Rhodes at some point in time, and you know, Rhodes I think has got one of the best facilities in terms of uh, nanotech, and uh, it's a DST mean tech facility. Uh, so in Botswana as well, I was a CEO at, at Beatry, where I think it has got the best facilities in material science in, in the continent, in fact, as, as good as anyone in, abroad. What am I saying? I'm saying that I've lived through the days of NRF when NRF used to bring us here in Pretoria to do assessments, to look at uh, in the purchasing of infrastructure instruments and so forth. So African governments do spend a lot of money, but it's just that sometimes we don't have a way of accounting for it. So you do find places where clearly there's a huge investment in infrastructure, then they're able to attract money. Yes, you have got other places where the investment in infrastructure is not as good, and this is why in some of our programs we see the need for us to help in terms of building that component but it cannot be built to a greater extent if there is no government involvement. So in our second phase of the Deltas program, we want to see government contribution in dollars. And obviously in kind, I think the African governments are doing that. But it's just that you know, in the continent, we are not good at putting the numbers on the table. Very good. Christian. Thank you very much. Let me respond to just two things about how much money. I'll tell you about my country. The figure is zero. That is exactly how much the government is putting forward uh, with this work. And who knows, maybe that's a blessing, because otherwise they will be trying to control the agenda. They will show up to meetings, they will talk, they will read the reports, they will even pass some laws that read almost word for word, like some of our reports. So we'll see how that goes um, in, <laughs> in the future. It's not for, tra for lack of trying. The next thing is about these same people showing up over and over again. I have had that same frustration for many years, um, including when one of my council members demanded to be recognized because he had come back from a three-month Fulbright scholarship at 72 years old, uh, when this is something that should be for a young scientist trying to make a career. And how many awards have we seen, even at this very science forum, South Africa, a couple of years where it's the same people getting awards over and over again. So that is definitely something that some of us have to just stop paying attention to those awards. Thank you, Christian. I think just to build on that, from my perspective, you know, as, a, as a someone who's an emerging researcher, I think, the, you know, the continuous presence of you know the same people in networks i think that speaks to the lack of mentorship within universities and also research institutions so i think it is very important that you know whenever these esteemed researchers wherever they go they bring along young people you know to to start um, involving them in in, in this uh, research project. And then the second point i would like to comment i think the involvement of women in in research and I think in publications, I think Tandem uh, Kwebe there right at the back who probably speak to that. She was at the NRF and she was very instrumental with regard to the transformation of I think research chairs here in in South Africa. And my point is that I think the government I think sometimes has to have a purposeful agenda to change the policy. Uh, uh, to ensure that women are very much involved in, in science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I will uh, add... Uh, oh, okay. Madam, I wanted to conclude because uh, I think um, we are going later to... It's a, it's a short one. I, uh, I just want to say to my friend there that you should not be excited that the government hasn't contributed anything to whatever you are doing. Zero is not a good number because 
I know of a network. I used to work for Waternet. It's a very good network, regional network. They produced 500 plus um, masters and PhD students, a capacity building network. There's been a very faithful funder for the last 20 years. But 20 years later, reality is hitting home. They have been trying that the member institutions, member network members should be contributing to the, to the pot of, of, of the funding. As I think there's somebody from AMCAL here, you understand that story, that the ministers and the governments should be contributing, they should be supporting the network, but it is not happening at the moment. And the funder is saying going forward, they really, I think, in a way, the threatening that we've been working with you for the last 20 years, it's time now for you to start uh, to be self-supporting, and this is going to be through your governments. So if we do not start now, early enough to be self-supporting, then we are doomed. We will continue uh, being dependent uh, uh, going forward. So we need to, to, to think. I think I had very good uh, words this morning from uh, NRIF, from the people from ADA and the others that they recognize where strength is in the different institutions. So it's just not their thing, you know. So I think it's a very good start as far as I'm concerned. We cannot uh, say uh, there was going to be a funder. There will always be somebody to fund us. We have to find ways of doing it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. May I respond? Because uh -huh. I think uh, I was misquoted there. I am not excited about a government having a zero figure. But let me tell you what I'm excited about is the business, uh, businesses that are contributing to this work. And in fact, I love working with businesses more so than government, um, by and large. So whenever the government does wake up, it will find us along the way. Local businesses have been putting in quite a bit of cash, and that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, this, uh, this conference uh, gives... Uh, as a certain sense of optimism in terms of all the efforts, a converging tools, uh, more research, more findings, and more contribution to the transformation of Africa. But uh, what we are seeing here is not what we see between uh, the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer in the sub-Saharan Africa. I think there is a lot of disparity in terms of capacity, and that needs to be addressed in terms uh, of developing the whole continent. Uh, at AMCAO, in the water and sanitation sector, we uh, have a system for monitoring the progress Africa is doing on SDG 6. And I can tell you, one of the serious issues we have is data, quality data, to be able even to measure what we have. So how can we do that? The other thing is, uh, was said by one of our colleagues, we produce uh, information, we produce knowledge, but when you, uh, the dissemination is not so good. When you need something, you need to travel thousands of kilometers to get a map, to get uh, some data to be used uh, for your research and publication. Collaboration should not be forced. It should be something we do because it will bring more cross-fertilization mm. between different centers. Mm. We will bring one plus one will be more than two if we do proper collaboration. Africa should do more, much more effort to build capacity and reach critical mass of uh, people in different areas to be able to influence decisions in the right directions and also reduce the uh, money we spend on importing expertise in most of the area. You have seen every time we have a consultancy or a study or feasibility study to do, every time we have to go outside the continent and that is many of the million most of the time we have taken as a loan. I think we have a great job to do as scientists. And uh, I said, I'm at the other side of the river. I'm a stakeholder. I'm uh, representing the Council of Ministers on water and talk with them about all these things. And uh, I think uh, we rely on you for that uh, uh, effort and uh, we will be 
are very excited to collaborate with the uh, research centers to, and uh, to bridge as much as that is possible the gap between science and policy decision makers and practice. I thank you very much and I wish uh, to uh, thank the presenters for that effort and uh, generous sharing of their ideas and uh, contributing to the understanding of what they do. Uh, please join me to thank them. I thank you very much.